it's time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink. And listen. Kitty Land. One reason the laser tag story stuck with me over the years was its telling in my home state of Florida. Being a native, I'll admit that we do have our fair share of strange people and places. The state has a bit of everything and is probably the biggest microcosm of America outside of New York City. And across all of that hot, muggy, flat land in central Florida are locales that can defy all logic and reason. We have no typical tourist tramps here. Creepy Toys was just one of the more recent message boards I've scoured, and the only I moderated. Well, I visited many more back in my social internet days, <laughs> the early web, like the mid-90s, when the etiquette thing was still in its infancy, and if you owned a successful message board, well, you were a rock star. There was a smaller one I happened upon, which I'm sure is also long gone by now. It was meant to attract fellow Floridians and their offbeat tales and experiences. Well, I visited every so often, more as a lurker, never really posting because my boring life didn't lend much to share. The main forum was the place where users posted their real-life strange stories that happened anywhere in Florida, whether they lived here or were just visiting. The emphasis was placed on the real aspect, but of course, you can say anything you want on the web. I'm sure many posts were less than truthful. Nowadays we call most of them troll fix. Well, during a 3am reading session one night, my eyes locked onto a thread title, specifically on two of its words. It was written by a girl my age, who I'll simply call Kate. She posted, Anyone remember Kittyland? And upon seeing the name of this place, some dark recess of my memories lit up. Somehow I already knew its location, and not some TV show or book or something else. I think I visited a place called Kiddyland when I was young. For some reason I forgot all about it until just recently. Maybe it was in central Florida? My parents used to take me all over the state. Dad was a photographer who liked to take pictures of all the weird little theme parks and such that dot the interstates. Or can that be plural? And highways. I remember most of them clearly. Which is kind of a feat when you got, you know, the big ones like Disney World and Universal Studios overshadowing all the smaller parks. And what's weird is, if I concentrate, I can still get clear memories of most everything from the Weeky Watchy Mermaids to Dinosaur World. But this Kiddie Land thing, well, not so much. It must have been incredibly lame, judging by his name alone. There's probably some sad little park that didn't leave much of an impression. So why am I thinking about it so much all of a sudden? Why, when I look through all my dad's photo albums, do I not see its sign anywhere? He'd shoot anything, and always the front gates. Was this place even real? I scrolled through the replies as I tried to get a grasp on these forgotten memories that were trying to wriggle up to the surface. Most of the responses were useless as far as answers or similar experiences went. Save for one. By a boy also our age. I'll have him go by Jack. Always a winner cover name. You're joking. I thought I was going crazy back in the third grade when I talked to other kids about it. I'd also forgotten it for a while. Creepy. I think it was a crappy place. I kind of just remember getting mad at Dad for not letting me go to the bumper cars because I was too young. The only other thing I can really say was that its mascot was maybe a Florida panther or something. I wanted to reply back then, but I didn't have anything to contribute, yet. And sure, it was strange that this place seemed to be a memory that we'd all forgotten and later remembered to some degree, and struggled to clarify, but that's not uncommon for childhood recollections. We all have places, events, television shows, movies, and other things stored away somewhere, so fuzzily that we wonder if they actually existed or not. But Kiddie Land stayed with me more persistently than any other record memory I've had. After a few days of thinking about and trying to dig up a single solid image in my mind, I asked my sister if she remembered it at all. She's two years younger than me, so I didn't expect that she would. Even so, she did end up helping me in a way. 
One of her first memories was of Cinderella's castle at Disney World. After some mulling, that later gave me a time and place. I asked my dad soon after, also not expecting much. Parents take their kids to a lot of places, and I knew he wouldn't remember some dumpy old theme park, and I, but I probably didn't have any fun at either. He didn't even try to recollect such a place, not that I'd had high hopes to begin with. Well, he changed after the car accident. And I say that only barely knowing what he was like before it happened. And up until now, I only had two steady memories from that entire year. Disney World and my mom's funeral. I guess I'd tried to bury the latter, and never really sorted out that the accident actually happened on the way back home from the resort. Of course, anything in between those two memories would have been lost in immemorial oblivion. We lived in Ocala, a town northwest of Orlando, for one more year before we moved. I was seven when we left. We'd only filled two photo albums since then, mostly of vacations and birthday parties. Well, they were far more tucked away in the attic, dusty and unopened for years. I went through them and saw plenty of baby pictures and a few of my first day at kindergarten, but I didn't find any taken at Disney World. I kind of knew I wouldn't. Dad wouldn't have added them considering what happened. I found that he didn't even have them developed, but luckily there were also two unlabeled, undeveloped rolls of film in the box. Well, I hoped that time and the attic's heat hadn't ruined them. Well, they came out very red and a bit splotchy when I had them developed, but they were, for the most part, readable pictures. As I looked through two rolls of Mickey's Place circa 1990 prints, filled with happy background kits, lots of smiles from my sister and I, and a fine collection of 80s clothing, I tried to keep my emotions in check and focus on looking for any kind of clues. For the most part, it was all just evidence of a regular summer vacation, but it did take away one thing from the images. It had been a rainy weekend. There were puddles on the ground in many pictures and water droplets clearly visible on the Dumbo ride. What really brought back memories of that trip was the one snapshot of a six-year-old me looking sadly out at the grey clouds from our hotel room balcony. There were also the last proof that my dad was a happier man once, as few times as he appeared in the pictures. Remembering how our parents were always eager to keep us happy, I realised that even if we'd managed to go on most of the good rides in between showers, they would have seen our disappointment and given us one last stop on the way home. A last-ditch effort to correct a nearly ruined vacation. It was then that the smell hit me, accompanied by a visual. I could see a food stand with an old man handing me a hot dog. I could taste the aroma and that scent of rainwater on a hot summer's day evaporating in the sun. I could see the puddles on colourful, swirling tile surrounding a ticket booth. I was sure now that this place was real, or at least it once had been. Dad was never able to remember it a few times I asked again. I didn't know if he even tried. After all, it was just hours later with him behind the wheel. The old scar on my side itch. Twenty-eight stitches. I soon stopped thinking about it as the last years of high school took hold. I would try occasionally, usually before I went to sleep, to pull out more memories, images, and reasons for that place, but my mind had gone quiet. I didn't get my driver's license until after I graduated, and it was really only so I could get myself to college. During my first year, after I began to feel confident in my driving ability, I took two separate trips to and back from Orlando and my old house in Ocala. One drive was on the interstate, the other, longer one, was where I took the back roads. I looked for billboards, old signs, and even made a few stops at dilapidated gas stations and rest stops where I looked through the oldest tourist brochures I could find. No references. These trips were out of the way and wasted an entire day, so I didn't try a third time. With college assignments and social life to attend to, my quest for Kiddyland fell further onto the back burner, sometimes to the point where I forgot about it all over again. But in 2008, it resurfaced once more. Now, when I was a kid, I was a self-proclaimed Lego master. I got my interest in architecture early and loved to build. 
looking for pictures of interesting houses, stores, skyscrapers, and sure, even amusement parks at times was a hobby of mine. Civil engineering on a bigger scale also grabbed me, and starting with the old Sim City games, I got myself hooked on the layouts of cities and roads, and loved looking at or creating maps in general. I guess it suited me, being a logical and analytical type, despite my love for a good urban legend or scary story. Wanting to step into the world of urban planning and cartography, I took a job as a county surveyor after college. It's as menial as you'd expect, and sometimes the drivers going past you as you work shoot glares, probably because they just don't get what you're doing when you're out there staring at the landscape through our total stations like dorks. But at least I got to go somewhere new most days. And a part of me was figuring that this experience might be valuable for tracking down whatever remained of this enigmatic park. Even then, I did still want to answer the nagging question of what became of the place. My work didn't provide much entertainment, so I used my nights to map out the centre of the state, covering a wide area. At my disposal were things I didn't have before on my initial journey for information, such as GPS, Google Maps, satellite images, and quick access to a wide array of historical data. The biggest asset I had was my refined critical thinking, which gave me the ability to map the odds of Kiddyland having existed in any given area. I wanted to steadily whittle down its possible locations until I had a short list. Not a no surprise, the internet provided no direct answers to its existence. I assumed that it had been destroyed or closed long before modems entered our houses, and as no nearby newspaper had any stories of the place, I also inferred that it was far away from any town or city. It must have been in the middle of nowhere, a true roadside attraction almost too strange and non-sequitur to exist. After weeks of digging, I stumbled upon Kate once more. At first I didn't know it was her Tumblr page, during the site's earliest days, which was a photo blog of odd attractions throughout Florida, with some places from out of state mixed in as well. As far as photographic subjects went, she really took up her father's mantle, but I might have passed her by if it wasn't for a single post she'd made around the beginning of her page's creation. She'd taken a picture of an abandoned front gate of a local, small amusement park somewhere in Arkansas. The sign was colourful and cheery, yet utterly decrepit and about ready to rot away completely. And it was somewhat familiar, a fact that Kate had also picked up on as evident by her comment on the image. After reading it, I decided that it was finally time to contribute. She'd written, This sign reminds me of Kiddyland, closer to home. Not that anyone would remember it, but I swear it was real. I soon got in touch with her, and we began exchanging emails. At first she was happy to hear from a fellow Florida kid, but she didn't actually believe that I also had memories of the park. She'd kept in light correspondence with Jack over the years, and despite working together, they apparently never heard from anyone else with recollections. So I could understand her scepticism, and I felt crappy that I hadn't said something ten years ago. Jack had moved out of state, but his interest never left him. Soon the three of us were like old friends catching up. We had many long nights together, three weighing in private chat rooms. We were all Florida 90s kids with similar interests, and we talked about a lot more than Kitty Island. It was nice just to connect with people who grew up within a hundred miles of me. We became good friends, and over the months we synchronized all that we knew about the park, however little that was, and began to focus more on theory. My mad geography skills, as Jack put it, helped establish a probable, much smaller range of where Kitty Land could have been, in turn making them feel a little less delusional in their belief that it was real. Before I came along, as far as they knew it, it could have been anywhere in the state. They still had contributions of their own and shared with me years of work. Both were more sociable and outgoing than I was, and spent the last decade visiting library archives, calling people who could have had some possible connection to the park, and researching all manner of tax codes, construction, land ownership, and the business of theme parks. But they gave up several years ago because boredom had triumphed over intrigue. The two lived a few counties apart and had never met, 
And then Jack moved to Georgia six months ago. Without a single adult to legitimise the park's history, like a former staff member or a parent of a visiting child, I could see why they'd done what they could to research the place under constant doubt. And while Kiddie Land hadn't taken over any of our lives, it was a powerful enough force to sometimes disrupt them. We agreed to continue our work until we could at least prove or disprove the park, so that we could move on, free of its lingering presence. After months of chatting, in late 2008 we decided to meet each other in person. We chose a chain restaurant off of I-75 in the north. Before then I'd never even met in person any online friends I'd ever made. It was a strange new experience for me, but they both seemed pretty normal. We met sat, ate, and talked for over two hours. We tried to keep it light-hearted, focusing more on getting used to each other before going on a nearby nature walk for some seclusion and diving into our shared topic of interest. Jack was a year younger than me, and a gamer and eternal teenager. He worked from home and even won money from online game tournaments. Though his lifestyle was basically a walking archetype, he was also very creative, and both a programmer and lover of fine science fiction. He believed that he'd visited the park in 1992, the latest of the three of us. Kate was the tallest, and had confidence to go along with her height. The rimless glasses that hovered over a few freckles gave her an air of maturity, and she was certainly the most accomplished among us, having served on the ground at MacDill Air Force Base in some technical position. I wasn't sure how I hoped she was, or what she did exactly. Well, I didn't want to pry. She had a soft centre, though, and a love of adventure. And as a photographer, she carried her camera everywhere. She also visited the park in 1990, but in December. On our second go-around on the nature trail, we began speaking a little more personally with each other. And that was when we learned of some ominous shared, similar stories that cast the mystery in a darker light. All of us had personal tragedies that happened around the time of our park visits, specifically shortly after we came to and left Kiddie Land. I spoke first, really only mentioning in passing how we were hit by a drunk driver that had spun off an on-ramp, right into our car, probably within an hour of leaving the park something I rarely shared with people, but I was at the point when I wanted to search out any other possible connections. And I'd found one. We stopped on one of the boardwalks above the Nature Trail's marshland, and soon Jack was telling us about how he lost both of his maternal grandparents, perhaps the night after his visit, to a house fire in Daytona Beach. He was closer to them than he was to his own parents, who, according to him, never cared for me much but I think Kate's story was the most tragic. When she was six and her older sister was eight, they took a week off to visit every theme park in the state that they could find. They wanted lasting family bonding time, as Kate's sister had advanced leukemia. She was confined to a wheelchair, but Kate could recall that she still enjoyed the trip even more than she did. Somewhere along the way, before heading home, they must have gone to Kiddyland together. But again, for whatever reason... Her father never took any pictures of the place. Kate's sister soon after experienced complications and died a week later in hospice care. Her family was never the same. None of ours were, after our separate tragedies. We'd all fundamentally changed in our young lives. Maybe we grew up a little faster than most kids, and the idea that a backwards park seemed involved well, it changed our perception. Jack was the first to blurt out what we were all thinking. But Kitty Land was a cursed place, a bringer of misfortune. I think he just wanted to change the tone of the uncomfortable conversation. He seemed averse to real life's harder events, but I knew we'd all briefly entertain that very idea. Kate soon had another take, and made a good point. Her sister had suffered through cancer for years and was on a clear decline during her last few months. The park couldn't have caused her illness. There was no reason to assume it was somehow responsible for a house fire or car crash either. 
We decided not to waste the day driving around the state, or even just my defined probable area looking for remnants. We knew the odds of actually seeing anything of the park were, by now, just too small. Instead, after dinner, and before Kate and Jack started their long journeys home, once our minds were clear again following the earlier emotional discussion, we tried forming a collective visual of the park, maybe even a map, if we were able. I could certainly help with that. So, what did we know, or at least thought we knew? We started with the basics, the size, colours and shapes of the park. Then we moved on to rides, and the people we remembered seeing there. All of our memories were hazy and scattered, so probably none of them were all too accurate. Even so, after hours at a restaurant table that we occupied right up until closing time, I made the first known visual representation of the place. A simple sketch. Oh, they were missing blank spots, and the known rides were likely not in their correct locations. Still, we all agreed that my sketch was, actually, eerily similar to what few images remained tucked away in our heads. The front gate was colourful and simple, with painted balloons floating up wooden posts up to an old cast-iron marquee. The words Kitty Land were painted to look like they'd been written in chalk. Oddly, while we could form a solid consensus of the gate, everything inside the park became less vivid and more debatable. Jack thought there was an old merry-go-round with wooden horses, but Kate and I both remembered a small roller coaster meant for children, like the kind you'd find at a county fair that might have had a crappy dragon's head painted on its front. Well, we all agreed that there was definitely a bumper car in it, where the cars were maybe painted like bugs. Aside from a possible petting zoo, fun house, and inner tube filled small pool, the only other things we could really recall were a few food and toy stands and bathrooms. We surmised that the land was likely no bigger than a typical department store. Amusement parks were always good at disguising their size, appearing larger when you're inside them. We even guessed that tickets were probably around three to five bucks for children. It did, after all, sound like a quaint place not much more than a permanently active mom-and-pop small-town Florida fairground. They both took pictures of the sketch with their phones, and, satisfied, at least for now, we all headed to our homes, back to the real world. Well, weeks went by, and we hadn't talked online much since our get-together. I scanned my sketch and sent it to Kate, who posted it on her blog just for fun, and maybe to see if anyone had any reactions to it. To kill time, I began casually researching amusement park lore and some urban exploration on the side. Places like Disney's Discovery Island and Mirror Country, both closed down with reputations of their own, really started to fascinate me. And there were people that managed to get inside parks all over the world that had been left to decay, many of them small and once independently run. I was able to visualise myself, Exploring a rotting kiddie land, taking pictures, proving it was real. Then, on the first night of winter, I got a call from my sister, who still lived in the same town as our dad. She was incredibly upset, and I had to force her to tell me what was wrong. Through her tears, she told me the bad news. Our dad had killed himself, just hours ago. His depression had been out in the open for many years, but he always seemed to at least manage to get by day after day. Or maybe it was simply being lonely that finally drove him to end everything. And naturally, we both felt guilty in different, multiple ways. I offered to drive down and be there for her, but it was already one in the morning, and she insisted that I could come in the morning. My sister was always a strong and independent person, so I was sure she was handling things all right. Before she hung up, she sounded uneasy, like she had something else to say. But she knew that it wasn't the right time. Just before I awoke in the morning, when I was still addled by sleeping pills, I had a short but very vivid dream. I was walking in Kiddyland, and I saw everything. It didn't even feel like a dream at all. It felt like a real memory, either returning to me or somehow being born right as I was experiencing it. The moment I was up, I got to work. 
I wrote down what I'd seen on my phone and had the dream cycle around in my mind many times in my attempt to memorize and grab hold of it tightly. I saw the rides. I saw other kids and the staff. I saw faces. I even tasted the ice cream. I could feel the warm sun, just as I could feel the color. Strangely, I could sense each color and how vibrant they were, and yet it all looked washed out, like a Polaroid photo. I had no doubt that the sudden recurrence was the sharpest the three of us had ever experienced. And then I remembered what had happened last night and where I had to be. I made the two-hour drive back to my second house, trying my hardest not to think of the park. I had much more important things to tend to today. I didn't even consider that I was now an orphan until I was going down the last off-ramp. I spent a week back home trying to get it all over with. I spoke with family members on my dad's side that I hadn't seen in years. A few of my mum's relatives were there too. I didn't know how to act really, so I survived the days on autopilot and let everyone else do the talking. I found that a suicide brought a kind of stigma, a shared regret that loomed over everything and made the proceedings feel heavier than other funerals. Christmas didn't exist that year. My sister spent most of her time with her husband and baby daughter. I kept mostly to myself and sort of drifted through the house, trying to recall the good times the three of us had had here together. Not that there were many. On the last day of my visit, I went up to my old room and sketched out a more refined version of Kiddyland before I forgot that dream entirely. It was as if I'd seen the entirety of the small park in my head that morning through a series of flashes. Well, with some guesswork, I was able to create a fairly decent map with all the rides and paths. Only the top middle of the park was blank. It looked like something should logically go there, in that spot between the roller coaster and the pool, but I just couldn't think of anything. My sister came in once I was done. We talked about things, like what we'd be doing with the house. We knew this meant that we were, in a way, official adults now, and our lives would be changing. But just as I was thinking that maybe it was time to let go of Kitty Land for good, she looked at my sketch, and her eyes widened just a little. She told me that she remembered the front gate, and the time long ago when I asked her about the park. She didn't know why or how she could suddenly see its entrance in her head again, and though she had no images past it, she was positive that the gate looked just like that. Well, I was once more locked in. On the way back to my apartment, I wondered what else could be at work here, and my mind began to entertain more supernatural explanations. Was it possible that something was triggering or even creating memories, false or otherwise? Had something happened in our childhoods that made us this way? If another tragedy struck one of us, would we be afflicted again? My sister was too young to create proper memories when we supposedly went to Kiddyland, and as I threw more and more ever wilder explanations at myself, I settled on one idea that somehow felt entirely possible. What if I actually had no recollection of the park until the moment of the accident? It's already easy to forget the chronological order of your own life. There was an email from Kate waiting for me when I got home. The number of kiddie landers had grown again, and our newest member was our youngest. I'll call him Tyler, and he claimed to have gone to the park in 1993. He told us nothing else until our first chat room discussion on New Year's Eve. While I had what the four of us saw as the earliest encounter with the park, Tyler claimed that he certainly had the last. Before we even got our introductions out of the way or learned anything about him, He shared with us how he remembered it. It was a very different kind of memory. He was there when it burnt down, and furthermore he thought he knew what road it was once on, or just off of. Coming out of nowhere after seeing the posting of my first sketch, he changed everything with a few messages. Yeah, anyway, uh, about Kiddylan. I grew up with divorced parents. Every other weekend my dad would pick me up and take me to his house out in the boonies. We used State Road 40. That was pretty much the only central Florida road I traveled as a kid. 
I've done my research on my own for a while. By the way, for some reason, I don't remember Ashley pulling into the park. So, um, I guess I'm kind of reclusive. And I've been following Kate online for a few months. Yeah, that sounds probably pretty creepy, but I was there when it was burning in what had to be 1993. Yeah, I would have been five. My only memories are of it being on fire. People were screaming. They were on fire too, even the kids. None of us had responded yet. I should have told the others beforehand my theory of the memories possibly being somehow false. But I didn't see anyone die. And my parents aren't there. They all just ran away as everything burns. Also, all I do is walk like I'm not scared of any of this. Well, I had therapy for a while. The guy got me convinced that it was just a recurring dream. But I'm sure again that it isn't. The scary part is the memory makes me feel happy. Like a part of me enjoys watching it burn. Oh, so, um, yeah, when should we meet? We decided to take it slow with Tyler. And I didn't think Jack appreciated his apparent fondness for fire, considering the nature of his memory trigger. Tyler's revelation of the right road to be looking at, and his own story of how he remembered the place, already gave us enough to think about for the night. But I went ahead and divulged my theory that the park wasn't even real, that it was a false memory that we all somehow had embedded into us, and it was activated when we suffered a personal disruption of childhood. But he was different. Unlike the rest of us, his life had been mostly uneventful. Furthermore, his only images of the park came to him in vivid dreams. He couldn't even remember times before he dreamed about it. While they were intrigued by my theory, I wanted to cast off any doubt about its possibility, so I shared my recent occurrence. I told them that it couldn't have been a coincidence that I saw Kitty Land again the morning after I learned what my dad had done. At first, my friend's only responses, aside from condolences, were how I was more concerned about the park than my family. I told them I wasn't obsessive, that this was just something I had to share. I was still grounded in reality. I wasn't thinking about the park all the time. Only I realized that, at this point, I was. And what I asked the three to do next only emphasized my steady spiral downwards into obsession. I wanted us to get together within a week or two, while Tyler, a college student, was still on winter break. He was close by and didn't mind, but Katie and Jack argued that they'd only just been with me and had better things to do. I told them I'd pay for their expenses, and it would only be for a day or two, and that if we didn't find anything, I'd drop it. I went on about how close we were now, how we could end things, and amazingly I managed to convince them. In hindsight, I touched the boundaries of raving lunacy, and I guess in that moment my passion to solve the mystery finally ran over the brim. A week later, during the early January doldrums, our group met at a small airstrip in the morning. It was a cool, clear day, and we'd be able to see for miles and miles. Knowing that it was now or never on finding any remnant at all of Kitty Land, I'd decided to go all out and hired a pilot to fly us through the middle of Florida in a small plane, or at least the length of State Road 40. Well, as much time as I'd spent on satellite maps looking for prospects, I wanted to see the entire area for myself, hoping that one of us would have a kind of eureka moment upon seeing a specific plot of land from the air. It was expensive but I had some inheritance coming my way. Kate and Jack obviously thought I was crazy for going this far, but they still got into the plane. Tyler was hard to read. He was strange. When we first saw him pull up and get out of his ancient Toyota, all we saw were two small, dark eyes looking at us from under a grey hoodie. He didn't say much at first, and although he did eventually warm up to us, I often caught him staring at me, as if studying me. Our small two-engine plane flew from Akala to the east. The pilot didn't ask what we were trying to see more than once, and we got a good view of the National Forest on the way. He kept us as low and slow as possible, and I took many pictures of the roads. We all kept our sight on the landscape below, Tyler especially. 
We figured anything strange might either stand out in the swaths of trees, or be covered up by them and remain lost forever. At one point, Tyler suddenly turned and looked out of the right side. I felt compelled to as well, as did Kate and Jack once they saw that we were fixated on something. They leaned over us and saw that a few miles away was a square patch of dirt not far from State Road 40, just off of a smaller forest road heading south. The land was free of trees and looked like a construction site of some kind. It was just big enough for a small theme park. With not much on the horizon, I marked the location on a map and asked the pilot to turn around and land. I felt that there was no reason to go further out. If that spot wasn't what we were looking for, we wouldn't find another. Back on the ground, we got in my car and I drove us out there. On the way, I asked Tyler what he thought. I had to refrain from asking him something more mystical, like if he felt anything, although at this point I wouldn't have been surprised if he did. He still seemed invested, but Kate and Jack were clearly losing what little interest remained. I couldn't blame them. They'd put in more work and time in chasing after this place than I ever had, until just recently. Deep into the National Forest and with no other cars around for miles, I slowed, stopped, tried to sense anything off about the area, and then turned onto the southbound road. My palms sweaty on the wheel. I drove just another quarter mile, found the currently empty construction site, and pulled off the road. We all got out. I started taking pictures right away, of dirt. It was quiet and lonely out here, with nothing around but the faint sounds of nature in the thick layers of trees. The others were unimpressed, and the area didn't exude any sort of feeling other than isolation. We walked into the square of earth where trees had been cleared, and the only signs of human presence were mover tracks and sparse litter. We didn't see anything out of the ordinary, and the land was unmarked. It didn't look like they were putting a building of any sort out here. Kate assumed that it might become a parking lot later for park visitors. The plot of land was no bigger than a typical department store. Every 15 minutes either Kate or Jack asked if we could leave now. I asked for another extension each time, and in any case, we'd only taken my car, so they'd have to wait until I was satisfied. Tyler at least had shown some genuine fascination as he sized up the place, so he kept to his usual silent self and began to give me strange looks again. I didn't know what we should be looking for, or if this was even the right spot. Still, we hunted for a bit of, well, everything. Foundations, bricks, buried toys, trees growing around, an old fence or lamppost. We searched for old garbage that would have survived, like soda lids, plastic toys, and metallic ride remnants such as springs and screws. We scoured the nearby trees for toppled sign and kicked dirt away to maybe reveal ticket stubs or mats. Well, if there ever was a small theme park out here, there should have been some lingering evidence of it. By the time the sun began dipping under the treetops, we'd run out of water, energy bars, and motivation to keep searching. Kate and Jack looked like they never wanted to think about Kitty Land again. I personally wanted to keep up the quest, with or without them, but as I was thinking about where to look next and got ready to go back to my car, Tyler shouted out to us. We followed his distant voice until we caught up with him, deep in the woods. He'd found a lonely utility shed. It was little more than chip blue paint, cinder block and an aluminum roof and door. Oh, at its side, partially buried under pine needles, was a sturdy concrete foundation with four holes drilled into its top where something had once been anchored to the ground. The small structure had been obscured by the trees and impossible to see from the road or construction site. After some quick visual measurements, I could tell that it was lined up to the centre of the dirt square. The same spot on my kiddie land sketch that I couldn't map out. With Kate and Jack's interest rekindled, we worked together to pry the door open and stepped inside. The windowless interior wasn't much bigger than a walk-in closet, but without the walking space. Rusted barrels, rotting wooden crates, and boxes of old light bulbs and tools covered nearly every inch from the dirt-covered floor to the mouldy ceiling. 
Faded white stencil writing was still legible on a few of the containers, but they were only serial numbers of some kind and wouldn't give us any clues. There was a single light fixture that burnt out long ago, but there was still something else quietly powered in the shed. Every few seconds, a faint chirp-like beep came from the back, from some place buried under the forgotten equipment. Kate had never heard a sound quite like it, but figured that it was most likely a simple radio transponder. Information could still be broadcasting to a shady corporation or government agency. Knowing that an inexplicable force had driven four Florida kids to come all the way out to a strange shed in the forest, we worked to clear it out and find the source of the beeping. If we couldn't take out or open the device... We could at least get tons of pictures and do whatever it took to find out just what it was, and who it was connected to. At that point, we all must have felt vindicated, assured that we were all sane and had the fortune to be in on something very exclusive, secretive and potentially life-changing. Kate tossed out one last empty barrel that had been stacked in the corner. And there it was, a dented ugly 1960s era cabinet that looked like a fuse box and had four steady green lights with one blinking amber that lit up the box that let out its digitized chirp just as it had been doing tirelessly for decades if not longer the padlock was badly damaged and brown with rust after waiting briefly to take a few pictures and to ask Kate if she thought it was safe to force it open I took one of the nearby hammers and bashed it the padlock broke off under a puff of iron dust, and the compartment door creaked open. We all squeezed in close to get a good look. Inside was a bizarre set of analog dials, switches, glowing dots of light, capacitors, and the thing that stood out the most. A small, green, phosphor computer monitor. It measured only about five inches, was built all the way into the cement wall behind it, and it had no apparent inputs. Whatever kind of information it once kept was gone, but it and the computer it was hooked up to were somehow still operating. The single blinking text cursor even now awaited a command. I felt like we'd seen more than enough, and my gut was telling me that it was time to leave, that we shouldn't have come here in the first place. The other three were astonished by what we'd found, but I knew that whatever it was that we'd truly been looking for once sat on the foundation outside, and that this radio beacon was only a fragment of what went on here. As my want, uh, my need, to simply go home grew, I went outside and searched for a cable, or some clue of how this shed was powered. The others were too enamoured by the antiquated tech inside. Both Kate and Jack were studying the box and transmitter, and already arguing about their origin. I couldn't explain it, but I was starting to feel a deep, primal fear, similar to what I'd experienced moments after the accident. It was as if the device was still broadcasting a signal that made my very memories feel vulnerable. I became afraid that I'd suddenly lose them, or have them tampered with again. I was then desperate to end an obsession that had grown steadily for over a decade. I never found the power source for the shed, so I did the only thing that made sense. I took one of the empty metal barrels that we'd tossed out and charged in like a madman. I smashed the transmitter first, and with every ounce of my strength ran the barrel into the compartment. The tiny monitor's glass shattered, sparks flew, and the capacitor caught on fire. I expected Cade and Jack to flip around, shout at me, and demand that I explain why I'd just done such a thing. But they simply kept staring at the equipment, even though it was broken, ignoring me entirely. Only Tyler looked at me, with just a tinge of surprise. And then, I felt my head exploding. The worst pain I'd ever felt ripped through my skull, and I ran from the shed and back out onto the construction site. All I could think about was the aspirin in my car, as if it would do anything to quell such a headache. I stopped moving as soon as I left the trees, and saw something. There was a rip in space, moving like a flag on a windy day. All throughout the area I could see fragments of what looked like another world, another time. Part of me knew by instinct that 
It was all in my head, but I still couldn't convince myself it wasn't real. The tear grew quickly. Beyond was the same forest, but with different patterns of trees of different sizes. The world separated itself from mine by way of its colours. They weren't as rich. They'd lost much of their saturation. The dimension grew and spread across the ground. A fenced parking lot appeared, and then an entire building. It was a two-story facility with tinted windows and no lettering. The few cars in the lot, all black sedans, were made no later than the early 1990s, and the building had a large satellite dish on its roof. I felt lightheaded, close to passing out. I quickly spun around and caught a very brief glimpse of the shed. It was still surrounded by trees, but there was a pathway leading to it. And nearby, on the cement foundation, was a metal radio tower that just barely stood taller than the forest's tree line. As my hearing devolved into a loud buzzing, I lost consciousness and hit the ground. Although I'd seen parking lot asphalt under me, I remember landing in dirt shortly before blacking out entirely into a dreamless sleep. I awoke in a hospital in Akala, about 25 miles away. It was just like waking up on any other day without pain. A nurse came in and told me I'd been out for two days. My sister had arrived first. We didn't talk about Kitty Land at all, though she did wonder how I'd ended up so far away in such a lonely place. As we spoke over the course of an hour, I began to feel that something was off. It was like I'd lost time, that some part of me was missing. Then Tyler came in, still dressed in his grey hoodie, as he told me what had happened, I picked up that he remembered the experience differently than I had. I asked him where Kate and Jack had gone, and if they were okay. My sister asked him who Kate and Jack were, and looked at Tyler. He only shrugged. I told him he'd been following Kate online, but he denied it. I asked about the shed. He told me that we'd found nothing out there but a patch of dirt. Shortly after arriving, I stared into space for around five minutes before collapsing. I was unresponsive, and he'd managed to get me here. My heart raced. I had no idea what had just happened to me, or what was real, if anything. Memory had betrayed me. How many years had I... I asked him about Kiddyland. He looked at me oddly, and reminded me that the whole reason we drove all the way out there was to find it. Well, my sister told me that I'd been talking about it for a while now. Eventually, Tyler believed my amnesia excuse and summarized a reality that had been lost to me. He told me we'd got in touch after he saw the first version of the park sketch that I'd posted on my Tumblr blog. I wanted to respond that, while I had one, it was neglected. I'd never posted anything. My best course of action was to only listen and accept, since I was the one in the hospital bed. Not long after I made the better, truer second sketch, we met and set out. We still took a plane, although it was just the two of us. My credit card bill confirmed this. Over time I came to terms with the fact that I'd somehow screwed up my memory after going to that site, which had affected me in a way that it hadn't for Tyler. But I wasn't convinced that he was free of tampering either, if he couldn't recall the shed. I didn't know what had actually happened, and I don't think I ever will. I think that my memories were altered again the moment I attacked the machine. Everything that had happened before that instant, concerning Kiddylan, was a skewed version of truth. Some of it real, some of it fictionalised in a way that led me to believe I'd come across a sight in a different manner. But regardless of what knotted, mangled version of personal history now existed in my head... Something didn't add up about Jack, and, to a greater extent, Kate. I only got involved in everything after seeing that one picture of hers. Before I left the hospital, I used my phone to find her blog. It was still there, along with that image of a park in Arkansas. I knew Jack was real too, only I'd never spoken to him, and I'd never contacted Kate either. I then showed Tyler her page. He looked a little dumbfounded at first, that I'd been worrying about the safety of someone not even involved with our story. Then he asked me why I'd never gotten in touch with her. As I checked out, 
My mind was busy trying to sort through what might have really happened, and what was translated into a subtly changed reality that helped guide me to what could be some big existential self-fulfilling prophecy. Maybe some invisible third party led me to that shed. But, well, without my memories intact, it's an impossible task to explain everything. Before I parted ways with Tyler, he pulled me aside as my sister sat in my car and waited for me in the driver's seat. Shared something that made the Kiddie Land saga even more confusing and foreboding. He stared at me the way he did earlier because he remembered me from his dream. As everything burned, I was standing in the centre of the park, smiling. But I wasn't my six year old self. I was an adult, just as I was now. He'd grown up wondering about the identity of that man, and seeing me in person only brought up more questions. Well, I didn't know what to say at first. I was overloaded by then. In the end, I only asked him if he thought I'd destroyed the park. No, he told me. He always had the impression that I'd created it. And yet I was glad to see it burn to the ground. But after listening to my description earlier of things that had never happened, he now had a distrust of his own past and told me not to dwell on it too much. Sure enough, I couldn't help it. I returned to the construction site days after going home, on my own. There was no shed or tower base, but the ground where they'd been was torn up. I could only deduce that something had recently been removed. Things went back to normal after that. I worked, I slept, I ate, and I browsed the web. I never had any more vivid recollections of the part designed to come to children who needed a good childhood memory. I could only ever recall the slowly fading images that came back to me at sixteen. Well, a few years ago, I pulled out the old family photo albums again and went through them. I did a double take on one image, flipping the page back after realising that I'd seen something strange in its background. I had to have been five when it was shot. I was on the carpet, in my pyjamas, and smiling. The flash had been used, so while I was lit up, everything else was, for the most part, in darkness but the plastic Lego blocks behind me reflected enough light to show up, at least partially. Sometime before that weekend trip, I had made a front gate out of different coloured blocks, with room for the rest of an amusement park on the green construction plate behind it. Scribbled messily in marker, on paper taped to the sign, were the words Kitty Land. After several weeks of wondering and worrying about what it all meant, I thought about the friends I'd once thought I'd made. Maybe in this reality they weren't tired of the mystery yet. Other than the sketches in my unexplainable Lego photo, I didn't have pictures to share, since I never really took any. But I did have the most unbelievable story of my life, and that gave me a better place to start than last time. I checked to see that Kate's photo blog was still active, and then sent her the map of a quaint Florida amusement park. I decided that it was, finally, time to contribute. Oh, and one last thing. I found it on Google Maps. It's a parking lot now. We uncovered a terrible secret. Part 1. Well... Writing this isn't helping that book deal stereotype and will probably get me disappeared if I decide to actually publish this, but I figured that someone should know what happened to us. In the end, I hope this finds the right people and it brings some form of closure. Afghanistan, 1300 hours local time. Tex, hey Tex, wake up. Skipper needs us in the skiff. Petty Officer First Class Smith spoke as he cracked open the door to our hooch. The ambient noise from the heavy machinery, accompanied by the Afghan summer heat that smelled of human feces, bled inside the cramped air-conditioned room as he stood in the doorway. The men and women of Camp Rattler were wide awake and going about their day, but it was still night for guys like us who were working vampire hours. I let out a quiet curse and plucked the pair of sunglasses off the stand next to my rack and pulled them over my eyes before getting dressed and shuffling into a pair of shower shoes that were by the door. Ah, this shit better be worth it, 
I grumbled over to Smith, who handed me a small foam cup of black coffee as we joined the five other operators who were huddled around the massive fire pit in the centre of the small secluded compound inside the massive FOB. Well, considering you're up now, I assume it is. Smith smirked as he scratched his bushy brown beard before running a hand through his shaggy hair. Oh, I forgot. You're an old man now, Tex. He grinned as the others talked among themselves. Ah, oh, you can still kick your ass any day of the week, Smitty. I shot back as we walked across the courtyard that had a few other SOF teams lounging around and working out or cleaning their gear. We'd been in the country for three months. Our mission tempo had been high and kinetic. It was every operator's wet dream. Do you think this is about that ship back we snatched off the eggs from last night? The eager voice of Townsend, our newest team member, who just made it through Green Team's grueling nine-month ANS pipeline, spoke out from behind me as we shuffled towards a plywood Fort Knox on the other side of the compound. Did you do something we need to know about? I mean... You were the last one with him, after all, I asked, raising an eyebrow at him as we approached two soldiers clad in full battle rattle, who gave us a nod and waved us through as we flashed our IDs. No, senior chief, just speculating is all, Townsend finally responded as a pair of F-18s boomed over our heads before they banked off to the south. Despite the drawdown, the war was still in full swing for the men and women of Camp Rattler. About time, gents. Master Chief Brock, our team lead, greeted us with a nod and gestured towards the secure door behind him. Skip us inside with some suit from Langley, so play nice, yeah. We all shuffled inside the cramped skiff and took our seats around the table in the centre of the room. Despite the lame exterior of the building, the interior was the complete opposite. High-tech equipment lined the walls, accompanied by small workstations, along with a pair of LCD screens and digital clocks that sat above the skipper and our new nameless guest. Sorry for waking you all so soon, gentlemen, but this is very important. Our skipper apologized and walked to the head of the table. This is Carson. He gestured towards a man who was wearing a pair of Ray-Bans on his head and looked like he'd gotten lost on the way to the golf course. Thank you, sir. The man shook our skipper's hand with a pearl-white smile and looked around the table with calculating eyes. Gentlemen, I'll make this quick. He pulled out a small black remote from his pocket and clicked a button. A few seconds later, the LCD screens behind him lit up with different images. Some were satellite photos, others were ISR feeds, but they all showed what looked like a fortified entrance on the side of a mountain face. According to our humans and recent ISR feeds, we uncovered an old Soviet-era weapons depot. Carson paused for a moment. Now, Intel suggests that the Soviets left experimental technologies and weaponry that are still sitting inside somewhere. We cannot risk the Taliban or any other group getting their hands on what's inside. Another image from an ISR feed showed three heat signatures sitting outside of the supposed entrance around a small fire. Master Chief, your team, along with two members from mine, will hit this target site and find out what exactly is inside before sealing the entrance. You have an AC-130 and two Apache gunships on standby if shit hits the fan. I couldn't help but grin at the thought of those angels of death watching over us. With that being said, recent reports are showing that Taliban activity in the area has spiked in the past 48 hours, so expect anything when you land. Carson gauged the room as we all took notes. Any questions so far? He asked as Smith raised a finger. Should we expect any of our rusky friends to be on site? Smith asked as he tapped the table with his pen. Not to our knowledge, and if you do, don't fire unless fired apart. We don't need an international incident here. Carson answered, his voice sounding like an annoyed parent when their kid is asking stupid questions. Sir... What about potential CBRN exposure? I asked next, pushing my sunglasses to the top of my head as my leg bounced endlessly. There should be no life-threatening materials down there, Senior Chief. Does that answer your question? The man said with a condescending tone. I was about to make a smart-ass remark, but Brock gave me the stop it or we'll get our asses chewed look. 
after what felt like an eternity, we finally wrapped things up as hushed voices filled the room. I found myself thinking of the endless potential threats and scenarios that could unfold as the team dispersed and exited the cramped skiff. I'm Luke, and this here is Rays. The CI spook in the corner of the room that remained silent up until now introduced himself and the woman next to him as I passed them. Jason. I forced myself to stop and extended out an open hand towards him with a fake smile. Hope you all can keep up. The hard-bodied woman with the jet black hair, who was all of five feet tall, shook my hand with an iron grip and a fire in her eyes. Likewise, you team guys seem to be all talk nowadays, it seems. She retorted as Brock called them over to the table. And that was my cue to leave. The hours passed like seconds, and we found ourselves all kitted up with tools of the trade while we waited for further instruction inside the courtyard. Out of boredom, my finger traced over the faded Texas flag patch on my ATAC case as I watched the rest of the team gather around the fire pit under the moonlit sky. These men are my brothers. My family. My team. Brock tapped my shoulder and pulled me from my thoughts. He cradled his helmet under his right arm and let his rifle hang by its sling. Is everything all right, Jason? He finally asked as he ran a hand over his stubbled face. I'm solid, boss man. I finally answered and shifted my stance. But I'm not sure about our new friends, though. I gestured towards Ray's and Luke, who were talking with Carson on the far side of the courtyard away from everyone else. Brock just shook his head as he adjusted the contacts mounted to the helmet before looking at me. Oh, you have us, brother, he gestured to the rest of the team. Now, get your head in the game. Time to get evil. He held out a closed fist in my direction with a wide grin. I grinned back, bumping his fist in response as the ten of us shuffled out of the compound and towards our waiting transport. In a matter of minutes... We were on a Black Hawk helicopter and tearing over the Afghan countryside under the cover of darkness. Thirty seconds, Brock called out on the comms over the roaring wind as he signaled around the cramped crew compartment that was bathed in a red glow. Oh shit, I must have fallen asleep. Thirty seconds, I yelled in response, mirroring the signal around the crew compartment before checking over my kit one last time as my right leg hung limply out of the open cargo door. Feeling satisfied with the check, I snapped down the NVGs mounted to my helmet and peered out over the shimmering terrain that was now basked in the greenish-gray monochrome of night vision. I got tired of the blurry mountains in the distance and glanced back over my shoulder to see Rays giving Luke a quick thumbs up before pulling out a small black device from her vest and pressing a button on it before sliding it back into its pouch. The hello banked hard to the right on its final approach, causing me to brace myself on the doorframe as the nose of the helicopter flared upward. It touched down in a small clearing and we dismounted in a matter of seconds before being left in complete silence. Two, take point. Rock's voice buzzed in my headset, shattering the dead silence. Moving. I stood up and pushed past Smith and the other two operators, who were covering our six o'clock. I shuffled past Townsend and Luke next, before finally passing Ray's, who was covering our eleven o'clock. According to the ATAC, the target site was supposed to be right down from the little clearing we'd landed in, only I wasn't seeing anything other than a small thicket of trees in our path. Where the hell is this stupid... My internal rant was cut off when a dark figure shifted positions in another small clearing to my front. I activated the IR laser mounted to my rifle, followed the figure as it walked back towards us. The faint sounds of talking were being picked up by my headset, but I couldn't tell who or what was talking. The figure finally stopped a few meters inside the thinly wooded area we were in, and the sound of water hitting rock filled my ears. Oh, dude's taking a piss. Without warning, Ray's drifted past me in a low crouch with a knife in hand. Whiskey, tango, foxtrot. My hand shot out and missed the drag strap on her plate carrier by an inch. 
Oh, she cleared the distance between them in a matter of seconds and managed to get the figure onto the ground. There was a small violent struggle before the two stopped moving. A few seconds later, Raze was on her feet and signalled me to move forward. As I got closer, I could make out the typical man dress and a bulky AK ammo rig on the now dead man at my feet. A look of fear was plastered on his bearded face, and a long jagged cut had severed both carotid arteries and his trachea as a ragged wet hiss escaped from the new orifice. Ray's pointed towards one more fighter with his back to us, who was sitting in front of a dying fire with slouched shoulders. I nodded and unsheathed the Winkler tomahawk bound to the back of my kit as I manoeuvred towards the unsuspecting fighter. My heart slammed against my chest like a drum as I closed the distance. Things were about to get very violent very fast. I swung the blade down hard. It connected with the fighter's neck with a sickening wet crunch. The violent blow caused his head to snap to the side and almost come off. Cold droplets of blood hit my exposed wrists as the man fell on his side before I hit him in the temple with the spear point of the tomahawk. What the hell? He's already dead. We're clear. Razor's voice was delayed in my headset as the rest of the team emerged from the wood line. There it is. Ray spoke as she stepped past me and reached out, grabbing hold of a dark camo net. She pulled it down to reveal an ancient-looking fortified bunker entrance with a faded star with a hammer and sickle in it, painted on the door and overhead slab of concrete. More lucky. Police these bodies, Brock spoke in a whisper. He was holding two AK-47s by their slings as he walked over towards the entrance of the bunker. Gunner, Ike, Huston, pull security and join the other two and set up the inner cordon. Jack, one of them responded. Brock looked over at me. Jason, you, Townsend and Smith are with me in the suits. I gave him a thumbs up before wiping the blood off the tomahawk on the dead man's clothes before securing it back in the sheet. Luke walked up to the door and began messing with a small rusted panel. A few seconds later, the door let out a loud mechanical boom. The reinforced metal door swung inwards with a loud screech and the smell of mildew and rust hit my nose as I stepped up beside him. Ladies first. Ray's reached up, tapped my shoulder while gesturing down the wide stairwell that led down into inky blackness. I ignored the jab and shoved past her with my rifle at the ready. Doc, Alpha Warner, we're going internal. Expect issues with calm soon. Brock's voice echoed from behind me as we continued the descent. We walked for another five minutes in silence before finally reaching the bottom of the stairwell. This place was a tomb, if anything, Paintings of old Soviet leaders and other communist pieces were on the wall. Some old computers sat on a long, abandoned desk at what looked like a guard station off to our right. To our left sat cobwebbed and dust cake lounge furniture and a coffee table with an old cigarette machine next to it. Check this out, senior, Townsend called out from my left as I looked around the massive room in awe. Senior, he called out again. What? I growled turned to see Townsend holding up a mummified, severed arm still clutching on to a tattered teddy bear. Something bad happened down here, bro. He wrinkled his nose and dropped the arm as Smith stopped at my side. Get ready to ditch the NVGs. He tilted his head towards the security station and snapped his NVGs up. They're gonna turn on the lights. Smith started chuckling as he walked over to Townsend in the dark. Wish you would have told me we were raiding your place, Tex. It's uh, very retro. I gave Smith a single finger salute as we were blinded by a dull yellow flash of light that was followed by a short burst of static from what sounded like an intercom system as the two CIA spooks walked back over to us from the security station. Alright, stick close. This place is a fucking maze. Luke spoke as he took point through the door with his rifle raised. Any idea where we're going, Langley? Townsend asked as he stepped around a toppled chair. According to... Ray's was then cut off by a loud crash off to our right, 
as we passed a darkened corridor. She activated the light mounted to her rifle to reveal a massive rat who was feasting on a mummified corpse wearing a Soviet-era officer's uniform that was leaning against the wall. She let out a sigh and looked back towards Townsend. It's going to be further inside the main complex. Right now we're in the receiving bay. She poked a thumb over her shoulder. This will go on for another... I stopped listening and scanned off to my left to find another corridor that looked like one you'd see in a hotel. Doors lined both sides of the hall with metal plaques with numbers on them. Hell, it even had the same shitty carpet. Great, more walking, Townsend murmured as he checked our six. This place gives me the fucking creeps. Lock it up. Brock ordered as we entered a narrow corridor to our front that eventually opened up to a massive cafeteria section that had more bodies littered around it. First place we need to stop at should be on our left. It's in one of the med bays. Ray's chopped her hand towards a set of double doors next to me. I grunted in response and pushed through the doors with my rifle raised, only to find scattered lab equipment and a topple gurney with a brown dried stain on it that turned into a trail as I stepped past it with rays in tow. Hmm, this isn't a weapons depot. The all too familiar putrid smell of death and rotting meat started to worm its way into my nostrils as we followed the trail around the corner to the right, as it finally stopped at another set of double doors that had a black putrid substance smeared on it. Rays looked over me and gave the nod. Three, two, one. Part two. Afghanistan. O two thirty hours local time. Three, two, one. We breached the door in unison, causing a thunderous crash to echo through the hall as I cut right with my rifle raised. Ray's cut left and cleared her lane as the pale white lights inside the room flickered on and off like some fucked up rave party. Flashes of metal on the wall caught my attention as I activated the light mounted to my rifle, giving me a steady source of light. In the corner sat a hunched figure drenched in more of that black liquid that was smeared on the door. I could barely make out the dress boots and faded green fatigues. It must have been another officer or grunt. My thumb was welded to the selector switch on my rifle as the figure shot up to his feet in one jerky moment. Stop. Let me see your hands. I ordered in English first while trying to think of the Russian phrase. The figure spun towards me on a heel and began to shuffle about like a drunkard. Hands, I shouted in Russian this time. The figure swayed and kept its course with staggering steps. I flicked the selector switch to bang and rested the red dot of my sight on its chest. Stop now. At first I thought I'd dry fired until Ray's passed me. She had a small portable camera in hand. She took another picture as the figure faltered and fell to the floor with a wet thud. Ray's, what the hell are you doing? I backed up with my rifle still trained on the figure as it let out a ragged moan. Documenting, she replied coolly as I tried to comprehend what the hell this thing was as it attempted to stand back up. Don't get any of that shit on you. She backed up a few steps and snapped another picture. Oh, looks like tar or something. What the hell is it? I asked, scanning the rest of the room. We were in a morgue or holding room of some sort. Examination tables sat a few feet apart from each other, along with a few metal doors with observation slots that lined the wall. <laughs> well, if I know. She stopped as a loud bang came from one of the metal doors lining the wall to our left. Ray's pocketed the camera and swung her rifle towards the door. Shoot it. But this, this thing didn't have a gun or pose any real threat at this second. But that was the logic speaking. Well, I shucked that thought away and pulled the trigger three times. 
The tuck 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 from the suppressed rifle sounded like miniature nuclear explosions inside the confined room. The thing stumbled backward a few steps. The third round had split the top of its head in half, causing a mess of brain matter and skull to spill on the tile floor and the wall behind it. But to my surprise, the thing didn't go down. It regained its balance and let out another wet croak from its ruined head as the door to our left began to give way. Raise. Move. I backpedaled as the sounds of suppressed gunfire erupted from outside. Contact right. Contact right. Townsend called out as the metal door crashed to the ground. A hulking man wearing a sleeveless, blood-soaked telnyashka emerged from the now-open door. Americans, he bellowed with a hoarse voice as his blood-filled eyes locked with mine. I snapped my rifle in his direction and fired off three rounds that hit center mass. He just shrugged off the wounds and let out a blood-curdling scream while running towards us with outstretched arms. Well, he barreled through Ray's, sending her to the floor and into me at full speed. The world suddenly turned into a blur as I fell onto my back through the set of double doors and into the hall. The sounds of weapon fire and yelling filled my ears as this giant of a man on top of me swung down with a closed fist that slammed into my helmet with a wet crack as he pulled back his mangled right hand with another scream. I couldn't get to the rifle that was at my side, so I left it and covered my face as he landed another blow that caused stars to float in the corners of my vision. Raise! I thrashed around and bucked my hips in an attempt to get the guy off, but nothing was working. He was locked in and swinging wildly. I don't have a shot. Move! Ray yelled back as I bucked again. This time the man gave me just enough breathing room to get to the Glock on my battle belt. Just as the Glock cleared the retention holster, the man swung down with another closed fist that connected with my face, causing my eyes to water and a flood of blood to fill my mouth as I struck out with my free hand and connected with his chin. Through tears, I watched as the man pulled his fist back for another blow. Oh shit, this is gonna hurt. I fired off one round that tore a hole through his shoulder and that sent him into another screaming fit. As his fists came down, a flash of black and tan crossed my vision and the man's head snapped to the side, causing his body to follow as the heavy weight lifted off my stomach. Ray's pumped several rounds into the man as she situated herself in the kneeling position beside me. The man groaned and clutched his mangled hand while trying to get his feet under him. You good? she asked as she swapped out magazines and trained her rifle down the hall. Good, I stammered as I got up to my feet and steadied myself on the wall before grabbing my rifle up off the floor. Down from us was a scene that reminded me of the old western movies I'd watched as a kid. Brock had hip-tossed a woman wearing a tattered lab coat over a table before shooting her in the face. Smith swung a plastic chair that connected with a uniformed man's face while Townsend and Luke were fighting a shirtless, hulking man wearing a blue beret. What the f... I was cut off by an iron grip that clutched onto my ankle, causing me to curse out loud. I glanced down to see the battered and angry face of the man who'd punched me. I just simply tilted my rifle and fired off one round that obliterated his face in an explosion of blood and gore. His hand, however, still clutched my ankle. Moving, Race called out as I ripped my boot free from the hand that was still clutching at the air. We cleared the threshold of the cafeteria entrance and began selecting our tyrics while moving. One down. On to the next. My red dot found another target and my finger pulled the trigger, putting another person down. As soon as it started, it stopped. A mass of dead bodies now lay inside the hall and centre of the cafeteria, surrounded by empty brass casings and bloody chairs. What the fuck is going on here? Rock yelled over at Luke, who was hunched over and dry heaving. The smell of cordite and blood hung thick in the air, and was so strong that it was palpable. Luke just held up a hand and heaved once more, 
as I checked on Townsend and Smith. Oh, this was beyond fucked. We obviously were left out on some key details here. Listen here, you son of a bitch. Brock suddenly snapped, grabbing the CIA spook by the straps of his plate carrier and standing him up straight. I'm not going to risk the lives of my men if there's nothing to gain here. Spittle dotted Luke's face as Brock shoved him back. Oh, weapons deep on my ass, I muttered, as Townsend smeared the line of blood on his cheek with the back of his gloved hand. This is something else entirely. So, what is it? I asked, looking over at Ray's. We... She avoided my gaze and began to speak, but Luke cut her off with a yell. Ray's... Shut it. Master Chief, you are not in charge here. We are. Luke emphasized we as he pointed at Reyes. If you cannot proceed with the mission tasking, then go back outside and send in another person who will. I was stunned by the ballsy response from the CIA spook as he stared up at Brock with no emotion. Where do we need to go next? Brock asked, spitting a stream of blood onto the floor. He had a large gash on his right cheek, and his right eye was beginning to swell shut. He, with no doubt, reflected my own busted face. I got what I needed from the med bay. We need to head into the director's office, Ray's answered. Oh, fan fucking tastic. So if, I mean, if we make it there, what are we doing next? Smith asked, as Brock checked in with the rest of the team that was still topside. We'll collect what we need while you pull fucking security, Luke interjected as I walked back into the clearing with my rifle at the ready. Any more questions? Damn, our attackers look so aged and starved by decades, but still seem to fight and move with ease. What the hell are these guys on? Jason, take point, Brock ordered as we moved down the hall and through an open set of metal doors that led towards a cramped stairwell leading down into a smaller receiving bay. We walked for another fifteen minutes before we arrived at a blast door that was surprisingly open. I pied the corner to see another narrow hallway that was filled with more bodies and papers that were all over the floor. Moving. We cleared the door and were greeted by the sounds of bare feet slapping against the floor to our front. Every muscle in my body tensed as the footfalls grew closer and closer. Finally, after a tense moment of silence, a naked man rounded the corner holding a rusted kitchen knife in one hand and something else in the other. Oh, no. I fired off two rounds. One struck the man in the neck and the second hit him in the jaw, causing him to spin like a top before falling to the floor. I approached the corner and took a peek. Beyond it was a group of them all huddled together and twitching violently as the rest of the team fell in behind me. I signalled that there was a massive group and pulled a flashbanger from a pouch on my kit. The team gave me the acknowledgement. I pulled the pin and tossed it round the corner. There was a bright flash and deafening thud that slammed my chest as the grenade detonated. The group in the hall went into a frenzy and started attacking one another in the chaos. We put them down with ease and pushed past their twitching corpses without a second glance. According to Ray's, we were getting closer to the director's office, but I couldn't tell where exactly we were. Everything looked the same. Ray's suddenly cut right and headed down a larger corridor that had closed office doors lining each side. This way. She stopped in front of a cracked door that had writing on it that said, Traitor, in faded black lettering. Rays reached out and pushed the door open, only to be shoved back into the wall by an unseen force, followed by a low boom. My rifle found itself trained on the doorway as a fat man came strutting out with a double barrel shotgun in hand. The vapors from the black powder trailed up in lazy swirls as he tilted the barrel down at Rays' face. It all happened too fast. One second the fat man was standing there and the next he was slumped against the doorframe, missing the top half of his head. I was suddenly at Ray's side with my rifle hanging by mine. Fuck, that hurts, 
She coughed as I did a blood sweep, only to pull back a dry glove. Ah, the sappy Playden. Most of her magazines took the brunt of the damage. You'll live. It didn't penetrate. I got up and covered our flank while Luke and Brock cleared the rest of the room. Shit. No. No. Ray's fumbled round the pouches and pulled out the small camera that was now busted. Oh, shit. Please, come on. She pulled out a small memory card that was still intact. Yes. Thank you, God. Tex, you just smoke check Gorbachev's brother. Townsend joked, but it fell on deaf ears as Brock and Luke emerged from the room with an armful of folders. Townsend pulled out a large yellow recovery bag from his assault pack and opened it up. There's more in there. Smith, help us. Brock stopped by Ray's and patted her on the shoulder. Can you walk? he asked, eyeing the exposed sappy plate. Yeah, but it hurts like a motherfucker. She responded through laboured breathing. I guess that's karma for talking shit about you team guys, huh? I stifled a chuckle and winced as the sweat on my face made the cuts burn like wildfire. We got it all. Let's move it. Smith called out as I helped raise to her feet. Jason, you look like hell, brother. He grinned as he hefted the recovery bag over his left shoulder. Oh, feel like it too, I mumbled as he followed Luke back down the hall. I checked my watch to see that we'd been down here for a few hours. The sun was no doubt going to rise soon, and we'd be a juicy target for any Taliban assholes who happened to wander over. As we retraced our steps, I couldn't shake the uneasy feeling of being watched. Every so often I'd check our six, only to find nothing, but every now and then I swore there'd be a small sliver of movement in the peripherals of my vision. Alpha. One. Con. The comms picked up a static field transmission as we finally made it back to the cafeteria section. Ni. C.A. Now. The strained voice yelled. I was about to speak when something slammed into my back and knocked the wind out of my lungs as I landed face first onto the floor. Contact. Rear. Townsend called out as he let loose a burst of fire from his rifle. Jax is here. He's down. He pushed past me and continued to fire when the ground shook violently. My vision was washed out in a cloud of grey as the shooting continued. My lungs screamed for oxygen, but I just couldn't get the air back into them no matter how hard I tried. Oh shit, was that a freaking grenade? Someone yanked on the drag strap of my kit and pulled me around the corner and into the cafeteria before letting go. Is he dead? Luke called out as a cacophony of gunfire grew with each passing second. We have to go. Leave him. Fuck that, Smith yelled as another violent explosion shook the ground. Fuck. Who are these guys? To my dismay, I could only see the ugly orange-colored wall inches in front of me as I sucked in the air that was thick with dust and cordite. Oh, am I paralyzed? I let out a wet cough that sent a wave of pain throughout my entire body as I attempted to crane my neck. Hey, where the fuck are you going? Brock bellowed over the raging gunfire. Fuck, those CIA spooks have bolted. I was rolled onto my side and I was greeted by the side of Brock, who was now covered in a thin coat of grey dust particles. I need you back in the fight. He placed my rifle in my arms and sat me up against the wall. Large group of tangos down that hall. We're going to pop smoke, okay? I nodded in agreement and tried to stand. This only sent another wave of pain, followed by a sickening nausea as I slumped back down. Listen, I need you to harden the fuck up and get ready to move. Brock tapped my shoulder and got back in the fight without saying another word. Smith ran to the corner with a limp and let his empty magazine clatter onto the floor as he ripped out another from his kit. Fucker's got PKM, he winced as rounds impacted the wall. Gonna chew our asses up if we don't take it out. Townsend, move, he yelled, popping off a few shots that caused the gunfire to dampen for a moment. Townsend ran past us and down the hall in a dead sprint. Covering, he yelled out a second later. Smith pulled out a smoke grenade and pulled the pin. Moving. 
The smoke grenade made a puff noise, followed by a stream of white smoke as Smith threw it down the hall. Brock looked back down at me and helped me back up to my feet once more. Move it, he ordered. My brain gave the command to move, but my feet struggled to follow the orders. Each step seemed delayed and sluggish as I stumbled down the hall with Brock behind me. Come on, one foot in front of the other. I didn't dare look behind us as we passed Smith and Townsend. The sounds of screaming mixed with that damn classical music echoed out from behind us as the shooting began to dwindle. Oh, every so often there was a pop of a rifle, but that soon stopped. I passed through the door first to be greeted by Race, who was covering the door while Luke typed away on one of the computers at the security station. Jesus, I almost fucking shot you in the face. She changed positions and covered the other side of the door as I wheezed. Ignoring the almost fatal blue-on-blue -blue incident, I spun around and posted up on the door to see a horde of people running after Brock and the rest of the team. Close the fucking door, Smith screamed as he began to lag behind Brock and Townsend. Close it. Brock slid to a stop in front of me and spun around on one knee before firing into the massive crowd that was growing by the second. Townsend squeezed through the door and watched our flank before shooting at something. I didn't take my eyes off the growing horde and continued to fire as Smith made it to Brock. Just as the two men made it through the gap, an alarm sounded and the door began to close at a slow pace. Oh, great. Brock cursed and ripped a fragmentation grenade from its pouch on his kit and prepped it. Frag out! He tossed a small explosive through the gap. Less than a second later, there was a whoomp as the explosion rocked the ground, sending pieces of shrapnel pinging off the metal door as it was sealed shut. Shit! Hell! Townsend cried. From my left, as he was toppled to the ground by two decrepit-looking figures that had emerged from one of the rooms. Get him off! he pleaded as they dragged him back into the room. I shifted my stance as four more of the mummified-looking people came running out from the darkness and towards Smith and Ray's. The two laid into them with a controlled burst, dispatching them without issue. I'm out, Ray's called out as she transitioned to her pistol. Smith, attempting to push forward only to be stopped once more by those freaking things, said, Townsend, hang on. Townsend's screams were soul-crushing, but more of those things kept pouring out from the rooms as we emptied magazine after magazine. Hang in there, kid, Brock yelled again as we fought our way down the hall at a slow pace. I breached into the room with Brock to find Townsend sprawled out on the floor with two of those things tearing at his exposed lower stomach. The coppery smell of blood hit my nose as I shot the one closest to me while Brock shot the other. You're going to be fine. Brock tore into Townsend's black yet. It's just a scratch. He reassured him as Ray's and Smith continued firing from outside. Brock shoved most of Townsend's exposed intestines back in and dressed the wound before securing it in place. The bottom two fingers on Townsend's right hand were torn off, and his left wrist had been broken at an odd angle, rendering it useless. Jason, help me. Brock gestured towards Townsend as I grabbed a hold of his right arm. I hooked my arm under Townsend's and hauled him up to his feet. His face was beginning to turn pale as blood began to seep through the trauma pad on his stomach. I... I don't... His eyes fluttered. Oh, I feel so good. Um, I'm sorry, guys. He slurred the apology as he tried to walk. I kind of... fucked up. He coughed up blood that streamed out over his chin. I'm gonna die. Townsend struggled to walk as we moved back down the hall. Luke had joined the fighting now and was making his way up the stairwell we'd entered from. Don't forget the bag! The yellow bag sat against the wall of the security station all the way across the room. Fuck that. Help us! Smith yelled back as he dropped one of those mummy things and planted a boot in its skull, sending a putrid black fluid flooding onto the floor. Luke let out a curse and ran across the room, dodging the few stragglers that were still alive. Just as he got to the back, something slammed into the massive blast door that we'd shut just moments earlier. The door shuttered violently as he slung the bag over his shoulder. Get your men to prep explosives on the entrance. We need to block it off.
He yelled up at us as the door cracked open. Brock gritted his teeth as we slowly ascended the darkened stairwell. Screams were echoing up from behind us now, and it wouldn't be long before those things were on top of us. Huston, prep explosives for death. We're closing the entrance. He released the PTT button and activated the light mounted to his helmet. Townsend's body suddenly went limp. His dead weight nearly caused us to tumble backward, but luckily I was able to catch my balance and keep him from dragging us down. Townsend, I need you to walk, buddy. Hey. I tried to get a response, but got none. He's gone, Brock spoke, his voice raw and hoarse. There was a sudden rush of cold air as we neared the top of the stairs. My back and arms burned and my legs felt like they were weighed down by lead as we reached the entrance. Smoke from a smoldering fire wafted in our direction as the rest of our team all looked at us in shock. There were pop marks in the door and around the entrance, along with what looked like blast damage from an explosion. We need to clear out and... Luke was cut off by a swift punch from Brock. The blow split the spook's lip up to his nose. Lucky, I helped transport Townsend. The two men didn't say a single word. They just walked over to me and took Townsend's lifeless body from me before laying him down near the wood line. Mower, Gunner, what the hell happened up here? Brock asked the two operators, who looked like they'd been put through hell. A group of Taliban decided to drop by. We dealt with them, Mower answered as Houston began fixing the explosives to the weak points on the structure. Charges are set, boss, Houston spoke up a minute later as he led the command wire away from the charges that he'd positioned around the entrance. I have a one-minute fuse set on standby. I finally let out a long, ragged breath and checked over myself to find no life-threatening wounds. Whatever those things were, they didn't seem to be phased by physical trauma. My gaze drifted over to Townsend's lifeless body. His arms were folded across his chest and his rifle was by his side. Damn, he didn't deserve this. I finally tore my eyes off of Townsend and they found themselves on Race, who was tending to loot. Our ride's almost here. Get ready to move, Smith stated as he walked over to the two. This intel better be fucking worth it. He glared down at Luke, who just shook his head. Who am I kidding? You're all the same. You just get us killed and get the credit for a job well done, am I right? Smith kicked Luke's leg, causing the man to spring to his feet. Fuck off, Luke growled in response as I pulled Smith back by the arm. Let it go. This isn't the time or the place, brother. I tightened my grip on his arm as the rest of the team began to file into the woods. Let's go. Come on. The two spooks trailed behind us without saying a word. They had a lot to answer for, though. And this isn't over yet. Part 3 Afghanistan Time unknown. We pushed through the thicket of trees and made our way back towards the Exfil point in a staggered column as an eerie silence washed back over us. I found myself glancing down at Townsend's body. One minute he'd been bitching about the walk down into that freaking bunker, and now he was gone. How was his family going to handle this news? Would they even hear about it? Would these assholes cover it up and say that he died an honorable death? Or would they just sweep it under the rug? Heads down. Debt in three, two, one. Huston counted down as the explosive charges detonated with a thunderous boom that reverberated through the Afghan countryside. If they don't know that we're here, they do now. One of the operators spoke as pieces of rubble and rock pelted our helmets. A beat later, something came crashing through the underbrush towards us as the low, familiar sounds of our transport helicopter grew louder as it closed in on our location. My heart skipped a beat when a man emerged. He was the asshole that I'd shot in the face after the fistfight. Despite all the odds, he'd survived and had escaped the bunker. He was missing the right arm up to the shoulder and the majority of the left hand as he ran towards us with a mouth curled up in a snarl. 
The bastard was cut down in seconds by the team as another wounded figure appeared next. The helicopter touched down in the clearing behind us, and the wounded figure darted back into the trees. Move, I called out as we were engulfed in dust and debris from the rotor wash. I covered Huston and Gunner as they moved Townsend. Last man, Smith yelled as he tapped my shoulder and moved past me. Just as I turned away, tracer fire ripped through the tree line and barely missed my legs as one of the rounds ricocheted off the ground and into the sky. Another had found the cockpit window and caused the glass to spiderweb in all directions as the pilots yelled into their headsets. The door gunner gritted his teeth and swung his massive gun towards me, returning fire without hesitation. Fifty caliber rounds cut down the small ferns and trees in its path as the gunner laid down the hate. I hefted myself up into the cargo bay and sat in the open door, snapping down my NVGs in the process. The NVGs flickered between a dim and bright glow as I returned fire at a small group of Taliban fighters who'd emerged from the wood line with AKs in hand. Reaper X, Neptune, actual. I needed to fire on my target marked by IR Lasso. Be advised, danger close. Brock spoke to the AC-130 crew as the bird lifted off into the sky. Copy, Neptune Actual. Stand by. The helicopter lurched upward and banked hard to the left as we gained altitude. Rounds away. T.O.T. Ten seconds. One of the crewmen spoke. There's a low bass thump, followed by a swoosh cut over the churning of the rotors. The small patch of land we were in just went up in a dark cloud of dust behind us as a 105mm howitzer round splashed down. A 25mm gun buzzed next and rained hell down into the area, followed by a few shots from the 40mm Beaufort cannons that sounded like distant war drums. Neptune Natural. Outlaw 1-3. Be advised we have multiple heat sticks moving through the sticks down towards the river. A female voice called out over the net. Outlaw. Those are tangos. Smoke em. Copy. The gunship fired a salvo of its Zuna rockets and let off a short burst from its 30mm cannon as more tracer fire lagged lazily behind us. Damn, the whole valley seemed to come alive at that moment. They're not getting back up from... The gunship pilot was cut off as an RPG streaked out from the foliage below us and towards them. RPG! RPG! The gunship pulled hard to the left just missing the projectile by a few inches as they returned the favour with a long burst from their 30mm cannon that demolished the patch of foliage the RPG had been fired from. Neptune Actual, Reaper 6. We are Bingo Fuel and RTB. Good luck. The AC-130 let out another stream of fire from all weapon platforms before heading back towards FOB. I glanced down to see more muzzle flashes and RPG fire coming from all over the valley. My eyes went wide as a tracer round scored a direct hit on the gunship escorting us, causing it to spew a stream of fire followed by black smoke from the turbines as the pilot fought to gain control of the aircraft. Shit, we're hit. I'm losing hydraulic fluid fast. Came the gunship pilot's clipped response as our bird was peppered by another wave of incoming fire. Can you make it back, one three? The second gunship's pilot asked as they tore over the mountainous terrain on our right flank. Everyone inside the crew compartment let out curses and grabbed on to what they could as the helicopter shuttered violently. Ah, it was one thing to be shot at on the ground. We could at least return fire and fight back. But we wouldn't win a fight against gravity. Yep, I think we can. But she ain't gonna hold for much longer. We're gonna have to make an emergency landing at Camp Badstone. 1-3 finally responded with a cough. The shooting stopped, and so did the adrenaline dump. My body hurt with a pain like no other, along with my left leg that had caught pieces of spalling from the bullet that had ricocheted off the ground. <sighs> Easy day. I snapped the NVGs up and let out a long, ragged sigh, leaning my head against the net bench behind me. The next few hours were going to be hell. The sun was rising now, turning the pale grey sky into a bloody orange colour as we finally arrived back at Camp Rattler. After touching down, we moved Townsend's body to the camp's medical facility where we got checked out by the army doctors and nurses before we said our silent prayers and goodbyes to our fallen teammates. Dude, how the fuck are you not paralyzed? 
I cast bluntly as we made our way back towards the compound for the AAR. He held the sappy plate that was in my back panel. A jagged hole was in near the bottom, where the round from the unseen shooter had gone through and lodged itself in my bag, along with chunks from the plate. <sighs> Lucky, I guess, I responded, while gingerly touching my lower back. I had no clue what round had stopped where it had, but according to the doc, it was a miracle that the bullet had missed my spine. Well, yeah, miracle or not, it still didn't explain how the internal trauma surrounding the bullet had been close to nothing other than irritation to the surrounding side itself. It was like, well, it was like the wound had healed itself in a matter of minutes. Carson and our skipper had both been present in the talk the entire time we were on target, and it was evident that they'd only seen what had happened on the outside, though well, Carson's body language led me to believe he knew more as they began the AAR. It wasn't until we were done with the AAR that Ray's produced a helmet-mounted camera along with a small flash drive that she handed over to Luke. Brock, Smith, and Jason, I needed to stay put. The rest of you were dismissed. The rest of the team looked at one another in confusion and anger. They were left in the dark as to what had happened down in that bunker and wanted answers as much as we did. Gentlemen, Carson spoke with a very calm tone as he shut the reinforced door. What you witnessed down there was something you will not speak of under any circumstances. He handed out three sheets of paper to each of us. Please sign your full names at the bottom of each form. I looked over the document and noted that it was some form of NDA that would land us in some serious shit if we signed it. Oh, here we fucking go. Smith shoved the paper back across the table and stood up. I'm not signing shit. He stood in defiance. You can't do this to us. I joined in as Brock's hands balled up into fists at his side. Dry blood still coated the sleeves and neck of his combat shirt. I can and will, Senior Chief. Luke looked over to our skipper and shook his head. I know what you're all going through right now. The skipper rested his arms against the table and looked at each of us as he spoke. I need you. The team needs you. Please... He gestured towards the papers. Sir, can we have the room? Luke spoke as he emerged from the corner of the room with his arms crossed. Our skipper stared down at the man across from him. He wasn't used to being told what to do, especially by some suit from Langley. Carson let out a long sigh followed by a laugh that was void of all humour. <laughs> I'll just be blunt with you since playing nice isn't working anymore, sir. He planted a finger in Askeeper's chest. You men are about to be sent off to prison for treason and the murder of a fellow service member. There was a tense moment of silence, followed by a growl from Askeeper. I'll be back. Keep your mouth shut. That's an order. Without saying another word, he walked out of the room, with Luke following close behind him. The Russians were experimenting with different ways to treat battlefield injuries faster. Race finally spoke, as she took a seat across from her. And the only reason we know this is because the company has been in contact with one of the lead scientists and the director inside that bunker well, since the Soviet invasion. Brock slammed his fists into the table, causing Ray's to jump. So you fucking knew that those things were down there? Brock asked as the veins in his arms bulged. No, we didn't know anything about them. We lost communications with the director as of three days ago. And after trying every possible means of contact, we decided to use an alternative option. Carson butted in. We uncovered a terrible secret, and if anyone else knew what was going on down there, well, the geopolitical fallout would be... He was cut off as the door opened. Luke entered and shut the door behind him. A look of worry and fear was plastered on his boyish face. Sir, he's bringing MPs and the rest of their team back here. Carson let out a curse and looked back over to us. If you sign those NDAs, you can continue to operate freely without any issue. This is just a means of keeping things under wraps. Fear was in the man's eyes, and we were drawn to it like sharks to blood. What about Townsend's family? I asked, tapping on the paper with my index finger. His family all taken care of. They don't have to worry about financial burdens for the rest of their lives, he answered quickly. 
And what about us? Smith asked, gesturing to me and Brock. We sign these papers and you expect us to live with the fact that you got one of our guys killed for some fucking meet and greet? Look, we don't have much time left. Carson was on the verge of hysteria as I tried to make sense of what was going on. Ebola, bubonic plague, SARS, smallpox. They're all nothing compared to what they've engineered down there. Luke joined the conversation. The director that you shot in the head was supposed to give up the location of the other bunkers so we could shut this little experiment down for good. I looked down at the papers and read through them twice. I want in. The room fell silent at my response. I want to shut down every last one. You let me do that and I'll do whatever you want me to do. No, we can't do... Luke began to argue, but was waved off by Carson. Done. You'll be working with Ray's and Luke's team. Just sign the paperwork and I'll handle the rest of the logistics. A look of relief washed over Carson's face as I put pen to paper. Brock and Smith's eyes were burning holes into me, but... I didn't bother looking at them. I couldn't. I'm doing this for Townsend and for the team. I signed the papers and stood up. The door swung open and the skipper, along with the rest of our team and two MPs wearing multi-cam uniforms, entered. Stand down, Carson ordered as the tension in the room began to skyrocket. Everything has been handled accordingly. Our skipper looked over at Brock for confirmation. Brock just simply nodded in response as the MPs awaited further instruction with their hands hovering over their drop-leg holsters. I guess this settles it then, Smith spoke next as he stood up from the table and left the room. I hope you know what the hell you're doing, Jason. Brock stood and walked over to the rest of the team. We're good here, gents. Clear out. He ushered the hellbent operators back outside, telling them what they wanted to hear as the searing light from the sun illuminated the darkened interior of the room. I looked down at the other papers to see Brock's and Smith's names scrawled on them. Well, I'll be dead. Part 4 Afghanistan, Time Unknown I found myself wandering over to a small secluded section of the compound that overlooked the flight line and western section of the camp. This wasn't my first time losing a team member, but it wasn't something you get used to no matter how long you've been in the business. You want to smoke? A familiar voice asked from somewhere behind me. Uh, I'm good, thanks. I twisted around to see the agency woman with a cigarette hanging from her lips, her hair was let down and free-flowing like her current attitude. Understandable, I only smoke if it's been a real shit day. She smirked, lighting the cowboy killer and inhaling deeply before blowing out a plume of tobacco smoke. What happened? I asked, hoping that our agreement was still being honoured. Well, Carson was able to get you leased out to us after a long fight with your command. Needless to say... They're pissed, but it's done. She took another long drag. Luke and the rest of the team are on standby in Paris and waiting for further instruction. Paris? Is that our EO? I lean back against a stack of Connex boxes leaning against the fence. It's starting to look like it. Our people are still putting together a target package. Hmm. What's our timeline here? I asked, getting to the point. I'll read you in once we're wheels up. She leaned on a spool of sea wire and reached into the cargo pocket of her combat pants. And, uh, since no one else is around to christen your arrival. Ray's held out a small black rectangular patch housing a dark red skull being pierced through the top by a dagger. Welcome to the team, Jason. I traced over the patch as Ray's shifted position. I'm going to tell you this now, so you don't have to experience it all on your own. She took another long drag from her cigarette while looking me in the eyes. What you will experience while working with us will keep you up at night. It'll drive you to the brink of insanity, and it will destroy everything you hold dear if you let it. What you experienced down in that bunker was just the tip of the iceberg. 
Her tone was serious despite her relaxed demeanor. Don't let it break you. A look of pity or maybe even longing flickered behind the woman's blue eyes as she stubbed out the cigarette, the hard-ass, cold-blooded CIA spook returning now. Well, make a phone call, say your goodbyes, do what you have to do. We leave in town. Ray's left without saying another word as two Black Hawk helicopters carrying members of our sister squadron tore over the horizon. Our time here on this ancient, blood-soaked stretch of land was coming to an end, and they'd be picking up where we left off for the next couple of months. France. Time unknown. We were greeted by an unmarked SUV that sat idling. A man with full sleeve tattoos wearing a Slayer t-shirt stepped out of the vehicle and waved us over as we stepped off our flight and crossed the tarmac. Who's your new boyfriend, Reyes? The man called out as he got back in the driver's seat. Ah, fuck you, Keith, was Reyes' only response to the tasteless dig as we climbed in and situated ourselves. Since you've been busy in the raw pile, I'll fill you in. He spoke as he drove us towards another group of hangars off to the south. Carson has accelerated the tie line to tonight. He turned the radio up as an RHCP song began to play. Oh man, I love this song. Uh, get back on task, Ray's growled over the intro of Snow. Uh, as I was saying, Keith mocked Ray's with a gruff voice. We have six GIGN operators that will be joining us on this little snatching ground. He turned down the radio as you passed a group of people in flight suits who were assessing a helicopter. Uh, the higher gun and I will be on Assault Team 1 with Peter and you. Keith stopped for a brief moment as he looked in the rearview mirror. Hmm, you look familiar. You a team guy? Yeah, something like that. You? I asked in response, trying to remember who exactly this guy was, but came up empty as we hit a rough patch on the tarmac. Yeah, I did a stint in Team 4 before joining the company. A grin spread across Keith's face as we stopped in front of an open hangar to our right. Inside sat a line of parked vehicles along with a large group of people in civilian clothing who were huddled in the middle of the barren hangar. Oh, uh, sorry for the hollow. Hit some traffic and picked up a stranger on the way back. Keith jabbed a thumb at me as we walked over to the large group. No worries, we're just getting started. Luke's voice echoed around the room as he walked out from the group and gestured towards a large whiteboard situated near the wall. Our target has been hiding out at this apartment complex. Luke referenced a photo of an old Middle Eastern man with a cloudy right eye and a local map that detailed the surrounding area. The target building was a massive apartment complex outside of the major city hub and from what I was seeing, there were multiple means of egress from the blueprints that were provided. Peter, if you will. Luke stepped to the side as a shorter man with short, cropped black hair and a clean-shaven face walked over to the table. Our HVI, known as Tulman, was seen frequently entering and leaving room 105 on the fourth level here. He pointed towards a photograph of the complex's exterior. This place is full of gangbangers. Most of them are armed with a variety of weaponry, ranging from rifles to handguns, so expect anything. Now, gentlemen and woman. He glanced over at Ray's, who just rolled her eyes. There's a heavy civilian presence here, so watch your fire and make sure you PID your targets. Keith pulled a hat over his head, causing his shaggy blonde hair to poke out from the sides, making him look like a typical surfer bro from Cali. The weapons we are going to be using are linked to a weapons bust, so glove up. Peter turned towards me as he tapped the table. Assault Team 1 will take point through this side entrance here. Expect limited contact until we reach the fourth floor. Teams 2, 3, and 4 will breach from here and here, before setting up the inner and outer cordons. He continued with the assault plan as I took in the details from the floor plans and surveillance photos of our targets. Now... The police response time for this area is 5 to 10 minutes, but the cell jammers will give us some extra time. Any questions? Peter asked, gauging the silent room. Alright then. Let's do this. 
for us, or one hundred hours local time. My hands ran over my kit in one final check as the rest of the plain clothed operators in the cramped sedan went about their pre-game rituals. It was time to get some answers. Team 4 is in position. Team 4's leader buzzed in my earpiece as Keith chambered around in his M4 in the front passenger seat. Copy 4. One is about to reach Ryan. Stand by. Carson's voice responded as Peter steered the sedan into a parking spot across from the target building. One is in position. All teams stand by. Peter released the PTT button bound to his kit and looked around at all of us. His balaclava sat on top of his head making him look like a fisherman. It's time. Keith pulled down his mask before adjusting the sling of his rifle and giving Peter a nod. <sighs> time to get evil. Ray's pulled the skull balaclava down over her face, and I did the same. All teams go. I exited the car and followed in behind Peter with my rifle at the ready, as he led the way towards the side entrance. Loud club music thumped from inside like a dull pulse, as the civilians lounging around outside watched us in awe. Somewhere off in the distance, a dog barked wildly, as a couple argued loudly outside of our view from the darkened archway to our left. Move! Keith ordered from behind me, as he shoved a man smoking a cigarette who tried to stop him. One has made entry. Peter led the way up a cramped spiral staircase to our front, as our radios came alive with traffic. Inside. Inside. He waved off a group of kids playing with a soccer ball as we made it to the third deck. The kids finally scattered when threatened, one while covering an open door to our right. Here! Peter called out from the next flight as he dipped through a set of double doors. I acknowledged the call out and cleared the threshold with my rifle at the high ready to see Peter moving a woman and her two children back into their room as a man down on the hall sitting in a chair spun towards us with a sawed-off shotgun in hand. Time seemed to speed up as a door to my left opened inward. A man holding a pistol in one hand and a phone in the other filled my vision. Drop it. I ordered, in clipped French, snapping towards him with my rifle raised as he began to lift the weapon, a look of anger spreading across his face. I flipped the safety off and fired off a short controlled burst into his chest, dropping him in the doorway as a woman ran out of the room next door, almost getting shot in the process. I peeled away from the door, scanning for more targets, only to see the dead man with a shotgun at the end of the hall as I caught back up to Peter as he cut left down another wide corridor filled with more scrambling civilians. It's in the middle door on the right, he called out over the screams and familiar reports of M4s, followed by smaller caliber weapons. Check. Watch your fire. We need him alive, I reminded the Frenchman as he pushed past a row of open windows next to us. All teams be advised. You have more vehicles arriving outside, counting twelve armed tangos. Carson's voice was calm despite the unfolding chaos inside the complex. Two men appeared at the end of the hall with assault weapons in hand as Peter keyed his PTT button. Oh, shit. I laid down suppressing fire in an attempt to cover our advancement as Peter ducked into an open room to our left. Jason, in here. My M4 ran empty as I fell through the open doorway and onto the hardwood floor. Out! Out! Get out! A woman wailed from somewhere inside the room as I scrambled up to my feet. Shut up and get down, Peter yelled back at the woman as the wooden door frame and pieces of wall exploded into splinters and dust particles as the man from down the hall returned fire. Wraith, Keith, two shooters at the end of the hall. We're pinned in room 102 on the left-hand side. I released the PTT button and thumbed the mag release, letting the empty magazine fall to the ground. Copy. Hang on, Keith responded over the roaring gunfight as I slammed in a fresh magazine. Jason, move. We have them pinned. I slapped the bolt release and slowed my breathing as I pushed back out into the hall with my rifle raised. I took aim and fired at one of the shooters at the end of the hall. It would expose the upper half of his body. My rounds all hit their target and he fell into a heap on the floor, dead, next to his buddy, who was clutching onto his stomach and groin while crying out in pain. Okay, on to the next. 
A fat shirtless man with a scrappy beard exited from room 105, holding a handgun as I reached the door. He didn't match the target photo in my elastic wrist case. Pulled the trigger twice, and two rounds from my M4 connected with his neck and jaw as I pushed past his now lifeless body. The doorway opened into a smaller hallway with two doors that sat staggered across from one another before opening into a larger living room at the end. One door on the right side of the hall opened and a woman holding a baby appeared as I cleared the main entrance with the rest of the team following close behind. Okay, not an active target. Move to the next. I pushed past her as Peter took control of that room. As I passed the second door, a dull boom sounded from inside as a large chunk of the door exploded outward, sending wooden splinters into my arms and face as something hard slammed into my chest. Keith returned fire through the walls. I fell into the living room. Keith, watch your fire. Tolmon might be in there. I sputtered as waves of pain shot through my chest. Just as I finished speaking, another door opened from a kitchen area across from me. A tall, thin man with a cloudy right eye matching the target photo emerged, holding a pistol in his right hand and a small black device in the other. My heart sunk as the realization set in. That's a fucking s vest. He's rigged to blow. I cleared the distance in a matter of seconds, ignoring the pain in my chest as the pistol in his hand barked. The concussive blast rattled my skull as flames licked the corners of my vision. It felt like someone had hit me in the side of the neck with a sledgehammer covered in razor blades as we both crashed through the door he exited from. Oh, this is it. I expected to go up in a bloody explosion, but to my surprise, it didn't happen. The man shot up to his feet and attempted to grab for the device again, but I grabbled him in a front headlock and performed a gator roll. We got some distance between the device as I swung down with a closed fist that connected with the man's nose. Blood and mucus spewed down his face and onto his shirt as I landed another blow that hit with a sickening wet crunch. Tolman looked back up at me with eyes wide full of terror as he thrashed around frantically. The rhythmic sound of my heartbeat filled my ears as the blood rushed to my head. Blood splattered onto his face as I pushed the detonator further away with my boot. With a curse and one final swing, Tormund's head snapped to the side. His body finally went limp as the searing pain in my neck became unbearable. My hand shot to my neck, sticky warm blood pulsed against my gloved hand as I attempted to slow the bleeding but wasn't doing much as I fought to stay upright. Shit, Jason is hit, Ray's called out as she entered the room. This is it. I'm dying. She pulled me off of Tolmon and secured his hands behind his back with a pair of flex cuffs before tearing into my blowout kit. Hang in there. She pulled my hand away from my neck and pressed a wad of combat gauze and blood clotting agent against the wound. Keith, get in here. Ray's looked down and tapped my face with her free hand. Jason, you need to press this down for me, okay? I tried to speak, but a terrible wet gurgling sound came out as blood filled my mouth and throat. Keith! She shouted again, only to be answered by more gunfire in response. Shit, I'm sorry. She reached over and hooked her arm under Tolman's in an attempt to drag him out of the room. All teams, jackpot. I say again, jackpot. Get ready to move. The room began to spin as Keith appeared at my side. Oh, hang in there, bro. I'm going to get you out of here. He hooked an arm around my chest and struggled to pull me to my feet. The burning subsided, but the spinning did not. It was like being plastered drunk, but tenfold as I struggled to walk into the living room. We're moving, Peter called out as he pushed out into the hall with Rays and the handcuffed man. The world went black and I awoke in the back seat of the sedan as Rays drove like a bat out of hell. We're coming up to the gate now. Have medical on standby. The sedan screeched to a halt and the back door was ripped open. A pair of hands grabbed a hold of my arms and pulled me out of the back seat and onto a gurney, pulling up my balaclava in the process. Another hand tore the bandage off of my neck, and all movement stopped. 
Well, I thought you said he was critical, the masked surgeon standing above me asked, as he prodded at my neck with his gloved hands. He... Uh, <laughs> Ray stammered as she put a hand on my neck. He was. I coughed and spat out a stream of blood as the group spread out. Oh, where's Tormon? My voice wasn't my own. It was raw and ragged. Jesus, how are you? Peter was taken aback by the sight as I fought to get to my feet. Where is he? I asked again, rolling off the gurney and taking a step with a foot that didn't want to comply. I, uh, I need to talk to him. And the world went black once more. CIA black site, 0900 hours local time. The smell of diesel combined with the salty coastal breeze from the ocean, causing my skin to burn and my mouth to dry as we entered the concealed housing area for the high-profile detainees that still had valuable intel to dish out. All around us the sounds of death metal, classical music, nursery rhymes and other musical pieces washed over the screams that were coming from the other buildings within the compound. If hell existed on Earth, this place was one step in the right direction. How are you feeling? Keith asked in a barely audible whisper as we approached a reinforced door being flanked by two armed guards dressed in civilian clothing holding SOPMOD M4s across their chests. I ignored the question and flashed my security badge. Raised gave them a simple nod and they opened the door before stepping off to the side as we entered the small holding room housing a single metal table and a few chairs along with one occupant. Sitting in the metal chair across from us was Tulmon. His face was gaunt and expressionless as he looked up at me with his one remaining eye. He suddenly muttered something in Farsi, before falling silent as I sat across from him. Talk. Tulman's eyes met mine as he looked for anything to use, but after a minute of silence, he just chuckled. <laughs> it worked, he finally spoke. What worked? I asked, scratching at the fading scar tissue that formed where the bullet had penetrated my neck. What those crazy Russians have been trying to perfect over the last few decades, he answered as I tried to keep calm. Afghanistan. There was a bunker. The old man's eyes narrowed. Yeah, we went down there and found the aftermath of that little experiment. Whatever they tried to perfect, failed. Tulmon shook his head in disagreement as I shifted in my seat. No, no, no. You are mistaken, American. Oh, they succeeded. The corners of his lips began to curl into a smile. And, uh, how is that? I asked, intrigued by the old man's confidence. By the fact that you're sitting across from me. I jumped up to my feet, causing the metal chair to slam into the ground, and the rest of the team to jump as I rounded the table. <sighs> Where are the other bunkers? Who's in charge of the operation? I asked next, grabbing Tulmon by the collar of his yellow prison jumpsuit. South America, Africa, and Russia, of course. Tulmon punctuated each word as he spoke. <sighs> Who is behind all of this? I asked again, giving him a hard shake. <laughs> You're talking to him. The truth is in the bottle and the blood. In vino et sanguis veritas. In wine and in blood there is truth. The intoxicated mind expresses truth more clearly and occasionally more loudly than does the sober. And blood will always tell. I didn't like to admit it, even to myself, but I had a drinking problem. Of late, I didn't drink because I wanted to, or because I enjoyed the fine wines and booze, which I did. I drank to fend off the shakes, the misery my life had become. But most of all, I drank out of weakness. 
couldn't bring myself to do what I needed to do to handle my problems, so I hid in the mind-numbing bliss of the alcoholic. <gasps> I wasn't supposed to admit that. Well, who am I kidding? My name's Vincent, and I come from a long, illustrious line of cliché Italian gangsters. My wife hated it when I said it that way, so naturally I did my best to annoy her. I was a child of one of Dad's secondary wives, but it ensured that I had it good. All the best for Papa Nick's kids, even we bastardos. Yep, live in the dream. Well, among my current problems was that my favourite purveyor of fine wines and distilled beverages had shut down because someone had decided to widen a freeway and his store, while not in the way of the direct path. It had to close because the exit had been closed and construction delayed until he was squeezed out of business. <sighs> Talk about Bastaros. Yeah, stupid highway department. Took away my favourite oasis. I drove around and looked blearily for a store that would have what I wanted. No, what I craved, what I needed. I maintained enough alcohol in my system that my once quick mind had turned to sludge, slow moving and dreary. It took a moment, but I recognised the area of town where I was currently putting the other drivers and myriad pedestrians at risk. <sighs> Doesn't matter, I'm on an important mission, I reassured myself, and then let out a boozy, wet laugh. <sighs> Pathetic. If my mind had still worked properly, I'd have been sickened with myself. Hey, what's that place? I'd never noticed it. Pliny's delight. Spirits and fine wine. Well, I might have been a booze hound, but I like my spirits fine, and at that moment, I could still afford them that way. The employee who greeted me was a lady of indeterminate age, who sported long, henna-dyed locks that cascaded about her shoulders in a very attractive fashion. I was instantly smitten by her gracious manner and winsome smile. Welcome, traveller. How may we help you today? Um, good evening, I'm... Uh... Looking for a particular Italian red, actually a Sicilian vintage. I explained what I wanted, and the lady nodded along in understanding. Sir, I apologize, but we're currently out of that brand. However, we have an older vintage that inspires the flavors you seek. It's a nice match, and is aged, well, more significantly than is typical. But it is uh, slightly more expensive. It took me a moment to cipher through what she'd said. At first I got a little mad. Shit, she's trying to gouge me, I thought. Yet her sincere smile and, well, the fact that she was exquisitely beautiful with a hint of the exotic, combined with my wife's recent coldness, which was one of my many problems, well, I decided to cut her a break. Okay, I'm up for something special. It's the weekend after all, well, after tomorrow. It's only Thursday, right? I gave a wheezy little laugh to cover the fact that I truly wasn't sure what day it was. She was game, and that smile, that lovely enticing smile, widened and became even more radiant. It is only Thursday after all. Oh, if you'll come this way. She indicated the counter area with her left hand. Her hand was open, inviting, tempting. I went. She took a key from a little pouch at her waist. She wore a lovely skirt that covered way too much, but revealed a nice peek at her shapely calves. Okay, best check that. She may not be interested. Don't need any scandals. Well, any more scandals. I was on thin ice with my business partners. My family with a capital F. There was a cabinet that stretched floor to ceiling behind the counter, and the glass doors included gold lettering that proclaimed... Special reserve. The bottom third was enclosed with rich wood, and the doors to it were carved with symbols of naked women, trees, and men with goat legs. Satyrs, yeah, maybe fawns, maybe Pan himself. They played some pipes, and the naked women held forth a cup to the figure in the centre, a human-looking male, seated on a throne made of grapevines. I'd been staring at the carving for a moment. Bacchus! The lady said, as though she'd already said it once. Well, maybe she had. I've been pretty zoned out there for a moment. The Roman version of Dionysus, according to some. To others, he's a separate, italic deity. He's the one seated in the middle. 
I nodded blankly and she let loose that radiant smile once more, then crouched and stuck the key into Bacchus's groin, just below where his toga hovered above his, well, you know, gods have all the buona fortuna. And she was in the way, so when the cabinet doors opened and she reached in for a moment, I didn't really see what she did. I was busy watching her crouch. Oh, she had such enticing curves. Then, the next thing I knew, she was once more standing and proffering a very old-looking bottle of wine to me. She held it out carefully, and in a way that invited me to take hold of it if I wanted to. Well, if I wanted to preview the bottle as it rested in her hands. I didn't really need to look at it. I wanted it. If she offered it, it had to be the best. I somehow knew this in my heart. I nodded and took out my platinum card, and I was soon the proud owner of a bottle of very old wine that came with a nice velvet sack to keep the fragile container safe. I had another sack, one of paper that concealed a more recently distilled brandy. As I walked out, I noticed it was nearly dark. How long was I in that place? I wondered. Crap. I'd have to listen to Francesca gripe and chew my ass. Oh well, at least I could get juiced and tune out that whine she got in her voice when she was mad. I didn't wait on the brandy. I had a nice glass that fit perfectly inside my metal coffee cup. I could drink what I wanted, and any nosy citizen or stupid cop that looked would just see me sipping cafe. Sure enough, I barely hit the driveway and pulled in around back, when there she was, harping away before I even exited the car. Where have you been? We've been worried about you. We had dinner an hour ago. I was about to start calling hospitals and police stations. On and on. I almost told her that I didn't need her wine. I had a very special reserve bottle of my own. But I didn't. I refused to confront her any more than I'd confront my personal demons. And on she continued. Oh, Chiara needs some help with tuition again. Dante needs new books and a new computer. Oh, you promised you'd take care of them. They really are trying hard to do well in school. Oh, God, is she still going on? I winced internally as I shuffled toward the side door to our far too lavish home. A home that I owned, but which was now filled with luxuries we could barely afford. At least on what I made for a living these days. I clutched the soft velvet of the wine bottle sleeve in the crook of my arm and slouched my way into the house and straight to my little office. Francesca chattered away like an angry squirrel close on my heels the entire time until I closed the door on her and locked it. She stood quietly for a moment, then raised her voice and started accusing me of neglect and even abuse. How dare I ignore her? How dare I shut a door in her face? Then she started in with the crocodile tears. God, had that ever worked? Well, yeah, in our early days. She could push my guilt buttons because I loved her and wanted her to be happy, but all of that had been washed away in emotional frigidity and liquid fire. I heard her stump away as I dug out my nice corkscrew and opened the bottle of my new favourite drink. I took only a shot glass full of the wine. It had been very expensive, but well worth it. Still, I wanted to conserve the beverage and enjoy it over time. I was already fixed from the brandy, so the wine was purely a connoisseur's delight. Even mildly inebriated, I enjoyed the smooth and many-layered textures of the ancient vintner's art. By the time I decided to stumble to bed, I was surprised by my son in the hallway. He'd been clearly waiting close by to ambush me. Dad, I can't believe you closed the door on Mum like that. You know I've been waiting like all afternoon to speak to you. That's what his mouth appeared to be saying, speaking in his snivelling tone and peppering each sentence with the word like, and ending with an upward whining inflection, as though every statement was a question because he was too spineless to make a statement unless he knew that the other party would just ignore him, as I normally did. What I actually heard, though, in my mind was, I don't know why I bother speaking with you. I wish you'd just send a deposit to my account and then go pass out. I effing hate you. It was a surreal experience, as though he was a foreign language movie with a dub voice. Well, I, like, ain't none too fond of, like, you either, boy. Why don't you, like, grow up and, like, get a job, you sniveling little loser? 
The words were out of me before I could stop myself. But, well, they felt pretty good and were certainly well deserved and long overdue. The little idiot had no idea what I did for the family every day, and of what I'd done in the past. His biggest responsibility in life so far was to pick out a video game for his moronic friends when they got together online. No one would put up with a little turd in person. Oh, I said more. I lit into him until he was sitting on the floor, head buried between his knees and covered with his folded arms, crying. And then I went upstairs. I was no longer groggy. In fact, my mind had become preternaturally sharp. Not in the way that an inebriated person believes himself to be, but with senses humming and my mind focused, my feet sure on the stair steps. Oh, great. The boy's outburst, or more likely my response, had awakened the harpy. Francesca met me outside of what had been our room for so many years. I had all but moved into the guest room in recent months. There it was again. Her mouth was moving, saying things, predictable things. But what I heard was, You attacked our poor boy. He's so sad. All the prescriptions he needs, but no sympathy from you, you monster. I truly hate you. We all do. I want a divorce, but we're stuck until the kids get through college and move out on their own. Well, at least I can keep screwing Gary and get the satisfaction of cheating on you with a whim. What? You're screwing Gary. You cheat and the best you can do is our piece of shit accountant. He's a total pencil neck geek. You truly are a whining and worthless skank. You want a divorce? Why well, wait? I'll file tomorrow morning on my way to work. In the meantime, you and your poor boy can pack. Well, she stood there, gaping like a freshly caught fish. This time her mouth moved, but she didn't speak at all. She couldn't speak. <sighs> What's the matter, whore? Gary Katz got your tongue. I stalked past her and toward my room. It was mine, for real. I wasn't going to leave. I owned the place, and she'd signed a prenup. If anybody left, it'd be her and those worthless brats she'd whelped and spoiled. The next morning I awakened, well-rested and in a bright frame of mind. I realized that I clutched the bottle of very fine wine in my arms and I placed a shot glass on the nightstand. Normally I'd be trembling and craving a drink. Yet, this morning I didn't. Well, I wanted a drink, but I didn't need one. Got ready for work. Friday at last. I felt a little hungry, but I really didn't want to have to speak with my family. I certainly didn't want to listen to any of them, so I filled the tiny glass and sipped at the amazing vintage until it was bone dry. I eased out the back door and managed to escape the driveway before anyone noticed. Dante would be too embarrassed to even look at me for a while, and Francesca, well, that slut would be too scared. She'd admitted her infidelity, hadn't she? Well, she certainly hadn't denied it. I stopped for a light breakfast at a little neighborhood diner I liked. The lady behind the counter, Margaret, Greeted me as she once did more regularly, but well, I hadn't been eating much lately. I've been on a liquid diet. Hey, Vincent. Good morning. I haven't seen you in a while. Doing okay? Well, that's what her mouth said. But what I heard was... Wow. Looks like you actually took a shower. I haven't seen you this clean and well-dressed in a while. And, whew, miracle, no booze breath. Good for you, Vincent. He was always a nice customer before. I paused in the process of taking my seat, and this was weird. Last night I could excuse the illusion as part of my intoxication. Yet here it was daylight, me completely, well, as close as I'd been in a long while to being sober, but it was happening, I was hearing the words she wanted to say rather than what she actually said. It was such a disorienting juxtaposition. I didn't know what to say, so I just smiled and took a seat on one of the stools at the counter. I ended up leaving her a nice tip for her kind thoughts. After breakfast, I called in and let the secretary know I'd be late since I needed to drop by and visit my attorney. The response I heard was, Yeah, sure. I bet you need your rest, Lush. Don't worry, though. Everyone else will take up your slack. Now I'll have to listen to your bitch half-sister rant about how worthless drunk of a brother. Oh, 
Thanks, asshole. I wondered while I was eating whether my perception would still be different than what people actually said to me when I used the phone. No way Anna would have spoken to me that way. No matter what an ass I was, she was invariably polite, her features consistently inscrutable. Something weird was happening. With my newfound clarity, I knew that it had something to do with the wine. And I'd have to go by Pliny's delight again and speak with that hostess about just what was included in this elder vintage. Ah, oh, great. Like I have time for your bullshit this morning. Why can't you greasy gangster wannabes understand that you need to make an appointment? That's what I heard instead of the falsely polite greeting that Joel intended to send. I smiled and just decided to use the gift for a while. Oh, hey, I'm... Sorry I didn't make an appointment. I know you're getting early to do prep work and took advantage of that knowledge. It's just that I'm... Well, we're ready to divorce and I'll need your help on this one. She crossed the Rubicon. She was unfaithful. Clear violation of the prenup. He stared at me a little blankly, processing the information. He was a dick, but an excellent attorney. Never mind what he said... This is what I heard. Yeah, well, who could blame her? She has a great counterclaim, with you being a booze hound and all. She even have any proof of the infidelity? Well, she's a nice-looking woman. I'd certainly do her. Well, might as well dive off into the Q&A. Apparently I could hear mental clutter as well as conscious thoughts for as long as the person spoke. Well, I spent the next half hour answering his questions and figuring out what I'd need to do to get the ball rolling before she could prepare. It was hard to separate at first, but the more we talked shop, the more his words coincided with the movement of his mouth. I didn't know for certain whether his mind and words had synced, or my perception had clouded. Well, maybe the effects of the wine had worn off. We wrapped up and I left the office, afraid I'd already lost track of my newfound abilities. If not, this power would be great if we had to go to court. When I got back to my car, a parking well, enforcement officer was printing a citation on her little ticket writing device. I couldn't have been more than a minute over the time. Oh, excuse me, ma'am. That's my car. I'm here and ready to go. She turned around with a nasty little bureaucratic smirk. Yeah, well, too late, dickhead. I've already printed, so you can take it up with the municipal judge. Go ahead, argue with me. Come on, sucker. After I embarrass and humiliate you, I'll get on the radio and call Officer Turner over to sling your ass in jail. As best I could tell, she'd said pretty much the same thing, but more politely and without the immediate threat to call in an actual officer. I thanked her, explained how I truly appreciated her service and hard work, and that it only meant to save her some time. She looked astonished that her little snarky trap had been sprung but left empty. I took the stupid citation and got underway. Now well, the true test would be my legitimate business partner, Linda, my half-sister by yet another secondary wife. She'd been mad-mouthing me for a while, granted with good cause of late, but it had started long before my drinking had gotten out of hand. Come to think of it, except for the special reserve wine, I hadn't consumed any alcohol since the brandy last night. Yet I was feeling fine, still alert, still sharp, not even a slight tremor. I greeted Anna as I breezed by to head to my office. Good morning, Anna. Thank you for holding the fort. Anything pressing? I knew there wouldn't be, but I wanted to hear what she'd really say. She looked at me with a little surprise. Good morning, sir. Nothing waiting for you. But a fight with your little sister. She's going to kick your ass. I waved and nodded and continued on my way, and sure enough, when I entered my office, there was Linda, crouched over the keyboard at my desk. She was already scowling and spared me a look of utter contempt as I closed the door behind me. Oh, I couldn't wait to hear what was really on her mind. It's about time you got here, you worthless sack. What's the matter? Tie one on last night? Like every other night? 
I'm tired of complaining to Daddy. You need to go. Your crap's sinking the ship. I took one of my guest chairs. They were in many ways more comfortable than my office chair anyway. I had to stop by to see my lawyer. Not your concern, but I'm divorcing Francesca, so I may have to work on that some over the next few months. I know you snivel to Daddy regularly. You've been doing it since the start, placing the blame for every failure, yours and mine, at my doorstep. Well, that's just who you are. I held up my hand to forestall her verbal repost. Thing is, neither of us would have had anything if our father hadn't given us this little business. It's easy enough work, and we don't even own it. Just manage it for his corporation. When I'd held up my hand to actually finish saying what I wanted, the gesture had made her angry. How dare I speak up on my own behalf? Okay, what I heard. Of course I tell father. I'm in it to win it. You've always just gone through the motions. Don't be too sure that I won't own it all soon. Daddy's getting old and is ready to start dividing up his empire. Then you'll be out on your ass. You and your whole wife and those deadbeat brats of yours, if they are yours. Oh, if only you knew that she's screwing our outside accountant. <laughs> I caught on months ago. Well, I must admit that I was shocked that she knew about Francesca and Gary and hadn't said anything. I was even more shocked that Papa Nick was about to cut me loose. I didn't think it was that bad. Yet I played it safe and went through the motions of apologizing and catering to her. The loser bit to which she had become accustomed. Oh, if only she knew. When lunchtime rolled around, I called Papa Nick and asked for a meeting. I would have had to speak to him about Francesca anyway. He was old school to a ridiculous degree. Some things he'd let slide, but he frowned on divorce. Yes, I was sure that this was one instance where he'd side with me. It was one thing for a crime boss and his associates to have secondary wives, but in the double standards of his world, wives just couldn't have affairs. That was a deadly sin to him. He was, surprisingly, available. After I parked my car outside of his office building, I stopped and drank a lunch of Veritz and whatever that label on the bottle said. Well, the label was old and distorted. I couldn't take any chances. I really needed to know the truth of whatever my father was going to say. His secretary greeted me calmly and sent me straight in to see the big kahuna. He didn't rise nor offer to shake my hand. His favourite goon Frank loomed in the corner and nodded as I took my seat. Frank was unlikely to speak or participate. He was essentially a piece of lethal furniture, there just in case. Well, the old Vino was working well. So, how do you want to waste my time today? Come to snivel about your slut wife. I may not be able to let it slide, but I can't really blame her. You dickless little turd. Outmanned by an accountant. Maybe we should do a DNA test to see if you're really my son. Who am I kidding? With that nose and those eyebrows? Gotta be mine. Besides, his mother would never have screwed around on me. I think I surprised him when I smiled. All I'd seen his mouth say was, I'm busy, so I'll make this fast. I'm sure he expected me to assume a groveling pose. Yeah, well, I'm sure Linda's already told you. Francesca's having an affair with the outside accountant. Well, I hope you'll hold off on any direct action until we reach an agreement. I'm still putting together proof. Oh, I will definitely get a DNA test on Dante. That dickless little Turk can't possibly be mine. Chiara, though, poor girl, with that nose and the need to constantly pluck her brows, gotta be mine. He blanched a bit. I thought he might have a stroke on the spot. Well, at least I wished. Look, I don't want any favors. I know I've let things slide for far too long. I crawled inside the bottle to get away from my problems. It's not where I belong, and I will fix it. I will get back on top of the office. I just wanted to be respectful and let you know what had happened and what I was doing. I waited. His intended outward response was conciliatory. A bad sign, especially when I heard his actual plans. I really loved your mother, and I had high hopes for you, son, but it's too little too late, and 
You've broken too many promises to get yourself straight. I have legitimate sons and daughters, and Linda's doing a great job. You're just a drain on our bottom line. We'll take care of Francesca and Gary, but the grandkids may as well get everything. You just flush it down the Tiber. Oh, scratch that. The Whiskey River. Best be careful when you leave the building. Never know who might follow and what they might do. Well, it was my turn to blanch. Et tu pater. I knew he was not a patient man, but I'd never imagined that he'd become so angry, so disgusted with me. He'd been disappointed when I hadn't taken on the criminal side of his operations full time. He wanted his legitimate heirs to stay legitimate. But bastardos like me could get involved with any nasty activities that would take care of his needs and allow his real kids to keep their hands clean and consciences clear. Well, I'd always tried to please Papa, but that short time among the wolves, like Romulus and Remus, had led to my drinking. I'd apparently become so worthless in his eyes, such a disappointment that he could casually discard my meaningless life. He rose and opened his arms for an embrace. You're an embarrassment. I'm old and dying, but I have pride and I will not have a drunk as any part of my legacy. I embraced him, and we bust cheeks in the old style. I knew it was a send-off. He truly was the last of the old-time stereotypical mobsters. As I left, I saw Frank Jr. in the lobby. He was definitely a source of pride for his father. He looked just like him. Same last name, same bulky goon frame. He smiled at me without humour and flipped up his chin in silent greeting as I passed. I turned around as I walked through the elevator doors and flicked my fingers under my chin and toward him to gesture. Fongul. He looked mildly surprised as the doors closed on his intimidating frame. I looked around to ensure that no other goons were already on my tail. Then I realised that Papa Nick might not have meant it. It may just have been something that crossed his mind. No, no, he was a hard case. He meant it. He just didn't have anything prepared, nothing more than a threat, and that was still only in his mind, or so he believed. He would set up something soon. It was definitely on his mind to kill his bastardo Vinny. It's probably where Frank Jr. was headed, to the big meeting. Well, I needed to get out ahead of the problem. First, I needed to visit that liquor store. I parked in the side lot of Pliny's Delight and walked through the very modern-looking entrance. Hmm, I didn't remember it looking like that. Yesterday it possessed a classic, charming look. The lighting was now much brighter and the place looked sterile and cold, not like the warm little shop I'd visited fewer than 24 hours previous. Hmm, guess I had been pretty lit. An older man sat behind the counter. He wore a neutral expression, perhaps a little bored. Excuse me, uh, I was in here yesterday and spoke with a nice lady. Is she here today? I just need to ask about a very fine product she sold me. Well, I didn't care about his response. I listened for what he really said. But all I got was what he intended to come out of his mouth. And I learned to tell the difference. Sir, we currently have no female employees. Perhaps you're in a different store or mistaken about whom you met. I must have assumed a stupid expression as I stood back, confused, and looked around the store again. The cabinet. It was there, just as I recalled it, only now it didn't reach the ceiling, and on top was a very old photo. It was black and white, well, yellowish with age and era of photography, but there was no doubt. It was her. There, I said, and pointed at the ancient photo. That's her in the picture. Was that one of those old-timey photo setups? He briefly glanced over his shoulder and looked at me sourly. Sir, I think you're definitely mistaken. That's the owner's great-great-grandmother. Now, the owner's elderly, so I'm sure the lady in the photo, the very authentic photo, is long deceased. Now, would you like to make a purchase or look at any of our products? I stood there, nonplussed, and trying to think. Something was definitely off about this place, about this man, and about what had happened just yesterday. So, um, she sold me something from that old cabinet behind the counter. A great but very old vintage. 
But before I could go any further, he raised his hand and interrupted. Sir, there's nothing in that cabinet. It's an antique, purely for show. We don't even have a key for it anymore. Now, if you like older wines, we have a few in our top shelf selection. I could tell that he was impatient and really wanted me to buy something or leave. I didn't need the vino for that message to get through. I thanked him, maybe apologized, some mumbled, inane response. Perhaps the vino had worn off or no longer affected me. I rushed to my car in a panic and just took a small swig. I felt a little rush of energy, but nothing else. I knew I had to fix things. Might lead to more nightmares and problems, but it was time to do or die. Literally. As I drove, my memories strayed back to my youth. I'd had pretensions of becoming a wise guy like my old man. I threw out his name and used his reputation rather than building one of my own. And that's where the problem started. Eventually I got crosswise with a man who didn't fear Papa Nick, much less one of his punk kids. Big Jim Elliot had his own criminal enterprise and his own staff. Papa Nick could have taken him. His organization was bigger and more established. But there was no need, and wars were costly. I'll tell that to a 19-year-old trying to prove himself worthy of his father's attention. I made the fatal error of disparaging Big Jim in public, calling him small time and a wannabe. Dumbass that I was, these appellations applied more to me than to him. On some level I must have craved a fight, and I got it. In addition to shooting off my mouth, I was shooting pool at Lacey's pub with some of my up-and-coming idiot friends. I was about to sink the eight ball and win another round. A cigarette dangled from my mouth. I had to talk some smack as I prepared to shoot, like I was in some black-and-white gangster movie from the old days. Yeah, well, I say Big Jim's a lightweight. Nothing without his crew of flying monkeys. And that's when the lightweight and his flying monkeys made their presence known. A shadow loomed over the pool table. Now, did I mention that Big Jim was called Big for a reason? His goons backed down my nascent crew with nothing more than hard stairs. So, you have something to say about me and my crew? Try saying it to my face, sonny boy. He was definitely not taking this with grace or a hint of forgiveness in his heart. I glanced around and saw that my allies had turned instantly into quivering punks. They needed their leader to take a stand. Yeah, well, if you know... That's as far as I got. I don't even remember the rest of the thrashing and stomping I got and didn't feel it until I regained consciousness in the hospital. He'd knocked me out cold and then given me the thumping I'd needed for my entire life to that point. Papa Nick stopped by the hospital to visit and to ensure that I didn't finish digging my grave. You will publicly apologize to Big Jim. He pronounced it like a sentence and that's what it felt like. Through the laboured breath caused by my cracked ribs and broken nose, I tried to object. But Papa, everyone knows he's just a fad. He has no staying power like us. We... He held up a hand. I'll stop you there, Vinny. There is no we. If you want to follow in my footsteps, you'll have to prove yourself. You have no right to ride on my name. You'll have to do things that will wash away any notion that you're soft, weak, or a fool. Take actions that'll instill fear in others so they completely forget what a punk you were today. Well, now, it seems that Vino worked on me even when I talked to myself. I saw my next destination ahead. A building where a certain accountant worked. A real pencil neck. My blood began to boil, but I had to remain calm, composed, so he had no idea that I knew. He'd assumed that I was drunk and had mistakenly stopped for a non-existent appointment. He worked out of an older building downtown. There was a camera on the main entrance, but not anywhere else. We weren't the only clients who used the back door and preferred anonymity. Gary was a whiz with tax codes. We had regular accountants for day-to-day operations, but he kept us away from federal, state, and local scrutiny. I timed it perfectly. His receptionist took off at three on Friday afternoons. It was 3.15 when I sorted into his waiting room. I paused to listen at his door. 
No conversations, so no witnesses. Just some pussy-ass pop satellite music he liked to listen to while he worked. I knocked on his door, way more loudly and forcefully than necessary. Hey, well, I was a drunken loser who couldn't keep hold of his wife, right? I opened the door and bopped him with the edge as he approached from the other side to open it himself. Oh, uh, sorry, Gary. That was really bad timing on my part, I said with a drunken slur. He backed away, his hand clutched to his left cheek, and the red spot that grew and promised to become a shiner. I stepped closer to him, pretending to have concern. Are you going to be okay, buddy? Wow, that was really a knock. It's okay, though. Makes you look tough, like a gladiator or something. One of those guys in that spot of Wu Zit show. He stood there shaking in mortified anger. He wanted to lash out, but he knew that he couldn't. He spoke assuaging words of forgiveness, but this is what I heard. You drunken moron. If you'd stay sober long enough to plow your idiot wife, then she'd stop bugging me. Not only a limp dick, but you're clumsy. Why don't you go dive off a bridge or something? Well, I smiled, satisfied that the vino still worked. And then I decked him. I draped his body over my shoulder and hefted him up the back stairs to the maintenance access door on the roof. I looked around for witnesses, but unless someone in the next closest building deliberately watched with a telescope, they wouldn't see anything unusual. I quickly carried him to the edge of the building that had an alley below. He'd started to regain consciousness, so I stood him on his feet at the ledge and slapped him the rest of the way awake. So, Pencil Neck, you think I'm dickless? At least we agree that Francesca isn't much fun in the sack. I had the satisfaction of watching his eyes grow enormously wide and fill with fear. He stammered out what he intended to be placating words. No, wait, please. You psycho, you can't do this. Everyone knows I cuckolded you. You're a drunken fool, but people will notice I'm gone. They'll miss me. Why can't you just jump off the building and leave me be? I gave him my best wicked grin. I'm not driving off any bridges or jumping from any buildings. I find that I have something to live for. He gave me an owlish, questioning look, tinged with a hint of hope. Well, I dashed it, just as the ensuing fall dashed his brains in the alley below. Unlikely anyone would find him until Monday trash pickup at the earliest. <laughs> Very appropriate. Maybe his fellow rats would take care of some of the potential evidence. No one would believe a suicide, but there would be no suspects by that time. Anyone with a stake would be taken care of one way or another. It was now time to go to the last place Papa Nick would suspect. It wasn't easy to get in, but I still had keys and codes to everything from the last time I'd had to earn my keep the hard way for dear old Dad. I knew that, except for the cleaning staff and a goon on guard, no one would be at his home. His real wife would be at yoga. It was getting late. He'd be leaving the office soon and headed home to where he did his true work, where he talked without reservations about his criminal enterprises, his sanctum sanctorum. I made it into the residence. Servants' entrances are awesome and usually forgotten, especially in these days when few people had regular servants, just contractors. Of course, when one had to keep crucial secrets, he tended to hire people and ensure that they had a vested interest in keeping their mouths shut. It looked like the cooking and cleaning staff was gone for the day. I eased past the media room, where a hulking figure sprawled watching some sports show. The on-duty security... Almost there, and <laughs> Excelsior, the office. I rifled the Circus Maximus-sized desk and found what I wanted for supplies. I used the restroom and then took up my hunting stand in what would have been the closet if this had been used as a bedroom. <laughs> hunting stand. I laughed internally, like I'd ever hunted mere animals. I liked animals, and I didn't need to prove anything. Plus, who wanted to go to the woods? Well, the time I'd spent in them had been invariably unpleasant. I settled onto a box and leaned back against the wall. I dozed off with thoughts of my first trip to the woods, but the hunt had already been completed before we arrived. I wasn't in the woods. I was in a car. Frank Senior sat beside me. 
He was my handler and coach on this first Return of Glory mission. I was nervous, naturally. I participated in getting some people back on track with a little rough stuff, but this was next level. I was in college. I should have been home writing papers or something. Instead, I was in this beater car with a souped-up engine, sitting beside Frank Senior, his garlic breath, waiting on a certain business associate of Dad's to leave his favorite side pieces apartment. The memory was just like then, but I drifted out of my body and saw from above as the thirty-something man in an expensive but rumble suit walked out of the building. I heard Frank Sr. say, That's him. I didn't feel the nudge, but my younger body did, and both of us left the vehicle and walked towards the man. Frank Sr. kept an eye out in all directions, but my body was laser-focused on the intended target. As we drew near, the man, about to put the key into the lock of his car door, paused and looked up, startled. <laughs> so much for the afterglow of lovemaking, I thought to my dream self. Then my body raised a little revolver and put it to the man's eye. I heard a faint pop as the small caliber pistol fired, and the man collapsed, quite thoroughly and very convincingly dead. The dream flashed forward to Frank Senior pulling me by the arm to get me going, of his calming words as we dragged the body quickly over to the beater and then drove out to the disposal site. Ah, this is why I dreamed of woods. Ah, a big state park, handy for hiding bodies. Flash forward again to this very room, to Papa Nick praising me for paying the bills. No, I hadn't fixed the problem yet, but I was on my way. I still needed to rehabilitate my reputation and, well, I still owed him. I awakened to hear the door to the room close and voices speak. Papa Nick and... Yeah, the Franks. I don't really care about updates and excuses. I have decreed him dead, and that needs to happen quickly. Frank Jr. responded. Yes, sir. I'll go find him myself and take care of it. He reversed course and bustled back out of the room. After the door closed, Frank Sr. chuckled. Ah, he's a good kid, Nick. Cut him some slack. Your boy was acting weird today. More so than usual. No idea where the guys lost him, but he maybe ain't as far gone as we were thinking. Nick flooded his hands. He's gone to me, bastardo. I always needed that one. Always wanted notice and affection. I gave him everything anyone could want in life. Yeah, he kept failing. No good at business at all. I had to keep doing contracts to repay me. Oh, don't get me wrong, that was useful. He eliminated a fair number of problem people for us. Had real talent for that, but no stomach. He sat behind the colossal mahogany desk and steepled his fingers. Maybe I should have brought him on the crew instead of letting him flail away at the business world, for which he had and still has no ability. He certainly showed more talent for slaughter than he did for anything else. Frank Senior took the seat to the right of his boss and handed him one of the two drinks he'd prepared. Yeah, he had the talent, but he took it to heart and let the work turn him into a monster. Monsters are careless. What he became made him weak in all the wrong ways, made him vulnerable to the bottle. He did the only thing you could have, he assured my father. Nick nodded. Oh, yeah, all but let him take out Big Jim. Some other outfit did it. Then he was right about it, too. Big Jim was a punk. He sucker punched my boy, and my boy's big mistake was picking a pussy crew. Started him down the wrong road, and he never gained any self-respect. He sighed with finality. Oh, well, water under the bridge. Soon to be a body in the river. He grinned and raised his glass in salute to his closest friend and his soon-to-be-dead son. I sat and listened and wondered if I was hearing the unvarnished truth. I'd slept and hadn't had a dose of vino. Yet these two were old friends. No doubt they were speaking as honestly as either ever did. Well, for all I knew, they were talking about something else, and I merely heard the truth. In any case, my father, whose approval was all I craved in youth, and his best friend, whom I'd wanted desperately to see as an uncle, a mentor, a centurion to hold my skills, had just agreed that I was a writer. Well, I had to stifle a laugh, <laughs> right off, reminded me of Gary the Taxman as I faced him forward for his plunge and gave him just a little bit of wedgie before I released him to the air. 
That meant that I wasn't wearing the stern and righteously angry countenance I'd intended when I stepped out from the closet. I didn't burst out all fury and mayhem as I'd planned, but wearing a grin wouldn't have mattered. The room was soundproofed, and dear old Dad's large caliber pistol was equipped with a silencer. Yet the drama became all business when I walked into the office room. First, I shot Frank Sr. in the head. Once for fun and once to be done. The way he himself had taught me, though the large caliber did make a mess of things. Papa Nick whipped open his top drawer and dug for the pistol that currently filled my own hand. I waved it in a side-to-side -side gesture that mimicked a shaking head. He reached down to retrieve the little derringer he kept on his ankle. I stepped around the side of the desk and stomped on that ankle. He barked out a high-pitched cry of agony, then slumped out of the chair and curled himself on the floor, all while clutching at his wounds. Ah, oh, come now, father. We must show some dignity, some style, some gravitas. The lessons you ground into me. We must keep up appearances, best practices and all. He stammered with the pain, with age, with an already diseased and damaged heart. Vinny, please, we can talk. Why are you doing this? I favoured him with my most sinister smile. Oh, you talked, and I heard. Not what you said, but what you really had in mind. Now you and Frank just confirmed what I suspected. You meant to have me killed? For what? You think I'm an embarrassment? I started drinking because of the nightmares, because of what you drove me to do. The bodies I've taken out and stacked in unmarked graves under the pines for you. Then I started drinking some more. My grin turned savage. I guess my piece of shit half-sister hasn't caught on yet. You have plenty of cause to have me eliminated. I've been robbing the company blind for years. Just thought you should know before you die. Oh, I've been terribly stressed. I slipped into the bottle all unawares, but I'm completely sober and I'm enjoying this moment. At that point, I was startled by a knock at the door. It's me. Frank Jr., sir. Ah, oh, that brown-nosing piece of weasel shit. I chuckled. This was getting better by the minute. I placed the barrel of the pistol to my lips to shush Nick, who looked hopefully at the portal. I saw the look and shook my head in mock pity. Not gonna help you. I yanked open the door and grabbed the thug by the front of his shirt and hit him with the barrel of the pistol, then pulled him inside and shut the door behind him. He stumbled forward, but stayed on his feet. He scrambled for his own pistol, but stopped when he saw his father's body with the extruded brain stretched in front of the desk. He knelt beside the still warm corpse and grabbed its hand. I like to think that, just before I fired the round into the back of his skull, that he felt immense grief, immense loss and failure. Stop, I ordered before I even turned back to Papa Nick. He tried to sneak over to the door while I was savouring my triumph. He started and hunched his shoulders. At first I thought it was in resignation, but... Oh, no. This night kept getting better. I made my escape into the darkness. The bodyguard was still watching television, and now I had a pair of companions, presumably Frank Jr.'s team. No point in taking out the trash. I'd use Papa's phone to call in an emergency and just left the line open. <sighs> Would love to see their faces when the police arrived. Francesca the Harpy fled before me when I arrived at my home. She didn't want to chatter anymore. I didn't give her a choice. Freshly fortified by the vino, I cornered her in our bedroom. My bedroom. And I heard, Vinny, I'm truly scared. The kids and I just want to be free. I'm so scared. Please don't kill me. I did love you once, but you got so cold and then the drinking started. And then the screw-ups at work. Please, don't kill me and please don't hurt the kids. Not them. Never them. No. After a while, I couldn't tell what she was saying from what I heard. It was the same babble to which I'd grown accustomed. Oh, I can't believe that I ever loved this, this thing. Now she disgusted me. Used up, frightened, feeling genuine terror at my approach, 
that what I'm sure appeared to her like a stone-faced enforcer. Well, in wine there is truth, and in fear there is as well. I didn't hurt her. Just told her to leave, that I didn't need to kill her. She was already dead to me. I even let her pack a few things. She, of course, hadn't taken me seriously that night. Dante emerged from his room, headphones dangling and that vapid look on his face from when he'd been immersed in his video game fantasy worlds for too long. You can, like, get your shit too, pal. I'm sure your mother will need a ride. Oh, Francesca, you'll need to take numbnuts here for a DNA test. I don't think he's mine. And within six months, I cleaned up my world. I didn't keep the money I'd embezzled from the company. I used it to trap my hosebag half-sister. I really hadn't meant to become an alky. At first it was just a way to numb my conscience. Then it was a show, a farce that became reality. I patted the old bottle with the exquisite velvet cover. It was nearly empty now. I'd used it often and to great effect, and the corporation, under the guidance of my half-brother, one of the legitimate heirs, had bought out my shares at a considerable profit in my favour. For some reason, he was intimidated by me. Pliny's delight was open. The lights inside the classic storefront twinkled and beckoned, and all appeared as it had on that first visit, the one when I was so hammered out of my skull. There were several cars in the lots, and it looked and sounded like there was a party inside. When I made my way through the front door, there she was, that lovely lady, no mere photograph, but here and alive. Welcome back, Vincent. I see that you enjoyed the Veritas Est in Sanguinem vintage. I trust that you've found the truth that you sought. I'd just finished off the vino, and I understood the true question. Yes, I know who I am and what I am. I come from a long line of hard men who did hard things. I tried to be something else for the sake of my wife, my family. In the end, it was my family with a capital F that stirred my blood. She smiled. No doubt she'd received many such confessions, heard the realizations. She gestured with those lovely hands and smiled that enticing smile and drew me toward the cabinet to try a new vintage. Plures crapula, quam gladius. More die from drunkenness than the sword. The Black Rock Chapel Horror Part 1 Have you come to relieve your burden unto the Lord? asked the elder priest from behind the blind of the confession booth. Silence hung to answer the offer. The elder priest, rather than immediately persist, decided to let him take his time. For in the last seventeen and a half years he'd been an elder priest of Black Rock Chapel. And he'd learned that they would feel the compulsion of conscience to confess their unrighteous deeds in the Lord's due time. The youth was shaking. His hands were firmly clasped around his upper arms, leading to his shoulders, as if shivering. The youth was hunching over, rocking back and forth in the wooden chair within the confession booth. His left eye twitched as his face remained chiseled in a state of petrified terror. "'There's no need to fear, my son,' whispered the elder priest hearing the distress on the adolescent's side of the booth. Christ bids forgiveness to all who trespass against him. All he asks is for repentance of your sins and to seek reform from him. The creaking of the youth's wooden chair began to die down, and yet his breathing began to quiver in place of his body. Forgiveness, the boy whimpered softly, his voice continuing to tremble in a traumatized manner. No, no forgiveness. The elder priest, hearing the youth's remark, repeated his assurance of the Lord's mercy to the boy. No salvation, no saviour. I've done their bid, father. I did their bid, and I am debased. The elder priest, though unnerved by the youth's pessimism, remained composed. Come now, my son. God has promised salvation to all who walk astray. All you must do is to confess and repent of your sins. Worry not of the judgment of others, for the confidence of a priest is sacred. 
The youth offered a dry laugh in response before retorting. I care nothing for the judgment of others, for they too are as devoid of any hope of salvation as I. The voice of the adolescent began to deepen to the pitch of a man twice his age, and beginning to take on an air of malign satisfaction at the statement's insinuation. Confused, the elder priest wanted to question the youth as to the meaning of his statement. More than anything, however, the elder priest was perplexed as to the boy's purpose for attendance of this confessional as a whole. Do you not, young man, accept the Lord into your heart? Are you not one of his children? The elder priest queried, unsure as to the state of the youth's soul. No, no, father. I no longer succumb to the lies of the church, for I have seen otherwise. The youth's voice shook again, the tone growing even deeper and angrier in timber. My eyes were open to the truth long ago. They showed me the truth. They? The elder priest questioned, curious as to exactly whom the implication belonged to. Yes, they. The true harbingers of the truth. You see, Father, through them, you may see the truth. They're a prophecy. The elder priest became truly disturbed at hearing such blatantly sacrilegious claims. Remaining calm, he told the blaspheming young man that there existed no truth outside of the law. The young man let out a defiant and condescending laugh. <laughs> you really are a blind old fool. You would, despite the offer of being shown the truth, choose to hold on to the lies of the so-called holy gospel. Realizing that the youth had no intention of repentance, the elder priest felt compelled to end the confessional. A light rapping on the outside of the booth found this silent request granted. Just before departing, the youth turned one more time toward the elder priest and, with an abysmally baritone voice, said, You will see the truth, father. I will show you their prophecy, that there is no salvation. Another short succession of knocks prompted the youth to finally take his leave from the confession booth, allowing for the patron outside an older maiden of forty-five years to enter. Have you come to relieve your burden unto the Lord? The elder priest asked the maiden, still feeling rattled. I have come to confess, father. You see, the maiden began her confession, but the elder priest's mind had become far too entwined in the young man's morbid diatribe to lend her his attention. Oh, how can I be forgiven, father? The maiden beckoned, arousing the elder priest from his anxious pondering to find her in tears at having concluded her confession. Though he had not heard her sins, he decided against attempting to ask her to repeat herself. Instead, he merely assured her that she was forgiven in the eyes of the Lord and requested no less than five Hail Marys before the day's end. Upon concluding the maiden's confessional, the elder priest retired to his bedchamber to attempt letting peaceful rest cleanse away anxiety. Slumber would be an uphill conflict for him that night, however. No matter his efforts, the elder priest's mind continued to be ravaged by the youth's words. You will see the truth. There is no salvation. When the sun rose the next morning, the elder priest found himself feeling weak. His head throbbed horribly and he felt terrible knots in his stomach. The elder priest winced in pain as he attempted to open his eyes, massaging his temples in a feeble attempt to ease the migraine's hold on him. Father Garraway. The elder priest broke from his stupor at the calling of his name. Father Garraway, is everything all right? asked another of the chapel's elders, a balding man with only stubble for facial hair who stood a good two feet shorter than Father Carraway, despite being five years his elder. Yes, answered the bedridden elder priest in a distant manner, as if his response was voiced before his mind could comprehend his own train of thought. Regaining his proper composure, despite the persistence of his current ailments, offered the most welcoming smile on his face he could manage before elaborating. Father Edward, I didn't hear you come in. Uh, yes, everything is fine. I just appear to be feeling a tad ill this morning. I trust it's nothing serious. Father Carraway attempted to offer a chuckle of ease to the fellow priest that devolved into a painful cough, prompting him to use the sleeve of his bedrobe to cover his mouth. 
For a moment his eyes widened in shock at the sight of a small black stain on the sleeve of his snow-white bedroom. Father, queried Father Edwards, noting the momentary state of anxious apprehension on the face of his peer. Yes, replied Father Carraway, seeing the scepticism on his visitor's face. I told you it's uh, nothing serious, a minor ailment that I'll sure will pass by morning. Now, what brings you to my bedchamber, Father? Myself and others heard you last night. You kept screaming, no salvation. We heard sounds of thrashing from all the way down the chamber halls, replied Father Edwards, his voice composed of concern for the well-being of his fellow priest. No salvation. The words slowly began to infest his mind once more, causing a sharp chill to crawl down his spine. Ignorant of the fellow elder priest's claim, Father Carraway reassured his visitor that, save for his current ailments, he was perfectly sound. His thoughts, however, began struggling once again to void themselves of the memories of the previous night's haunting confessional. Skeptical, but overall satisfied as to the elder priest's condition, Father Edwards bade his farewell and exited the bedchamber. Father Carraway laid in his bed all through the morning and into the afternoon, the aches and pains becoming worse. A shrill scream finally roused the ailing Father Carraway from his bed. Though physically ill as well, the elder priest found himself able to bound out of his bed and sprint up the spiral stone stairs to the bell tower of Black Rock Chapel, with the speed and agility of a man much younger than he. When he reached the top of the stone stairs, he found a young maiden, one of the chapel's fledgling nuns, who had not yet sworn her oath of purity, doubled over, wailing into her palms. "'What is it, dear sister?' Father Carraway gently but firmly grasped the young maiden's shoulders. "'She... she... she...' she stammered, utterly unable to voice a coherent reply. "'Who, child? What happened?' But the young nun-to-be could only shake her head and continue wailing in response. Unable to voice a coherent response from the young sister, Father Carraway resolved to open the door behind her and enter the bell tower of the chapel and investigate the malignants himself. "'No, you mustn't go in there!' the young sister shrieked, causing the elder priest's heart to skip a beat in his chest. "'Unclean! Unclean!' she said as she again buried her face into her palms. "'Calm down, sister. I'll see what's going on. I want you to stay here.' The young sister just sat quivering, burying her petrified face into her palms. Father Carraway's hand trembled as he grasped the knob. Unclean, he wondered, as he willed himself to open the door. The foul odour of death assaulted his senses immediately upon opening the door. The elder priest turned his face into the crook of his arm and began to cough, gagged by the offensive scent. With an alarming dread mounting within him as to what lies inside the bell tower, Father Carraway instructed the budding nun to summon help. She bowed her head to him and immediately sprinted down the stone stairs to the monastery to alert the other elders of Black Rock Chapel. The inside of the bell tower was dark, only illuminated by a single torch mounted to each of the four stone brick walls respectively. Paltry though the light was, the faint glow of the torches still revealed the unholy display within its claustrophobic confines. Adjusting his eyesight to the faint glow of the inside of the bell tower, he saw the corpse of one of the maidens of the village. An Irish maiden of forty-five, whom the father recognised as the tender of the nearby tavern, who had attended many confessions for her sins of lust. She was stripped bare and hanging from the tower's rafters by her neck using the long, thick hemp used to sound the sermon bell. On her breasts were carved a single word in her native tongue. Fratrin. The elder priest wretched in disgust and horror at the abyssal display before him. With haste he escaped the confines of the bell tower and slammed the door behind himself. Our father, Father Carroy began with shuddering breath, crossing himself as he spoke. Hallowed be thy name. Our kingdom come thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Father Carraway. The sound of his name broke him out of his petrified stupor. Father Carraway, are you all right? It was Father Edwards, 
For a drawn-out moment, Father Carraway had no words for his fellow priest, merely offering his current mortified stare as a response. Father Carraway, what in God's name happened? The urgency in Father Edward's voice was accentuated. She... she confessed to me. Tears began to streak Father Carraway's face as he pointed at the door that led into the peak of the bell tower. Determined to spy the source of the hysteria, Father Edwards moved past the scared Father Carraway and opened the door. Christ above! Sister Meredith, alert the authorities at once. The fledgling nun stood frozen with her jaw agape. Do as I say, sister. Make haste, barked Father Edwards and they snapped young sister Meredith from her terrified trance as she ran down the stone steps, bolting through the chamber halls and exiting through the sanctuary. We must alert Archbishop Marcus of this atrocity, Father Carraway beckoned. Father Edwards disagreed with the conclusion, thinking it wiser to handle the situation themselves. Are you mad, man? This is an attack against the church. Father Carraway's heart pounded in his chest with startling intensity, prompting him to clutch the left of his chest to try slowing the quakes of his heart. Easy now, Father. There's no need to make a larger problem of this than what is absolutely necessary to warrant. Father Carraway, confused and shocked at his fellow priest's hesitation at consulting the head of Black Rock Chapel, decided to further press for an explanation. Please trust me, old friend. If we are to become bishops ourselves, we must prove that we can handle situations as this ourselves. There's no use in disturbing Archbishop Marcus when, in all likelihood, this is nothing more than the act of a disturbed-minded individual who found convenience in the concealment of her body in the peak of the chapel's bell tower. A simple crime of passion. Grotesque, but simple nonetheless. Oh, Father Carraway nearly saw red. How can you say such things with such lax conviction? You, a priest, a servant of Christ. You expect me to just sit here while a credible threat to God's kingdom is swept idly under the rug? Before his tirade could escalate any further, the elder priest felt something move across his feet. Perplexion overtaking his former frustration, he looked down to see a mass of inky black serpents surrounding his feet. Terror flooded through his entire body as he saw the serpents converge on him from all directions. Father Carraway, are you all right? asked Father Edwards. The elder priest only offered a weak gasp of horror in response as he saw the multitude of serpents spawning from the doorway leading into the bell tower peak. Father Carraway, what is it? Father Carraway stuttered unable to fully comprehend the events unfolding before him. S serpents Serpents? Father Edwards questioned, eyeing the mortified priest with confusion. Can you not see them? They're everywhere. He stopped abruptly when he felt one of the serpents sink its fangs into his legs. No sooner had his eyes widened in shock than the serpent's supernaturally potent venom began to cripple the elder priest's senses. The hallway within Black Rock Chapel's peak began to spin, dizzying the father. Father Carraway clutched his forehead with his left hand, as if doing so might in some fashion stabilize the dizziness, his right hand desperately grasping the crucifix pendant that hung from his neck. His eyelids began to feel heavy as vertigo began to transform into exhaustion. Just before darkness could overtake him, however, Father Carraway could see all too clearly Despite the venom's assault on his senses, Father Edwards extending his hand as the black serpents then began to slither to him, appearing to answer some malign summons. The elder priest stumbled back in chilled fright as he witnessed them slither and seemingly begin to fuse into Father Edwards' body, as if the supposed fellow priest himself were comprised of the demonic serpents. The wriggling mass then appeared to revert back into the form of the priest, as Father Carraway's legs began to lose the strength necessary for proper balance. His heart quaked in his fragile chest as, with the meagre composure he could manage in his damning plight, he staggered backwards whilst the knuckles began to whiten on the hand that grasped the crucifix pendant. Our oh, Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy... 
His laboured breath words were abruptly silenced as his feet had misstepped, sending him crashing down the stone steps. Unconsciousness finally met the elder priest when his head struck the wall midway down the spiral. Part 2 Father Carraway wandered about in the ever-extended void of subconscious. Unable to feel or perceive anything any more, he wondered if he'd indeed perish through either the means of the serpent's venom or the trauma of the crash down the spiralling stone stairs. Am I dead? Father Carraway pondered as he continued to survey the void. Is this the entry to the kingdom of heaven? Nay, a monotone voice called to him, answering the father's internal query. Caught by surprise, he spun around to face the speaker. And to his horror, the priest stood face to face with the ginger-haired Irish barmaiden whom he'd seen hanging by the neck in the bell tower. She stood before him in the dark, subconscious plain, completely bare, her milky-white skin and grassy-green-hued irises projecting the visage of light. The entrance to heaven is close to us, as it always was. Father Carraway closed his eyes, trying vainly to assure himself that this wasn't real. Oh, this is real, Father, unlike the horseshit you spouted about God's forgiveness. Father Carraway struggled to attempt rebuttal to the spectre's abrasive claim as utter dread clouded his abilities to reason. God forgives all who repent. The phantom let out a scoffing laugh that echoed throughout the void, and the father felt compelled to cover his ears as the chuckling devolved into what he could only perceive as a cacophony of tortured wails that appeared to emanate from all directions in the encroaching purgatory. If that were true, father, why not repent yourself for your continued heresies? Well, the priest found himself amidst his immediate sense of shock and dread in the ghoulish ethereal plane, confused as to the ghost's insinuation. What are you talking about? What falsehood have I spoken? As soon as the defiant query left Father Carraway's lips, his blood chilled as two serpents began to take form in the dark void. His jaw went helplessly slack as the serpents, one whose scales were as dark as the nightmare planet Berthrom, the other whose scales were the hue of burning embers reminiscent of the depths of Tartarus, slithered their way to the maiden's feet. As the malign creatures coiled themselves to her legs, the phantom spoke again, her vocals taking on a tormented, ethereal echo. If God's forgiveness is divine, how are we so many that are condemned? Before any rebuttal could be offered, Father Carraway's tongue froze and his lips trembled as the depraved vipers journeyed their way up and around the maiden's nude form. His eyes widened at the unholy display enacted before him in petrified disbelief as he began to witness the serpent start to violate her. The phantom maiden began to moan with unrighteous pleasure as the dark-scaled serpent inserted itself head first in between her legs, the crimson serpent coiling around her torso and seeming to fondle her. The moans of sinful pleasure began to devolve into screams of damning agony, as if emanating from the throats of many as the apparition appeared to near her climactic release. Revolted as the elder priest was at the abhorrent nightmare, he felt as though the clutches of some manner of malign will forced him to witness the events to their completion. Come on now, father. Why deprive yourself? I see the way you'd be watching. Oh, you'd like to have me, wouldn't you? Father Carraway, now bearing the strength of will over his body, clamped his eyelids tight and clutched his ears as the wraith-like voice echoed throughout his head. When he opened his eyes, now full with tears induced by the abysmal madness, he saw that the phantom maiden's appearance had decayed into the same necrotic image he'd spied in the bell chamber at the peak of Black Rock Chapel, complete with the word Frauchum carved into her bosom. Oh God, give me strength! Father Carraway cried aloud, futilely attempting to free himself from the dread that crippled him. The wraith let out a devious cackle that echoed through the black void before. In the same voice she formerly bore in life, she lashed out. 
listen to you, still thinking Christ cares for you. Poor little lamb, for you truly have lost your way. Another ghastly wail of pleasure rang from the phantom maiden's lips as rivulets of dark, warm blood ran down from her complexionless legs before crying out in the echoing and apparitional voice of agony. There is no relief in heaven, no damnation in hell, no forgiveness, no damnation. The burning red serpent began to work its way from her mouth as the abomination's vocals became entirely inhuman altogether. His blood now frozen in mortal terror at his seemingly inescapable fate to the hands of the malign entity before him, Father Carraway lifted a trembling hand to clutch the crucifix around his neck as he again attempted to choke out the Lord's prayer. The elder priest was cut off before he could even finish the utterance of Hallowed be thy name, when legions of painful screams of perpetual sorrow reached a deafening pitch that echoed from around him as well as within him forcing his eyes closed from strain and his hands to reflexively cover his ears. Through his fright-induced tears, the elder priest opened his eyes to witness the torso of the unholy phantom begin wriggling as the protrusions of other human faces began to form themselves into her pale, decayed flesh. When the writhing mass of face took form within the phantom maiden's body, they cried out in unison in wails so deafening Father Carraway was forced to his knees, eyes clamped tight and his palms covering his ears. No salvation, the tortured, ethereal voices screamed out as one. Only condemnation awaits us all, for all are debased. The words echoed through the elder priest's shattered mind. No salvation. He tried to hide away from the thought, as to attempt to keep his psyche from complete collapse. With great strain, Father Carraway opened his eyes to a small squint, merely enough to perceive from a rudimentary level the mortifying sight of a multitude of serpents advancing upon him from all directions, just as they had in the bell chamber in the chapel's peak. Stripped of any will to mentally or physically resist, Father Carraway watched helplessly as long, writhing black and red serpents exited the mouths of the tormented, screwing faces that were conjoined to the abomination's body. Though I walk through the valley in the shadow of death, my rod and thy staff, he faintly whispered as he finally resigned himself to whatever damning fate that awaited him at the whims of the abhorrent phantom. Just before the darkness could overtake him, however, the elder priest found himself lying in cold sweat within his bedchamber. His eyes were stretched wide open. The first image he perceived was that of a young maiden. Still in a state of perpetual shock, Father Carraway stared at the maiden before him, attempting to distinguish the presence before him now from that of the wraith that menaced him in his slumber. When his eyes studied the olive complexion of her skin, coupled with the long brunette hair beneath her head robe, he realised that the maiden standing before him now was none other than the budding Sister Meredith. As his vision slowly strained itself into clear composition, he could see the young fledgling's eyes glistening with tears, and her face was red. Oh, Father, thank God you're awake. I thought you were lost forever, exclaimed Sister Meredith through tear-filled relief. In an exhausted voice, Father Carraway questioned the young fledgling nun as to where he was and what had happened, for in the current moment he could not immediately recollect any of the previous phenomena outside of the demented nightmare he'd only narrowly escaped from. It was awful, after I came back with the authorities for the woman we found in the bell tower. She took in a shuddering breath before continuing, her voice cracking again with frightful tears. We, we found you sprawled unconscious on the stairs. You kept muttering the Lord's Prayer and something about serpents and poison. I looked everywhere, but I couldn't find Father Edwards. The body was missing too. Oh, me and a few of the other sisters moved you into your bed. You were out for most of the night and into this morning. I only awoke you when you began thrashing about. A tumultuous wave of dread washed over the elder priest's face as, all at once, the horrors of the previous afternoon came crashing back into his memory like a devastating avalanche. Oh, Father, I'm afraid, cried the young Sister Meredith. Something unholy is happening in the chapel. What are we going to do? Father Carraway winced and drew a deep breath, once again grasping the right of his forehead 
attempting to both ease the throbbing pulses inside as well as regain some semblance of composure of his abilities to reason. His head was drowning in a black whirlpool of insanity and cold, crippling, unforgiving dread. What am I going to do? The bitter question crossed Father Carraway's mind, followed by another, far more disheartening query. What could I do? Father Carraway began hopelessly attempting to connect the ghoulish events to possibly identify the source of the abominable phenomena and, with the aid of the divine, combat it. Archbishop Marcus, Father Carraway whispered, unconsciously vocalising his thoughts as his mind travelled back to the encounter in the chapel's peak. What was that, Father? questioned the fledgling nun, unsure yet hopeful that his response to her might be the foundation of a plan to either drive away or to flee the evil that presently menaced them. Awakened from his thought-induced trance by Sister Meredith's voice, Father Carraway began to rouse himself from his bed. Listen, child, he gestured to the young sister in an exhausted voice that bore the nature of a man far more elder than he. Fetch my priest's garb and my overcoat. Where are you going, father? pressed the young fledgling nun, unsure as to the elder priest's intentions. There may be one that could provide us with aid, for he has dealt with many an evil in his day. He'll know what to do. Now, do as I say, child. Make haste. The young fledgling sister Meredith was slightly puzzled, but simply offered a small bow of her head before making her way to the wardrobe. Father Carraway struggled as he slowly moved his aching body, still weak from the serpent's potent venom. When his legs finally found the strength to stand, he slowly trudged over to the vanity mirror that hung to the right of the entrance of the bedchamber. It was an average-sized mirror that was joined on either side by vanilla-scented candles that would provide small tastes of added luminescence to the entirety of the bedchamber. Above the vanity mirror hung a shining silver crucifix bearing a moulded image of Christ's executed body fixed upon it. Gazing at his image in the aged mirror, Father Carraway felt a sense of nausea creep upon him as, where in reality he'd lived only forty-five years, the face that returned his gaze from the mirror had the appearance of one who had lived closer to thirty years longer. The reflection in the mirror bore thin, silver strands of hair, unlike the thick, vibrant brunette hair he bore outside of the mirror. The skin on the doppelganger's face also appeared gaunt and concaved, as though the flesh it bore was too excessive for its bones. The wearied elder priest became unnerved at the sight, tugging at the skin on his face to reassure himself, tugging at the skin on his face to reassure himself through tactile perception that the image in the mirror was indeed some manner of visual hallucination. It was then that the reflection began to shift within the mirror's confines. The face that posed itself as the elder priest began to offer a most sinister grin, while the rest of the room surrounding the being began to take on a scarlet-red filter. For a moment, his blood chilled at the sight of his reflection acting outside of his own will. Placing his palms over his eyes, he softly whispered to himself, No, it's not real. God be with me. Old fool. Father Carraway looked once again at the doppelganger from his palms and saw the sinister reflection of himself begin to decay, the loose skin hanging onto his skull now falling away to expose a skeleton underneath. God cannot save us, lashed the vision in the mirror. His jaw fell as he watched the image in the mirror slowly continue to devolve into a more grotesque appearance. More of the false reflection's flesh slowly decayed and peeled away as if it were mere paper to reveal the skull, bearing jagged teeth that could rip and crush flesh and bone alike with ease without worry of dulling. The sockets of the demon were dark and cavernous voids that swallowed all semblance of light, save for only a tiny crimson speck in the middle of either eye socket respectively that appeared to serve as its retinas. Let me ask you something, Father, chided the beast in the mirror, voicing the elder priest's title in a tone of mocking reverence. Father Carraway covered his ears to attempt to resist the abomination's lying tongue. Why did your so-called loving father in heaven execute his own son? 
Father Carraway screamed in his head at the abhorrent creature to silence its blasphemies to no avail. Christ himself was no more than a holy bastard. The words crashed as boulders in an avalanche in Father Carraway's head, motivating him to press his palms tighter to his ears and tightly closing his eyes. His execution achieved nothing more than penance for his birth as such. The last exclamation rang out in his mind with such ferocity that he could feel his knees attempting to buckle beneath him as if he were being weighed down by an unseen force. You know, it's true, Father. Just look at me. I am humankind in its purest states. We are the condemned. Humankind itself, Father, are the very beasts that were sentenced to damnation. Salvation is only the lie that you spread. Nearing his wit's end, Father Carraway slammed his fists upon the surface of the vanity and shouted defiantly at the apparition, Enough! The mounted crucifix, shaken from the tremor, fell from its place above the mirror and landed onto the vanity surface in front of him. Hearing the faint clatter of the crucifix's descent, the elder priest found himself awakened from another trance. He saw that, instead of the detestable spectre that occupied its confines only moments before, his reflection revealed the middle-aged man that existed in reality. Father Carraway again closed his eyes and began drawing in deep breaths to relax himself once again. Upon opening his eyes, he decided to refix the fallen symbol back to its original perchance above the vanity mirror. As he held it, however, a searing pain shot through the palm of his hand that caused him to drop it once more, letting out a cry of pain. Tightly grasping his right hand with his left from reflex, he gazed once again down at the image of Christ's sacrifice as it began to glow a hot, burning orange. The oppressive odour of brimstone permeated the air within the bedchamber as the elder priest saw, in revitalised terror, small streams of blood begin to ooze from the wrists, feet and head of the mould of Christ. Are you all right, Father? Father Carraway spun around and was met with a slightly relieving sight of the young fledgling nun, priest garb and overcoat in hand. I heard shouting. Did something happen? No, child, replied the elder priest, unsure how to explain the unholy phenomena that occurred in her absence. Everything's fine, but there's no more time to be lost. Come now, you will accompany me to the archbishop's home. He may be the only one who could help us. Part 3 with haste, the pair quietly exited the sanctuary and walked through the town that saw its citizens begin making their way to Black Rock Chapel. Wednesday Mass, Father Carraway muttered, silently chastising himself for the lapse in memory. What is it, Father? queried the budding nun, citing the expression of anxiety on the elder priest's face. Father Carraway, still bearing a worried face, shook his head and blankly reassured her that all that was important was that they sought the Archbishop as swiftly as could be humanly possible. Within the span of another five minutes of walking, they arrived upon a small cottage built from stone and mortar. Fixed upon the front of the wooden door was a silver crucifix that hung by a string of rosary beads dangling from an outwardly protruding nail. Above the decoration were inscribed three words in Latin, In nomine patris, in bright red. Is this the Archbishop's home? asked Sister Meredith. Indeed, replied Father Carraway. He spotted an air of curious scepticism mould itself on the young fledging nun's face. Uh, Archbishop Marcus always preferred modesty, Father Carraway told her, as he'd already anticipated her question. As he reached to ring the worn-down yet functional bell that was fashioned to the right of the door, the elder priest briefly recollected a few of his memories of his years under Archbishop Marcus's apprenticeship. He gave the small frail string that hung the bell two light tugs, hearing the six high-pitched rings of its frail clapper impacting against its interior. In the mere span of a minute after the bell rang its last, the wooden door began to jolt ajar. Who seeks my home? A voice called out from inside the cottage. The voice was that of a man far older than Father Carraway. 
We have been seeking counsel and aid against a grave and unknown evil that has plagued God's kingdom of Black Rock Chapel. Well, Father Carraway couldn't help but emphasize the urgency of his request for an audience. The entrance of the cottage was revealed as the wooden door was opened fully. Standing in the doorway was an elderly man clad in a soft velvet robe with a white cross stitched into the left. Despite his aged appearance, the man stood a solid six feet in height, even dwarfing Father Carraway's mere five feet six inches. The man's head bore a clean shave, bearing only an albino moustache and beard that reached down to his collarbone. For a solid moment that felt to stretch, the man in the doorway examined them, evaluating the sincerity and the spoken urgency. Well then, you'd best come inside, said the man in the doorway, finally breaking the ever-straining silence and gesturing for them to enter. The pair entered, the older gentleman promptly closing the door behind them. Inside the cottage, the young sister Meredith felt a sense of warm comfort. The walls held different varieties of oils and myrrh. Large, Thick, leather-bound volumes were neatly lined atop a shelf perched above the fireplace that housed a ferocious blaze within. Father Carraway became once again lost in his memories of days past. Oh, tell me, what is this vile menace you beseech my aid for? The question breaking the elder priest from his memories. Wasting not an instant, Father Carraway began regaling the Archbishop of the hauntings of the prior two days as he continued his description of the horrors that occurred in Blackrock Chapel. The elder priest saw the face of the archbishop become grim, sombre, as if he bore some grave piece of the macabre enigma that the others didn't. When Father Carraway was finished describing their peril, a long and unsettling silence hung in the air of the cottage. The ground upon which the Black Rock Chapel stands wasn't always holy. Archbishop Marcus's voice evoked the same foreboding feeling of sorrow and regret that remained reflected on his aged face. The elder priest was himself hesitant to press the archbishop for a further explanation, as if the hidden revelation could scar him further than what his psyche could recover. He made mention of one Father Edwards, the priest bearing the serpents, yes. Father Carraway nodded in response and offered a, Yes, Excellency nervously stumbling over his own words. I might have known this day would come again. As you no doubt have realized, this Father Edwards is no priest, nor is he a man, at least not any longer. As fear's chilling grasp began to slowly take hold of him once more, the burning question that had been suppressed by hesitation before now embedded itself in the forefront of Father Carroway's mind and erupted from his lips. What do you mean, Your Excellency? His heart hanging a heavy pendulum of rueful regret and worry, Archbishop Marcus began to enlighten the pair of the unfortunate tragedy that moulded the infancy era of Black Rock Chapel. Before the land that the chapel's foundation rests upon was first consecrated as hallowed soil, it had served as a sanctuary for a coven of gypsy folk. When I first came upon the land, I was, as you were when I tutored you, a pupil under the tutelage of my predecessor, Archbishop Duncan. It was my first journey abroad for the spread of gospel. For a brief moment, Father Carraway's mind, with cursory accuracy, recollected small fragments of his own initial journey abroad before he was commissioned to the status of priest. His recollection of prior ages halted when the Archbishop's voice began again. When we arrived, it was a mere darkened patch of earth that appeared to bear sparse, if any, vegetation, and in its centre a massive dark stone boulder sat in perchance. I remember that. Engraven on its outwardmost surface was the image of some manner of talisman, with two words in the dialect of the gypsies. Tara condemnatilu. The archbishop's face darkened, the aged features of his face beginning to pronounce themselves by shadow. Only long after the grave events that occurred there did I ever learn what those two words meant. For, in our tongue, these words translate as, Land of the Condemned. The dread incubating within Father Carraway tightened its firm grasp on his mind. 
We first wish to establish commerce with them. We thought that, through fellowship, we may convert some of them to the Lord's Gospel. Archbishop Marcus's eyes fell to the ground in a frightened, stoic gaze as a chilled shudder escaped him. We were wrong. His voice was devoid of any emotion, save for petrified trauma. His stare still fixed to the ground beneath, the Archbishop continued in a gravelly voice. Two years passed in harmony, until strange occurrences began. Morbid curiosity bursted Father Carraway, and he queried Archbishop Marcus as to the implications of the occurrences he referred to. At first we simply brushed them off as minute phenomena, events that we wouldn't try to bear real significance to, as they occurred few and far between. With the progression of time, however, the phenomenon became more recurrent and amplified in its malignance. The other priests in our congregation awoke every night in terror and foretelling of unrighteous envisionings, plaguing their sleep, and storms began to grow fierce and unwavering night and day. It was one dusk, however, when our paranoia reached an apex and our goal of peaceful fellowship was abandoned. The cracks of the flames dancing upon the oak, kindling inside the hearth, arrested the mournful stare of the archbishop. Voices. It began with the voices that came to me, whispering all manner of unrighteous blasphemies to me. Night upon night, the ghastly voices beckoned to me, tempting me to partake of the ungodly acts they would describe to me. Though the grace and strength of the Lord willed me to resist them, I began to grow worried, and I recounted my experiences to another apprentice under the former archbishop's study. The archbishop met his gaze once again with the elder priest, the man you named as Father Edwards. And Father Carraway stared in confusion at what he was told. Just before he could question to himself the plausibility of what Archbishop Marcus's implication was, Morbid realization sent a thunderbolt that shook his mind to its innermost foundation. Not a man, not any longer. The words pierced him like a finely sharpened dagger as he began to slowly piece together the connection between the malign hauntings that menaced him in the previous days within the chapel's walls and those recounted from the archbishop's macabre anecdote. Noting the clarity moulding itself to the elder priest's face, Archbishop Marcus continued. He suspected immediately the machinations of the gypsies were at fault. He was certain that their foreign customs had, in some form, wrought evil forces against us. Over time, paranoia became disdain and mistrust, until one grave twilight, the night the blind fear drove us to violence. I will never forget their faces as we came upon them, wielding the instruments that raised their livelihood to ash. Their homes, their shops, everything was set ablaze by the hands of our convent. The archbishop's mouth split into a morbid, dead smile, wholly devoid of any authentic joy. Edwards told me that what we were doing was an exorcism of the land, that our actions were in righteous merit of the Lord's service. A small tear escaped his lifeless eyes and ran down his cheeks. Father Carraway's blood began losing its warmth as he was witnessing the collapse of his former mentor's psyche. They fled the land that night, but not before letting slip an omen. May you all be spared of Degasi. As if mention of the word carried a supernatural force of its own, the hearth exploded outward, the flames dancing upon the oak kindling shifting erratically. If I could have known of the unholy evils we wrought upon ourselves. Archbishop Marcus's lips quivered as he continued. We thought by ridding the land of the gypsy heretics from the soil that the evil would flee with them. What we were too blinded by arrogance to see at the time was that the ones we were swift to drive away were the same whose practices acted not as a weapon against us but to spare us from something far worse. Degasi? Father Carraway queried, more from instinct than genuine curiosity. A sullen nod of the archbishop's head 
coupled with his chiselled expression of recriminatory despair, served to reply this query. Like with what was inscribed upon the stone, I learned only long after what de Garci was. What is it, Excellency? Is it the name of a demon? Father Carraway asked, attempting to recollect the multitude of malign spirits dwelling in the lake of fire that were catalogued in Le Dictionnaire Infernal a volume he was required to devote hours of study to in his apprenticeship under Archbishop Marcus, to find one by the name of de Garci. Archbishop Marcus arose from his seated position and went to his bookshelf and pulled out a volume dressed in dirt and dust, adorned by cobwebs. Father, you misunderstand. De Garci is no demon. Blowing away the concealment provided by the dust on the cover, the volume's cover was revealed to be a faded, yet polished brown hue, leather-bound and bearing no title on the front. The Archbishop fixed himself with his reading lenses and opened the worn volume halfway and began turning further pages until he found the specific page bearing the heading of L'Estimor, Louis de Garcia. Father Carraway gazed intently at the faded page before him, unsure exactly of what to make of the foreign rune scrawled upon the page. Archbishop Marcus placed his index finger upon the passage in question, directing Father Carraway's gaze. When they fled, the coven of gypsies left behind this tome. Archbishop Marcus read the passage that detailed the blestimul Louis de Garcia, the curse of the debased in their tongue. Father Carraway's blood chilled, draining his skin pale as he listened to the Archbishop tell of de Garcia, being the physical manifestation of mankind's condemnation of itself. The memories of the chapel's phenomena abrasively invaded his mind once again, pronouncing emphatically the gratuitous blasphemies the wraiths assaulted him with. The Archbishop further explained that those that fall victim to Degasi do so when they call out to them, seducing them to either embrace whatever sins they've committed that drew the attention of them, or by stripping them of all hope of salvation until their demise were in there to join the ranks of the condemned. As Archbishop Marcus continued reading, the elder priest glanced at the page, when he felt his skin begin to crawl at the sight of the illustration on the page's bottom right corner. The illustration depicted the scene of a man brought to his knees and clutching his forehead as long, black serpents appeared to swarm over his body. The face of the man was craned back to the face of the sky above and was twisted in an expression of perpetual agony. The detail of the image that disturbed Father Carraway, however, was a large, dark, monolithic stone, stood erect, and protruding from the black stone was what looked like a cyclonic whirlwind formed from many faces that appeared conjoined, all of them twisted in the same expression of abject horror and sorrow. Spotting this, Father Carraway felt a drag of nausea grasp firmly to him as the recollection of his nightmare forced itself abrasively into the forefront of his thoughts. How has it been taking the form of Father Edwards? Father Carraway queried, using the question to avoid the malignant event from his mind. The Archbishop fell silent once again, his aged face giving way to its earlier state of mournful despair. As writ in the tome here. Archbishop Marcus began, as he placed his index finger upon the exerting passage he meant to reference, his vocals low and forlorn. De Garci can assume the avatar of any that are of them to walk the earth above. Those chilling words return to Father Carraway. Not a man, not any longer. Utter despair consuming him, Father Carraway gave in to the compulsion to query Archbishop Marcus of how Father Edwards, a servant of the Lord, could have been met with such a fate. We were all lost to righteous arrogance replied Archbishop Marcus. But, Excellency, the elder priest cried out, interrupting the Archbishop's reply, how could that alone condemn a servant of Christ? Well, his pride attracted their attention to him, but it was what he did next that allowed them to consume him. Tears began to run freely down Archbishop Marcus's cheeks. With heavy, shuddering breath, 
The sombre archbishop recollected the event that wrought damnation upon the arrogant priest that Father Carraway once thought of as a brother in faith. The night of the raid, they found him wielding one of the gypsy's own blades against one of the maidens of the common, while well, she begged for her life in her people's tongue, but his murderous judgment was unbound. I called to him, told him to stay his hand. The archbishop froze. His stare became distant, his frightening recollection of the gypsy maiden's screams and the sickening squelch of flesh being penetrated moulded vividly in his mind. A deadly silence hung within the cottage, contested only by the cracks of the kindling beneath the flames that only ever lightly increased in volume. Father Carroway felt himself in a state of fruitless denial at what he was just told, that a fellow servant of the cross was a murderer and had committed himself to the whims of an unspeakable evil that, even now, wears his face. It was then that a horrific realisation revealed itself to him that almost caused him to faint. Who else but Father Edwards could have called the Mass for sermon tonight? Can he be stopped? Sister Meredith queried with a shaking tone of panic seeping into her voice. The young fledgling nun's voice caused the two men to glance at her with mild surprises, until that instant her silence to cause them to forget her presence entirely. Before a reply could be offered, a mass of shrill screams in the distance arrested their attention. The three listened to the sound of many clamouring, stampeding footsteps, accompanied by a collective cacophony of frightened screams. Father Carraway opened the front door of the cottage to reveal that the source of the sounds were of the townsfolk, who had gathered from Mass before, now fleeing Black Rock Chapel for their very lives. The full magnitude of the mortifying display caused the elder priest to fall to his knees in a trance of terror-induced shock. "'Father Carraway!' exclaimed Sister Meredith, as she rushed to him with urgency. Archbishop Marcus exited the cottage into the midst of the chaos. "'What's going on?' the archbishop demanded to a fleeing youth farmhand. "'Monster! In the sanctuary!' cried the farmhand, before pushing past the archbishop. Once his stance was regained, Father Carraway waded through the horde of fleeing congregation until he found Archbishop Marcus once again. "'It's de Garci. It must be. Tonight was Wednesday Mass. It was a trap!' the elder priest exclaimed with staggered breath. With a cold, icy, and stoic glare carved into his aged face, the Archbishop turned to Father Carraway and said, We must destroy the evil of Black Rock. How? Father Carraway queried, remembering his own encounters with the frightening entity and the lack of effect of his holy objects in warding them away. In a grave tone, Archbishop Marcus answered, By fire, this evil was born and through fire, so too shall it die. The two continued pushing through the terrified churchgoers, climbing up the steps and thrusting the chapel's entrance open. Part 4 Inside the hallway to the sanctuary, the clutter of overturned mahogany and discarded crucifix trinkets littered the long, crimson-hued carpet that lined the main hall. The sight that disturbed the town clergymen most about the chaos displayed before them, however, were the empty garments that lay discarded, as if those that formerly bore them had simply vanished. The elder priest froze, the blood flowing through his veins chilled as he witnessed the forms of long, thin serpents extrude their scaly forms from the empty garments. "'Come now, there's no time to lose.' the archbishop shouted as he went to retrieve the frankincense from the drawer that kept the oils and wine regularly used for the occasion of communion. As he retrieved the oil and dismounted two of the candlesticks, Father Carraway remained in place, the malign phenomena burrowing back into his recollections, feeling incapable of acknowledging his partner's voice. The elder priest felt the taunts uttered by the wraiths sink slowly and painfully into his heart. If God's forgiveness is divine, how are we so many that are condemned? No relief in heaven, no damnation in hell, no forgiveness. Salvation is the only lie you spread. They have shown me the truth, Father. There is no salvation. 
were those last two words, the two words that have haunted him for three days and nights, began to repeat as though they were some manner of demented mantra, screaming inside his mind like a chorus of shrieking maidens in great pain. Father Carraway's trance was broken when he felt an object pushed into his chest. Father, are you ready to begin? Archbishop Marcus queried, pushing one of the candlesticks into the centre of Father Carraway's chest. Clarity resuming control of his thoughts, the elder priest replied with a slightly hesitant breath, Yes, I'm ready. Then may we exorcise the evil from Christ's temple, Archbishop Marcus declared, with the blaze of determination raging in his eyes. As they set about dowsing the main hall in the frankincense, crossing each stream they cast upon the surroundings, they began to recite, In nomine Patris et Filii. Et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Until Archbishop Marcus let out a sharp cry of pain that abruptly ended his chanting. Startled, Father Carraway snapped his head in the Archbishop's direction. His jaw slacked numbly as he spotted five of the abhorrent serpents with their fangs fixed firmly within his former mentor's thighs. Archbishop Marcus's eyes were fast and tight, his jaw agape as his face portrayed the sheer inutterable pain that coursed within him in that moment. Father Carraway began to rush to the archbishop's aid, shock and panic moulding into one as he saw his ally forced to his knees in agony. No, Archbishop Marcus screamed out with a strained cry. Stay away. The elder priest halted, despite the fright-induced adrenaline urging him further. His strength waning, the Archbishop summoned the last of his will to let out a straying cry to Father Carraway. It's too late. I'm theirs now. I allowed this evil to birth. Now you must destroy it. Another tortured wail escaped Archbishop Marcus's mouth as the serpents swarmed him, biting and coiling themselves up and around his body and into his gaping mouth. As they burrowed into his throat, he began to let out a series of choking gasps. Before the serpents could overtake him, however, Archbishop Marcus sputtered one last command to the petrified elder priest. You must burn Black Rock Chapel. His eyes rolled back as the breath of life left him, falling fully on his back. Father Carraway's legs felt weak as he watched helplessly as the body of Archbishop Marcus became but a mere squirming mass of dark and crimson. The serpents then dispersed from where the archbishop's body lay. Only the empty, velvet robe remained, and scurried away collectively as though they were answering some summons. His gaze following their flight, Father Carraway saw them slithering back into the sanctuary. Giving pursuit, Father Carraway's eyes met with the embodiment of the horror that tormented the once hallowed ground he stood upon. The abomination stood at the pulpit, arms outstretched as if exerting the very force that beckoned the serpents to it. The head of the abysmal creature was the likeness of the man Father Carraway formerly knew as Father Edwards. The rest of the beast's form, however, was comprised of little more than a writhing mass of faces that appeared twisted in the same expression of unbridled suffering. Father Carraway stood at the entrance to the sanctuary, pale struggling to comprehend the full extent of the unholy terror displayed before him as the multitude of serpents burrowed themselves in the many dark cavernous mouths of the agonized faces that comprised the abomination's form. The tortured faces began to undulate more rapidly, as if attempting to breach through the flesh confining them, until a new addition began to mold itself into the center of the abomination's chest region. In anguish, Father Carraway cried out, No! when he witnessed the agonized face of his former mentor take form in the monstrosity's flesh. As he fell to his knees, stripped of his will, he felt as though he were once again in the nightmare, now with no relief of waking from it. Now you see the truth, brother. Even the pious cannot be forgiven. The voice, though uttered singly by the false likeness of Father Edwards, bore an ethereal quality to it that wholly devoided its resemblance to that of the human. Haunting familiarity struck the elder priest's ears when the voice of a young man, though still inhuman in nature, chided to him, Ah, the truth stands before you. No salvation. 
He realized this to be the distorted vocals of the young adolescent from the confessional. The eyes of the false priest's likeness rolled back unnaturally into the skull and distended its jaws, regurgitating a large, squirming legion of black serpents. They slithered in haste to claim the elder priest. Father Carraway, witnessing this physical incarnation of horror, almost resigned himself to his fate. When he remembered the candlestick, he still wielded it. Oh, the frankincense! He nearly shouted aloud, holding his tongue, however, so as to not reveal his plan to the monster. With renewed hope, Father Carraway found himself to his feet. Out of the dark orifices of the mass of twisted faces, more dark serpents came forth. Running to the empty velvet robe, Father Carraway retrieved the half-empty jar of the holy oil and proceeded to douse the sanctuary. Triumphantly, he raised the candle aloft, ready to set the room ablaze when a succession of sharp pains shot through his left leg. He looked down to see that a serpent had fixed its fangs within him. Within less than seconds, Father Carraway once again felt the venom's crippling effects beginning to claim him. His head throbbed and his vision began to fail him. Nausea finally stripped his legs of his ability to stand, forcing him to collapse. As the serpents began to overtake him, Father Carraway, with the last of his strength, raised the jar of frankincense and doused himself. In a weakened breath, the elder priest uttered, Though I walk in the shadow of the valley of death, thy rod and thy staff, they will comfort me. I will fear no... His defiant speech was cut short as two of the serpents forced themselves into his throat. Just before the serpents would take him, Father Carraway thrusted the candle's flame upon himself, setting himself and the serpents ablaze. The scorched serpents hissed as they fled hastily from the elder priest's burning body. In their panic, the burning serpents slithered to the spaces dredged in the frankincense, igniting them. Within mere minutes, the entirety of the sanctuary was an inferno. The agonized faces fixed within the abomination's flesh began to shriek in a uniform cacophony of pain as the searing grasp of the flames came upon them. As the abomination's flesh charred, the mass of faces began to protrude further from the form until breaking free of the flesh that held them bound, sending forth a cyclone of wailing apparitions that swarmed the burning sanctuary. All through the night, the flames gutted Black Rock Chapel. When the sun rose, naught was left but hot, smouldering rubble. Seven sunsets passed with many of the folk attempting to speculate and ponder what had happened that night. I heard some bloody priest went mad, set the damn chapel on fire, himself included, exclaimed a young man to the bartender. Why? You're spouting fouler smelling shit than what my farmhands used to grow my crops with, the bartender retorted with a hearty laugh. Scoff all you want. I know what I heard. I know the truth. Oh, do you now? uttered the patron, seated upon the neighboring barstool. The young lad was taken aback by the somewhat abrupt and unexpected query by his mute neighbor. Well, sure, the young man finally replied with an uneasy chuckle. The stranger looked at the lad, locking the nervous eyes with his own cold gaze. The young lad saw that, despite appearing twice his own age, full dark brunette hair and a young youthful face, the stranger also appeared clad in a dark robe, similar to what the young lad had seen worn by preachers. Say, uh, you wouldn't happen to be a priest, would you? The stranger's mouth parted upward on the left corner in dry amusement. I was, once, he said in the same dry tone nearly devoid of emotion. But then I learned the truth. The young lad, suspecting some manner of bluff, challenged him. Is that right? Now, what would that be, holy man? Still bearing the same devious grin, the supposed former priest told the young man to follow him behind the tavern if he wished to be bestowed with the truth he offered. Well, the young man obliged and followed as a pig to slaughter. Within seconds, the lad's confident arrogance was replaced with sheer terror, as the stranger opened his robe to reveal a writhing mass of tortured faces of pain branded into his flesh. Like you, the stranger began. I was too arrogant to accept the truth, but I know now. It's as they told me. Salvation is only the lie we spread. 
We're all condemned in the end. The former priest displayed a menacingly joyous smile as a horde of black and crimson scaled serpents silenced the young lad's scream. Blobster. Amber was admiring the sunset as she walked along the beach. It was her nightly routine, a way to clear her mind from the events of the day. She was always an active person, so it had upset her that she'd had to take a job behind a desk. Not only that, but looking at her computer screen for hours made her eyes tight. It was when she could hardly stay awake on the drive home that she realized she needed to do something else. If she'd known that being a marine biologist would mean sitting behind a desk so much, she would have chosen a different career path. She was almost to her turnaround point, an old wharf that had been mostly reclaimed by the waves, when she saw something lying on the sand. At first she thought it was a huge pile of trash, but as she got closer she could tell it was some kind of organic matter. This caused her to jog over to it, fearing that a baby whale had washed ashore. When she got to it, she saw it clearly wasn't a baby whale, or anything she'd ever seen before. The thing was a huge mass of flesh, over twenty feet long. Thick black-brown skin encased it like an armour. There was no discernible difference from its body or head. It was just a large barrel-shaped blob of meat and tissue. It was definitely organic, though. Amber had no doubt about that. Her heart started to beat like a drum as she got close enough to touch it. This could be a perfect find, a find that could propel her career. With only being on the workforce for three months, she'd really be making a name for herself. Her reaction was to call Raoul, tell him what she'd found, and go from there. Hey, Raoul answered, finally decided that going out to dinner with me would be a good idea. A smile broke across Amber's lips. She liked Raoul. He was a good-looking man that could make her laugh easily but for some reason she'd always brushed off his offers to take her out. She always told herself that it was because he was only playing with her, but she knew that wasn't true. The truth was that she enjoyed playing with men, she always had. No, she said, chuckling. I think you should come over here, though. I have something I want to show you. Whoa, you're inviting me to your house already, but you won't let me take you on a date? I mean, that's a first. I mean, I'm fine with it if that's what you want to do. Oh, it's not like that. You don't have a chance. She juggled again to ensure he knew it was all in good fun. Oh, I found something on the beach, and I don't know what it is. I was hoping that maybe you could help me identify it. Is it treasure? I've always wanted to find treasure on the beach, but those damn pirates never hid their treasure where it's easy to find. No, it's not treasure. At least, not the kind you're thinking of. It's some kind of animal that washed ashore. I don't know what it is or how to deal with it, and for all I know, it could be a new species. Really? Oh, nice. Right, I'm on the way. And with that, they got off the phone. Amber was thinking about how nice Raoul had been to her since she started working at the aquarium. He was her senior, but he never made her bored or put too much stress on her. In fact, everyone in the aquatic health department had a good disposition, and Amber thought it was because of Raoul. He'd always treated his co-workers well, but... He always favoured the opposite sex. Of the six females that worked with him, at the same pay grade or below at least, Amber was the only one he hadn't slept with. In his mind, she would succumb to his charm before the end of the quarter. So when she'd called him over to the house, he figured she'd give it up. By the time he arrived, the sun had completely faded into the sea, so at first he only saw the shadow of a massive thing, next to the shadow of a person. With their phones, they were able to examine the creature on the beach a little before Raoul gave it a name. This is a blobster, he said. I've never seen one before, but I've heard about them. They're normally just the carcass of a whale that washes ashore. Although, this one is rather large and doesn't smell like it's decomposing. I'm going to call some other people and we'll get this back to our lab. Looks like you and I are going to be doing something other than looking at bacteria tomorrow. He flashed her a quick smile, and then walked off to make his call. In minutes, he was back with her, standing next to the body. I called Johnny, Rachel, and Dennis to come help us move this thing. Knowing them, they'll show up with a group of people each, and a couple of kegs, so it's fine if you come in late tomorrow. 
He gave her a wink and she smiled. Raoul then went back to the blobster and examined it with a flashlight on his phone. Hmm, this is kind of strange though, he said as he rubbed his hand across it. Whale skin is thick. I mean, it has to be, but this feels more like an exoskeleton than the skin of a whale. See how the skin is rough and rigid? Even with the barnacles, a whale skin isn't like that. They waited for an hour before the first of their co-workers, Rachel, showed up. She gave her all a hug, and for a brief moment, Amber thought she gave her a look of disdain before hugging her as well. She called back to the bank she climbed over, and another three people came walking over the hill. Two of them were carrying coolers, and the other had flashlights. So, this is the carcass that washed up, Rachel said, pointing the beam of her flashlight on it. Sure is, Amber replied. You want to see it up close? Honey, I'm going to be helping you move this thing. I'll have plenty of time to get up close and look at it. She changed her attention to Raoul once more. So, who else is coming? Raoul reached into one of the coolers and pulled out a beer. Oh, Johnny and Dennis. Oh, great, Rachel said. Every time Johnny comes around, he drinks all my beer. Not only that, he brings shit he knows I won't drink, so he doesn't have to share with me. Johnny and Dennis arrived shortly after, and as Raoul predicted, each had brought a keg with them. Not only did they bring more beer, which was a relief to Rachel because she didn't have enough for everyone, but they also brought five friends with them bringing their total to 18 people to move the blobster. Johnny was carrying a huge canvas tarp, which he threw on the ground when he got to the party waiting by the blobster. Yeah, what's up, guys? He said, giving everyone a hug. I didn't think I'd be seeing you guys again tonight. Just thought it was going to be these guys. He spun around to point at the people that had come with him, his dreadlocks whipping around with his head. Raoul told them the same thing about not being on time in the morning. Then Johnny and Dennis started laying out the tarp so the group could push the carcass onto it. They'd heard it work before, so they figured it was worth a shot. Wow, Dennis said as he tried to gauge the blobster's mass. Do you really think we're going to be able to move this thing by ourselves? Well, should be, Raoul said. Amber finished her first beer and was feeling ready for this. But before they got started, they all decided that another beer would be best. That turned into two, which turned into five. Ugh, Rachel said. This thing is disgusting. I should have brought some gloves. I'm going to be cleaning this slime off my hands for a week. First, they tried to move all of the remains onto the tarp at once. Everyone was spaced so they could have the entire thing being pushed at once. But after the first few tries of that, they decided it would be easier to try and move it by halves. The water was lapping at their sneakers, which caused Rachel to complain about that, too. Oh, damn it, she said. These sneakers are new. Now I'm going to have to wash them, and shoes never feel the same after they're washed. And, oh, we've been pushing this thing for at least half an hour now. Have we made any progress? No. Still a massive carcass sitting in the exact same place. You guys may be enjoying this, but I'm certainly not. Amber rolled her eyes when Rachel started talking. Johnny walked away to the keg, making it look like he was going to refill his cup, even though he still hadn't drained it since the last time he'd filled it. Dennis was the only one who spoke up. Listen, he said. I understand you don't like doing this. Well, I don't like doing this, but something that needs to be done. If we don't remove this carcass now, then it'll still be here, rotting in the morning. It'll be a feasting ground for all sorts of lovely parasites and scavengers. And I, for one, don't want to come back tomorrow and try and move this thing when it really starts to stink. Because you know who they're going to call, don't you? Us. Rachel stopped complaining so much after that. And she started drinking twice as much. It took them a couple of hours to get the first half of the gigantic body onto the tarp. Between people falling down, the breaks they took, and the size of the creature, everyone was happy with their progress. Oh, this thing's pretty impressive, Dennis said, looking at the massive body. I mean, the carcass seems to be fully intact. Most of the blobsters I've seen are either just a large piece of flesh that came from a whale, or nothing more than bones, but this... This is wholly intact. The only damage it seems to have taken is that one bit down the centre. He was referring to a long scar that ran from one side of the carcass to the other. It was wide, but compared to the girth of the thing, it didn't seem so big. Dennis turned to Raoul and said, You know, I don't think this is a whale at all. 
I think we've just discovered a new species. Like a giant armoured sea slug or something. The two men looked at the blobster and thought about it for a moment. After a long drinking break, they decided it was time to move the other half of the carcass onto the tarp. Everyone was pushing as hard as they could. Some were laughing as they tried in vain to gain purchase in the sand. But once it got moving, it didn't seem to be as hard. But sadly, they only got it halfway onto the tarp before they needed a break. Oh, take back what I said, Dennis said between heavy breaths. It's not so impressive, it's just a bitch. When everyone had sobered up a little, Raoul told them to hold off the drinking until they'd finished the job, and caught their breath, they started to push again. It seemed to be going easier this time, until the thing moved. Everyone jumped back from it, fearing the huge mass of meat would fall on them. What the hell was that? Johnny yelled. Oh, I just started rolling back, Raoul answered. We we're lucky it didn't come back too far. Nah, man. I didn't feel like it was rolling. It felt like it came from inside. It felt like that thing took a breath. Oh, don't be ridiculous, Rachel said. This thing's dead. Couldn't have taken a breath. Not to mention it lived in the sea. It hasn't been able to breathe for hours. You know that just as well as any of us. I also know that whales are mammals that breathe air, Johnny rebutted. This is some kind of mammal. It's possible it could still be alive which would mean this is not the remains of any whale, but something new. Uh, it could have come from the inside of this thing, Raoul said. If the bacteria inside had started to decompose the carcass, it would make gas bubbles, which could cause it to look and feel like it's breathing. Or there could even be some parasite or scavenger feasting inside of it. Maybe it just repositioned itself. Johnny looked around the group. It appeared that only a few of them accepted the notion that it wasn't a breath, but bacteria or a parasite. The looks on some of the faces were of confusion and fear, which would hopefully provide enough force to move the last bit of this carcass under the tarp. After an hour or so, the entire body was on the canvas. Dennis, why don't you call a tow truck and get this thing to the lab? Raoul said. I'm going to walk Amber to our house and head over to the lab, and we'll meet you there. Rachel looked appalled for the briefest of moments. She hoped that Raoul didn't notice, which he didn't, but Amber did. Amber knew what Rachel was thinking, that Raoul was going to try and score with her. And, well, how Amber was feeling, he wouldn't have had to try too hard. The walk home didn't take as long as she thought it would take. By the time they'd finished their beers, they'd arrived at Amber's house. Well, Rachel had a right to feel that Raoul was going to try and get into her pants, he was talking smoothly to her the entire walk home, and by the time they reached the house, she was inviting him in. Well, if Amber was asked what happened, they made love, and it was great. It wasn't too gentle, but not rough, either. And if Raoul was asked, he would say he got some. He'd had better, and he'd had worse. He wasn't sure if it was going to be a one-night stand or not. He hadn't made up his mind. She wasn't bad enough to make him not want to do it again, but he also didn't want to be tied down. There were always more fish in the sea. Well, by the time they were passing where the blobster had washed up, they saw the tow truck arriving. Its yellow lights flooded the dark streets. Luckily no one was near the streets, and we didn't want anyone to know that they were only leaving now. The truck arrived at the aquarium twenty minutes after them. That gave them enough time to get a large gurney to transfer the blobster onto and have the doors open for easy transportation. They would keep it in one of the freezers, the same ones they used to preserve the whales for study. With the help of the driver, they were able to roll the thing onto the gurney from the flatbed in an hour and a half. The driver was by far the biggest of the bunch, so everyone was thankful he was willing to help out. Raoul gave him a fifty as a tip, and thanked him again for helping before he drove back out into the night. Everyone helped push the gurney up the ramp and into the freezer. Even though the gurney had wheels, it was still a laborious task. It took almost all the energy everyone had left just to get it up the ramp, but by three in the morning, the gurney and the blobster were safely locked in the largest freezer in the lab. Raoul stayed behind, bidding everyone a good night as they left. There was no way anyone was going to be making it in before noon the next day, so he didn't feel the need to rush. Not to mention, 
He also had to take Amber back to her house, and maybe, if he played his cards right, he'd be spending the night with her. There was some paperwork that needed to be filled out, which he got halfway through and decided it was a job for the next day. He also checked to ensure the temperature in the freezer was at a stable level. Seeing the lab was low on liquid nitrogen, he put an order in for some more canisters. Dennis arrived at the lab at around 3.30. Everyone else was either still sleeping or far too hungover to even start to make their way to the lab. Dennis didn't really feel like being there either, and when he noticed that he was the only person who'd showed up, he contemplated leaving. He decided that it was best to stay there. As he walked through the lab, he was thinking about whether or not he should have just stayed at home. Seeing that he was the first one there, he thought that none of his co-workers would be coming in, so he'd stay for an hour or so, and then leave if no one else arrived. His mind drifted back to the blobster. Maybe he would stay longer and do some tests, get some samples. That thing was just too damn interesting to be ignored. So the first place he went to was the cooler to get the blobster into the lab where he could start working on it. But when he opened the door, his heart sank to his shoes. The blobster was missing. The canvas tarp was still on the gurney, but the creature it held was gone. It was far too big for someone to just carry it out of there. But why would they have left the gurney and tarp? Something was wrong. Dennis spun on his heels, pulling his phone from his pocket. He needed to talk to Raoul about this. He'd have some idea of what to do. As soon as he started searching his recent calls, a voice sounded in his head. It wasn't a voice he'd ever heard before, not his conscience, or his own. It was soft and calming. Dennis looked around the room to see if he could identify where the voice was coming from, but there was no one in the cooler with him. In fact, he looked around the lab, but it was empty. You don't need to call them, the voice said. Well, despite feeling the urgency of the situation, Dennis put his phone back into his pocket. That's good. Why don't you come back into the freezer? That's a good man. Dennis was standing in the center of the freezer when he noticed the blobster. At first he didn't know what it was, or if the thing was even real. Well, it was massive, but it didn't look like the barrel-shaped mass they'd moved last night. But seeing the thing stuck to the wall and ceiling, Dennis regained control of his body. The first thing he did was move towards the back of the cooler, and the blobster was near the door. Dennis tried to clear his mind, but the voice was still impinging. You shouldn't think like that. I just want you to help me. You see me and it frightens you, but you frighten me just as much. Can I trust you to help me? Dennis couldn't believe what was happening. The blobster seemed to have changed its shape and was clinging to the wall, sending thoughts to him even though its massive maw wasn't moving. Man has made life difficult for me and my kind. All life, in fact. So we would like to make our lives easier again. If it wasn't for man, the waters would be clean, the forests wouldn't be destroyed, and the earth wouldn't be unfit to sustain life as it once was. Humankind has been a blight on the world. I need you to help me cure that. The blobster started to move. Its wide, wing-shaped arms slowly started to peel from the wall. Dennis knew there wasn't any time to delay and ran for the door. He made it three steps out of the freezer when a sharp pain shot through his body, so strong that it paralyzed him. The pain caused him to become as stiff as a board. He looked down but couldn't see anything. His hands groped behind him and felt a hard, slimy tube going into his back. A few seconds later, that same tube ripped through his chest. In his last few seconds of life, as the tube was pulled out with enough force to spin him around before he fell, Dennis's eyes caught the thing that had stabbed him in the back. It was the blobster's tail. As Dennis was dying, Raoul was putting some pants on and walking to Amber's kitchen. Amber was at the stove, cooking bacon and eggs, and she looked beautiful. He walked up behind her and kissed her on the nape of her neck, 
And as he did, she nuzzled up to him, and they stood there for a moment. He was feeling something more for this woman, something he hadn't felt before. They ate their breakfast, got cleaned and ready for the day, and Raoul started to call his underlings to tell them it was now time to head over to the lab. Everyone answered but Dennis. Raoul thought that was strange. He was the person that he thought would be the easiest to get a hold of. He tried calling again while they were driving to the lab, but, but still it had only gone to voicemail. Oh, looks like Dennis isn't going to be coming in today, he told Amber. Bastard's probably too hungover to answer his phone. Johnny was getting out of his car when Amber and Raoul pulled in. I didn't expect you to get here for at least another hour, Raoul said as he stepped out of his car. Man, I've had a lot of crazy nights in the past. That's just another one to add to the list. Besides, I want to take a look at that thing with a clear head in some good lighting. What Dennis said last night got me thinking. Maybe it's not a whale. As the three of them were walking into the lab, Rachel pulled in. They stopped and waited for her to get to the door. Okay, Raoul said as they all stood before the door. We all know what our focus is going to be on today, so let's not get too carried away. We'll all still leave at the same time. Try to preserve some of the specimen. If it turns out to be something besides a whale, I'd like to keep it intact so we can identify it. It'd be great if we found a new species, so let's keep our fingers crossed. And after his little speech, he opened the door. The stainless steel shone in the fluorescent lighting. Raoul frowned. Hey, I, um, turned these lights off last night, didn't I? He asked Amber. She nodded her head as she looked around the room, noticing the tanks of nitrogen and pointing them out. That's probably the people who brought in the nitro. A smile broke across Raoul's lips as he realized she was most likely right. But that thought flared when he saw the freezer was open. Oh, who the fuck came in here? He said as he ran towards the door. Oh, if someone took our specimen, I'm gonna... He couldn't finish his sentence when he looked into the freezer. Dennis's lifeless body lay in the middle of it, a trail of blood smeared on the floor, showing where he was dragged. Amber, call the cops. Raoul said, without taking his eyes off the body. When the rest of the crew heard this, they ran over towards him. Amber was the first, and she gagged and then started crying. Johnny and Rachel were right behind her. Johnny looked at the carnage and couldn't take his eyes from it. Rachel saw the blood stain and didn't want to see any more, so she walked with Amber to the phone. Raoul, we need to make sure that whoever did this isn't still in the lab. Johnny said. If they are, we could all be in danger. Raoul nodded but didn't move. His eyes drifted from the lifeless body of Dennis to the empty gurney which had held the blobster. He could feel the heat rise in his cheeks as anger filled his body. The cold air blowing from the freezer did nothing to cool him down. Oh, they took the specimen, he said in a hollow voice. It was so soft that Johnny barely heard him. What? They took the specimen, Raoul repeated. Johnny looked back in and saw the blobster was missing. That's not important right now, man. Dennis is dead. For all we know, the person who did this is still somewhere on the site. Hell, they could still be in the lab. Think about the girls, man. What if that person attacks them? They're not in any shape to be fighting someone off. Shit, I don't think we really are either, but we have to make sure it's safe in here. Raoul slowly turned around and nodded again. They started walking through the room, Johnny grabbing a scalpel to protect himself. Raoul just walked through the lab slowly. His eyes were wide, but he wasn't really seeing anything. It was like he was walking through a dream. He could tell there were things in front of him, but he didn't know what they were, nor did he care. Amber and Rachel got to the phone. After a few deep breaths, Amber grabbed hold of the phone and took it off the receiver. She started dialing 911, but stopped after the first number. She heard a voice. It didn't sound like Rachel, but she knew it couldn't have been anyone else. Put the phone down, the voice said. What? Amber said, turning towards Rachel. What? Rachel said. 
Why aren't you calling the cops? Oh, I, uh, I thought you just said something. I must be out of it. Sorry. Amber then turned back to the phone and heard the voice again. You don't need to call the police. There's no one you don't know in the room. If you call them, they'll come out here and find nothing out of place besides a dead body. And who do you think they'll question? You'll be taken to jail if you call them. Put the phone down. The voice became sterner as it kept talking to her. Amber put the phone down. What, what the hell are you doing? Rachel said. What, you didn't hear that voice. Well, I didn't hear anything. If you're going crazy, you'd better let me talk to the cops. No, Amber said, urgency in her tone. If we call the cops, we'll all be arrested. I don't... I can't be taken to jail right now. It would just be too much. Rachel looked at her, her eyes narrowing. Why would they take us to jail? Are you the one that did this? Amber wanted to shake her, to get her to understand how important it was just to leave the scene, but at the same time she didn't understand why she was thinking like that. There was definitely a reason why she was scared of going to jail, even though she hadn't done anything wrong. She just wasn't sure what she was worrying about. No, I d didn't do anything, Amber said. I was with Raoul last night. He can verify that. Rachel looked at Amber, her distaste visible. She's going to try and blame you for this, the voice said. You should kill her. What? Amber shrieked. Rachel slowly backed away from Amber, never taking her eyes off of her. Johnny looked over, his eyes wide, but when he saw the two women, he returned to his search. Amber, I think you should just step away from the phone. I can call the cops, and you can just wait over in the corner while I do that. Rachel's voice was shaky and slow, and Amber shook her head. It was like she was saying no to what Rachel had asked, which caused Rachel to run towards the men as they searched the lab. In reality, she was trying to figure out what she'd been hearing. It was all too confusing, and for the first time in her life, she felt that the only way to clear her mind would be to shake her head. It did nothing but make her look even crazier. Realizing that the voice was in her head, it meant something that had snapped at seeing Dennis dead on the floor. Once more, she lifted the receiver and started to dial the number for the cops. You will rot in a cell. The voice said as soon as she lifted the receiver. Your life will never be the same. When Amber ignored the voice, it was very hard not to listen to it. Every word it said carried a weight that seemed to push her into a depression, the likes of which she'd never felt. But slowly, as she spoke to the dispatcher, the voice became panicked, angry. The blobster trying to gain control over the situation had changed his tactic. He decided that Raoul would be a better prospect. You need to kill her, it said, as demanding as it could. Raoul paused for a moment. An image of Amber flashed through his mind. He knew what he'd been told to do, but he wasn't able to do anything other than stare at a chip in a floor tile. Fine, the blobster said. I'll do it myself. Everything happened so fast after that. Even as it was happening, Amber wasn't able to process it until it was far too late for a safe escape. Rachel was speaking with Raoul, who seemed to be dazed. The dispatcher was asking for her location for the third time and telling her to stay on the phone. Johnny had just gone into the freezer, and once he was in there he screamed and started running full speed for the door. Raoul and Rachel looked up from their conversation. Johnny was running for the door, screaming incoherently. It wasn't until he was halfway through when something burst from the freezer after him. The thing was massive. A long tail dragged on the floor as it floated overhead. It had wings that resembled that of a manta ray, only much, much larger. It was hard to tell where the head started and where it stopped, because there was a mouth that ran vertically between the wings at about half their width. In the mouth were teeth that were at least three inches long, about as wide as a steak knife and as sharp as a shark's teeth. 
On the wings, suckers could be seen, and a large claw on the end of each wing. Amber, Rachel and Raoul watched as the thing swam through the air like it was water. Amber froze, lowering the phone slowly as she watched the thing. Rachel and Raoul ran towards the door as they watched. Johnny wasn't watching at all. His eyes were locked on the door. He was focused on where he was headed. But the thing landed in front of the door before he could reach it. His massive wings only a few feet from Amber. Johnny tried to stop running, but because he was going full speed, his feet slipped from under him, which caused him to land on his back. He slid to a stop not ten feet from the thing's open mouth. He scrambled to his feet and ran backwards towards the freezer. Amber followed suit. She tried to put as much distance between herself and the monster before it noticed her. She made it to the group and ran into Raoul's arms and cried as he held her. The blobster started to make its way slowly towards them, crawling on the floor with its wings. Johnny had just gotten behind Raoul as the blobster had gotten to the middle of the room. Raoul shoved Amber to the floor and told everyone to run. Amber looked up in horror. Raoul turned and started to run away from the monster, but Johnny caught him and shoved him back. His feet caught on Amber and he stumbled in front of the blobster. He didn't even have time to turn around before the blobster lifted itself on its wings. And those huge teeth sank into Raoul, cutting him in half. His right arm and eye twitched as the electric signals from his brain slowly stopped. Amber made it back to her feet and ran to join the other two. The dispatcher heard the commotion and sent three squad cars to the aquarium. She kept trying to get someone to answer her, but everybody wasn't able to hear her over the din from the recent events. Amber couldn't believe what had just happened. That Raoul had tried to feed her to the monster. That he just tried to kill her. Oh, her head was spinning so fast, and everything was happening so fast. Tears streamed down her cheeks and into her mouth. She gagged a few times and then spewed her breakfast all over the tile floor. Johnny was pushing her towards the wall, yelling something that Amber couldn't understand. Rachel was already hiding behind the nitrogen canisters, yelling for them to hurry. Amber couldn't focus enough to even realize how much danger she was in, but slowly her surroundings were starting to make sense again. Move! Rachel screamed at the two of them, tears streaming down her face. Rachel was trembling. Her arms and legs felt numb, her eyes wide to take in her surroundings. She was aware of what was happening. The man that she had loved for the past three years, the man she couldn't let go, had just tried to sacrifice someone to save himself. If Raoul had survived... There would have been no way she could have still loved him. Still, it was a hard loss to take, watching the death of someone she loved, even after a despicable act. It was a one-two punch of heartache, and she wasn't ready for it. Johnny shoved Amber to the wall, and Rachel pulled her behind the canisters as she picked up one. As he turned, the long tail of the blobster came darting through the air at Johnny's chest. On impulse, Johnny raised his hand. The canister came up with his hands and the tail punctured the metal. And for the first time, the monster made a noise. A noise that everyone in the room could hear at the same time. It was a high-pitched squeal, so loud it made the three feel their eardrums would rupture. Johnny then turned sharply to run behind the canisters, but he never let go of the tank. As he turned, the end of the blobster's tail was cracked, causing it to scream again. The tail thrashed back and forth, ripping the canister free from Johnny's hands. A fine spray landed on his chest, freezing his shirt and burning him. Well, that gave him an idea. He picked up another tank, unscrewed the lid with trembling fingers and walked towards the blobster, raising it as he went. Rachel and Amber screamed for Johnny to join them behind the tanks. He didn't listen. He just kept walking, slowly quietly towards the blobster. The girls knew he wasn't going to listen to them, so instead of trying to get him to hide with them, they started to unscrew the lids of the other nitrogen canisters. This was what caught the blobster's attention. It turned towards the group, its massive mouth opening as it did. Johnny started to lift the canister and was going to throw it at the monster, when the hook on its wing came down. 
plunged into his collarbone next to his neck and burst through his chest. Johnny screamed as the wing lifted him off his feet, high into the air. The blobster opened its mouth and started to lower Johnny towards those sharp, serrated teeth. Despite how quickly it was all happening, Johnny was able to find the time to pour the nitrogen into his open gullet. The smoking liquid splashed down the monster's throat, causing it to convulse. Its wings fell to the ground, pinning Johnny to the floor. He pulled at the claw frantically, first trying to pull it all the way through his collarbone, but realized he couldn't, so he tried to pull it out from the wing that had pressed against his neck. His hand slipped from the claw and the blobster fell on top of him, crushing him like a roach. And the women saw their opportunity and started splashing the open canisters of liquid nitrogen onto the body of the blobster. A glossy sheen of ice started to form over the monster's body. Stop! the voice shouted. And this time both Amber and Rachel heard it. I can give you everything you want. I can help you achieve your dreams. Please stop throwing that stuff on me. Amber didn't stop. She emptied one canister and grabbed another. Rachel paused only for a moment before she too grabbed another canister and started pouring the last of the liquid nitrogen onto the creature. Its entire body was covered with a layer of ice, and the woman looked at it in disbelief for a moment. I'm so cold, the voice said. Please, I am the last of my kind. I only want to survive, just like you. Fuck you, Rachel said as she hefted an office chair over her head and slammed it down on the ice-covered blobster. The ice and meat below it fissured into a spider web of cracks, revealing red meat under the thick brownish-black skin. Another high squeal resonated in the room, but Rachel didn't stop hitting the thing. Amber saw that what she was doing was having an effect on the monster, so she took the empty canister she was holding and smashed it down on the creature too. Stop! 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 The monster called to them. It was at that moment when the police burst through the door, guns drawn. Shoot that fucking thing! Both Amber and Rachel shouted in unison. And they ran to the police, and the police heard this inhuman squeal. Without hesitation, they opened fire on the blobster. The bullets ripped through the ice and flesh of it, leaving grapefruit-sized exit wounds. All three of the officers had emptied their clips into the blobster, and it was a few moments after the last shots were fired that the squeal stopped. With wide eyes, the cops each reloaded their clips and emptied them once again into the blobster. As the coroner was processing the dead bodies recovered from the scene, he was disturbed by the report of an animal that was able to create that much havoc. It was one of the worst cases he'd ever seen. The cause of death was easy to determine for each of the victims, but he still had to process the bodies, or what was left of them. There was no way that Raoul was going to have an open casket funeral. He would be the last to be examined. Dennis was the first. The cause of death? The huge hole in his chest. It wasn't until halfway through the exam that the doctor noticed something unusual happening. Dennis's stomach was boiling. He moved his face closer to see what it was, pressing slightly on one of the bubbles as they surfaced. It was hard and wiggled under his gloved hand. As he took notes of this strange phenomenon, three baby blobsters ruptured Dennis's stomach. They squealed as they latched onto the doctor's back and he screamed as their sharp teeth dug into him. Slowly, a few more came crawling out. The egg sac was still attached to the tail of the last one that freed itself from the corpse. The Grey City Tales Sanitation Ever wonder what goes on behind the scenes in your town? city or village. Well, if you're in a bustling metropolis, or a little Maybury-like speck of a place, like I mean, nothing too interesting, but if you're in a city just big enough to have places to hide, but small enough to avoid too much scrutiny from the outside, well, that's another story. I call them grey cities. What is a grey city? Well, 
Simply put, it's a place that sticks to very traditional methods of infrastructure. You see, the Industrial Revolution, for the most part, was a well-organized distraction for the real reason productivity suddenly skyrocketed. At one point, every city used the old ways, but as it became harder to hide the unpalatable aspects of these methods, they'd fallen into disuse. But some still reap the rewards of doing things the old-fashioned way. And that brings us to who I am. Well, you can think of me as a combination of historian, anthropologist, and zoologist. I have dedicated my life to cataloguing people's experiences with the entities in the great cities, combing the internet, underground magazines, and any other source of information for other interactions. And today, I'm bringing you the story of Jason, a gentleman who got caught up in a really shitty situation. An encounter that would make any person flush. Oh, and, uh, on a personal note, would really piss me off. So, Greytown Tales, Sanitation. Jason, there's something in the toilet. My little brother, Cowl, who may be the most obnoxious ten-year-old on earth, screeches. I bet I can guess what it is. Look, just deal with it, I yell back, trying to get a couple of hours of work from home done. Remote computer repair, in case you're wondering. Well, my name's Jason. Let's avoid last names, as I'm uh, currently in need of anonymity. I'm 22, and live at home with my mother and kid brother. Mum doesn't leave her room much, less so since the pandemic. Severe back injuries tend to have that effect on people. Jason, it's bad. His voice reaches levels of squeak I didn't think possible as I get up and make my way to the bathroom. What I see is a shit paloptic vision that stuns me so much, I take five seconds to notice the physical punch of a smell that slams into me five feet from the doorframe. The walls are splattered with a deep reddish-brown substance that's only poop in the best-case scenario. The toilet is overflowing with a steady stream of similarly coloured fluid that I'll generously call water. My brother's dripping, looking at me like he just ran ten miles through a muddy field. What in the hell did you do? I yell. Nothing, I swear. I was just going to use it and then this happened. He replies petulantly. Uh, that's not how it works, but There's one solution here. Plunge the thing. I refuse to set foot in there. I say in my, I pay half the mortgage tone. He starts to reply and thinks better of it. He grabs the plunger and suddenly stumbles back. Oh God, there's a rat in there, he says, looking to me with a crap-covered, shocked expression that would be hilarious if I couldn't smell it. Oh, there isn't a rat, I say, monotone, pointing to the toilet. Now the kid begins to plunge, brown, flotsam-infested water flowing over the rim in septic waves. Well, if I didn't see it, I'd probably have rolled my eyes and told him to keep plunging. But I caught a glimpse of something. Squat and brown spring up, lightning quick, and take a small piece from Cowell's arm. Get out of there, I say, with a combination of concern and shock. I send him to the downstairs bathroom to shower. The wound isn't bad, but I'm sure being covered in raw sewage wouldn't do it any favours. I run into the kitchen, opening drawers and trying to find something appropriate for dispatching a toilet rodent. I settle on a pair of garden gloves, a kitchen knife, and a steel potato masher. I'm sure there are a dozen household item combinations that could have worked better, but in a rush, Angry Chef was about as good as my equipment was going to get. I step into the feces-coated bathroom and fight the urge to gag. I almost lose this fight as I step into a pile of something that has a texture that could only be described as uncomfortably oily. Keep my eye on the toilet. The top layer of scum and water is moving, but it's just as lightly the overflowing water as whatever took a piece of my brother. I hesitantly kick the toilet, and there's a splash in the bowl. I catch another glimpse of whatever is in there and try and track it by its shadow to no avail. I take in a steadying breath and drive the potato masher into the filthy water. 
when I catch a full face of the reeking liquid, but I feel something. I try to trap it between the masher and the bowl, but whatever it is, it's quick and slippery. I drop the masher and try my luck with the knife, stabbing at random, hoping to get lucky and skewer the thing. I feel a violent tug on my glove, try to pull back, but somehow whatever this is holds me there. I could slip out of the glove, but that would mean not only dropping the knife, but exposing my bare hand to this slightly diseased thing. Pull back with all my strength, not asking myself how something the size of a king can can manage a grip like this on a sheer surface. But I didn't need to, really. Well, I don't see the ass end of the thing, but I get a good look at its head, and I suddenly doubt it's anywhere close to the rodent family seemed to ooze a yellow puss. Its face, skeletal and rotted, did have a vaguely rodent shape to it. Long yellow fangs pierced the glove and soulless black eyes twitched with dull malice. I saw tufts of matted brown hair run the length of its body, disappearing into the opaque water of the toilet. I didn't ask myself any of the questions you're asking yourself now. With this thing snarling and gnashing the glove to pieces, all I knew was that it was an animal, in my house, and seconds away from tearing my hand apart. As a reflex, I take my free hand and jab my thumb deep into one of its large, dull eyes. Grey fluid jets from the socket as the creature lets out a piercing screech, letting go of the glove. With a lightning-quick movement, it plunges back into the water. A rumbling, phlegmatic noise gurgles from the toilet as the water level goes from overflowing to nearly dry in a second. I fall to the floor, confused, covered in God knows what, and staring at a brutalized toilet with chunks of stringy grey hair hanging from it like the world's saddest anemone. I caught my breath and took a shower, while Cowell worked on cleaning the biohazard that our bathroom had become. By the time I'd finished my fourth scrub down and rinse off, I'd stopped thinking about the stranger aspects of what had happened and focused on the immediate problem. The cracked useless toilet and whatever um, infestation that had caused the literal shitstorm that blew through my jar. What? Two months? This is crazy. I did explain that our walls are covered in shit, right? I say, trying to remain calm. Well, I'd called every plumber in the city and gotten similar time frames all around. Well, I'm not a rich man, but I'm well off enough to have offered four-figure tips as a bonus, but still had no luck. Ah, I don't know what to tell you, pal. Busy time of the year. My advice is to call the city. Well, back up that bad is going to be a problem with the outside lines anyway, and the voice on the other line says in a tone that conveys an ironic lack of giving a shit. I start to tell him that this makes no sense. In fact, I give him a filibuster of a rant before realizing the man had hung up after anyway. Beaten and humbled as I was after fighting a toilet pest to a drawer, I navigated the minor hell of the city's phone maze until reaching the sanitation department. Instead of getting a person, I was treated to the following voice prompt. Thank you for reaching the city of Mills Lake Sanitation Department. Our business hours are 2 a.m. until 9 a.m., seven days a week to best serve your sanitation-based needs. Well, I listened to it three times before I realized, yes, I did hear it correctly. I joined Carl in cleaning the bathroom, and by the end of it, we patted each other on the back for only having a half-dozen vomits between us. I spent the rest of the night trying to pretend the fans we set up were doing anything to combat the stench, and come 2am, I had a cup of black coffee in my hand, another three inside me, and a mixture of rage and caffeine jitters to take into the call. Fifteen minutes of hold, and I started to believe the voicemail was just screwing with me. What government agency is only open in the middle of the night? But right as I was about to hang up, I heard a gruff male voice on the line. Sanitation department, he said simply. Well, I launched into a rendition of events that was probably a little heavy on vulgarity, but hit all the key points, expecting shock and apology. I didn't get what I expected. Yeah, sounds about right. Listen, the pandemic has got everything all screwed up down here. 
We know there are problems, and we're doing our best to fix them. It's going to be four weeks, Tops. Oh, if you had any idea how old our equipment is, you wouldn't be bitching about that time frame either. I took your name and number. When everything's done here, we'll send some guys to fix the damages. No real point in fixing it now. Probably going to happen a couple more times. What you want to do in the meantime is go down to a pharmacy and pick yourself up some menthol crystals. Mix those up half and half with some salt, cover your shitter with it, and put some on the floor in front of the bathroom door. Pretty much the best thing you can do till we get this taken care of. The man says with his nearly robotic disinterest. Have you ever had a rage come over you so suddenly it feels like a hot wind? That kind of anger that creates a thin layer of rage sweat. Well, my coffee enjoyed a brief but eventful trip across the room as I ran through every combination of offensive language I could muster. Waiting all day for some jaded city worker to basically tell me to go fuck myself was not the resolution I wanted in this situation. After a few moments of silence, the man on the other end of the line replied, oh, If you think I'm yanking your chain, feel free to come down any time during business hours. Talk to my boss, get me fired. Take a tour for all I care. I told you we're working with the old equipment. Old equipment gets sick. The line goes dead before I could make my brutal retort off. Well, I will. The next day consisted of trying to remove the deep red stains left by the sewage to no avail, and explaining to my mother that she'd have to use the downstairs bathroom for the foreseeable future. Spent the rest of the time, as most people do when they feel slighted by customer service, running over in my mind exactly how I was going to best this joyless government drone. Well, anger's a funny thing. Looking back at all of this with a clearer head, I can't understand how I didn't pick up on all the little clues something very wrong was happening. But at the time, all I could think about was the fact my house still smelled like a diaper bin, and that my disabled mother was going to have to deal with two flights of stairs every time she needed to use the toilet. What I'm saying is, I'm pretty sure I've never been so awake at 2am. The drive to get downtown was quiet. Not even a homeless person or a cop camped out on an intersection to break the feeling of isolation. A light rain washed over the cracked windshield of my third-hand hatchback as I pulled up to the squat municipal building. I look for any large-scale equipment to confirm I'm at the right address, but other than a parking lot with a handful of city vehicles, I see nothing. Harsh, fluorescent light spills from the windows, and a flickering neon sign says, Open, when it can muster the energy, so I assume I'm in the right place. A small bell rings as I open the door, and I'm hit with a musty odour as I make eye contact with the man sitting behind the peeling plywood desk. He's in his mid-fifties and sports stubble that looks like it could be used to scrape rust off of equipment in a pinch. His eyes are sunken, grey-brown, judging by the stains on his white t-shirt and flannel jacket, and his vague mushroom scent means he's about 48 hours overdue for his weekly shower. Jason, right, he says, unmistakably the man I was speaking to last night. Take a seat. Someone will be with you in a bit. I resolved to remain calm enough to not get kicked out, take a seat in the fake leather chair that seemed specifically designed to make fart noises, and try to strike up a couple of conversations with the man behind the desk. But at no point does he acknowledge me, let alone put down the faded, dog-eared magazine he was reading. I try to get a look at the title, but whatever language it's written in is well beyond my two years of barely passing Spanish. As 4 a.m. hits... The man folds his magazine with a lack of urgency that is honed to perfection. He places it carefully into a drawer, locks it, and stands with an article swagger that makes me wonder what the hell he's doing working in the graveyard shift. He walks over to a grey door marked, Employers Only, and motions me over. Ride this way, he says, opening the door. Why did I just wait two hours if I'm just going to talk to you? I say, holding back shock and anger. Do I tell you how to fix computers? You want an explanation, or you want to speak to the boss? He says with a shrug. 
Something in my sleep addled and righteous indignation for your brain catches this, and my heart skips a beat. How does this guy know what I do for a living? Well, don't get me wrong, there are plenty of ways he could know. But the way he said it, like a threat, makes me wary. We walk down a steep industrial cement staircase. The sparse light comes from bulbs so faded half of them give a deep orange glow. The man is silent. Our oddly muffled footsteps and a distant dripping the only sounds joining us. The staircase ends, leading through a long hallway, lit by a soft blue light. My eyes adjust, and I take in the scene around me. The walkway stretches for about a half kilometre. The architecture seems blunt, makeshift. Like the building was made for one purpose but twisted and hacked into the desired form. On either side of the walkway are long rooms. Fungi of all sizes sprout from every available surface. As I focus, I see the walls are porous. Deep holes ranging from pencil thin to large enough for a man to walk upright, honeycombing the rough cement. Shock keeps me walking. The man with me chuckles, keeping up a brisk pace. What is this? I whisper. This is where we make the sewer pipes, the man says, letting the simple leading statement hang in the air. As you can probably guess, we are in the most modern sanitation department. But what we are is cost effective. Well, just one toilet man. That's me. You can call me John. Oh, and one boss. We're some of the last members of a dying trade, and it's a shame, really. John turns on a flashlight, illuminating the tendrils of fungus. He stops at one stalk for a moment. It begins to sway lightly. My heart starts to race as it extends itself, tapping and probing along the wall till it finds a bare rock hole. It spreads at an unimaginable rate, hardening and creating a large tube. I feel my body tense and I look back, judging the distance to the stairwell. As I make the decision to run, I hear a tooth-cracking scraping noise that draws my attention to John. In one hand he holds a small, almost brown apple. In the other, casually, he holds a foot-long hunting knife, rusted to an almost rock-like patina. Snack, he says, gesturing to me with the knife before cutting a thin slice of apple. The knife leaves brown streaks on the already inedible fruits, but John eats it, never breaking eye contact with me. He tosses the apple a few times, further bruising it, but the knife is kept low, casual, but with the tip noticeably in my direction. He begins to walk again, and without a word I follow him. The grimy dagger he holds is all the instruction I need. We come to a blast door and John spins the slime street handle with little effort. I briefly think of attacking him while he's occupied, but I'm no fighter. I've not been in so much as a shoving match in all my life. John closes the door behind us and leads us down a surprisingly clean hallway with a steel great floor. See, Jason... Most of the time, the system works just fine. Couple reports of sewer gators here and there. Well, some guy has a meal made of his meat and two veg, but oh, that's it. Reasonable sacrifices. Oh, but this new bug. It's got the bus all screwed up. My job is to make sure things get running smoothly again. John says as we reach another blast door. There are two sets of thigh-high boots that are made of rubber so thick I'm reminded of tractor tires. John puts his on with a practiced deafness. I fall twice, which, judging by his laughter, is the funniest thing John has ever seen in his life. He puts down his industrial flashlight and picks up a small electric lantern. Gotta keep the lights down. The equipment in here gets a little rowdy when it gets bright, John says, leading us into a massive pitch-black room. For a moment it remains dark. I can hear noises from far enough away that I get the impression of being in a cave. The feeble lantern sputters a dim ten-foot circle of light, enough to illuminate rough rock floor but nothing else. 
As we walk, I start to hear shuffling, scrabbling noises, and see familiar rat-like faces quickly dart into the circle of light and then retreat. As I walk, I notice a set of eyes seemingly fixed on me. Deep, reflective purple tracks me as I try to stay within the light. I find myself staring back and noticing it's not two eyes but one, narrowed and hateful awe. Hmm, looks like he likes you. You two know each other? John says with a chuckle. Something tells me he already knows the answer. Want a better look? John says, malice creeping into his tone. I hear a click and the little lantern is suddenly at full blast. I can see thirty feet around me and my heart stops. I'm face to face with the thing that crawled out of my toilet and see dozens of similar creatures writhing and slithering all around it. What I thought was its body was only the head of the thing. Behind the rotted, wrapped corpse-like head was dozens of meters of snake-like muscle tissue, mottled brown and red that reaches far enough into the distance that I can't see where the thing ends. It hisses as it begins to circle around me, bringing its face close to mine. The rat itself splits down the middle, revealing rows upon rows of tiny pointed teeth. Well, didn't you say that light made them dangerous? I say in a panic as the coils of the thing begin to constrict me. I'm paralyzed with fear as I see its empty, pus-filled eye sockets. Well, for sure, but not for me. I've been working with this equipment for too long. John chuckles as the creature rears back and takes a bite out of my shoulder. The wound isn't deep at all, but it flinches an area of skin about the size of an average notebook. I scream as blood starts to pour down my chest. The thing strikes again, and I move enough that it only takes a nip from my cheek. You see, Jay, buddy, most people in the town get the runaround, give up, and eventually everything's fixed. We come out, clean everything up, and give you a fresh shitter. But you, no. You just couldn't make do for a little while. Let me and the boss do our thing. See, it's a good litmus test to know if someone is a danger to us. If someone's petty enough to go through all this shit just to jump the line, well, chances are they're also the type to blow the whistle on places like ours. John says, venom infusing his tone. I didn't know what I was getting into. I have no intention of messing with you. Please, just let me go, I plead, as the creature begins to really apply pressure. My ribs creak, and I begin to see black spots. I don't know how much I can trust you, Jay. Let's just continue the tour and see where that takes us. Sound good? John says as the lantern suddenly dims. With a parting strike, the rat beast slinks back into the shadows. Well, the two-minute walk feels like hours as I try to ignore the pain of a half-dozen bites. The next door we see is surprisingly well kept up. Clean white wood, no rust or mold. John takes us inside and my eyes are immediately assaulted by daylight. I squint as they adjust before taking in the sight before me. The ground is soft and covered with a type of plant that most closely resembles bright yellow grass. The ceiling is high enough to give an illusion of sky, and the room itself could comfortably house a handful of football stadiums. Well, the juxtaposition is staggering. I'm standing in essentially a massive field, but that wasn't the strangest part. As far as the eye could see, there were rows upon rows of toilets pristine white toilets. And it takes me a minute to notice that they are in no way just toilets. The closest one is five feet from me, and I can feel my jaw drop as I see the massive, soft, almost bovine eye filling the bowl. The top tank rattles slightly as a flat tongue slides out between large, dull teeth. I walk backward but stop as I feel a harsh jab in my back and a small trickle of blood begin to flow from the wound. Oh, don't be a pussy. These guys are harmless. Give him a pet. 
He says the second part is a threat as opposed to an offer. I walk over carefully, like I'm approaching a bull, controlling my breathing and making soft, nervous small talk. I reach a hand out, ready to pull it back if those brick-like teeth make an appearance. The creature seems rooted to the ground, but could move a few inches in any direction. It happily met my hand as I followed my newest request. It starts to make inquisitive, happy noises as I actually give a shock smile at John having told the truth. What'd I tell you? My big porcelain kitten. John finishes his sentence by putting two fingers into his mouth and giving a harsh whistle. Slowly, something starts to claw its way out of the ground. A squat, muscular beast that looked like a hybrid of Komodo dragon and bulldog. It shakes off the oddly coloured dirt and looks to John. He whistles three discordant notes and the ball of muscle and teeth starts to waddle over to the toilet creature. It leaps onto the bowl, opening its massive flat mouth, tearing through the eyeball with a burst of gore and pain screaming from its porcelain victim. With an ant-like efficiency, it crawls through the creature's body, chunks of internal organs tossed haphazardly around as the creature mules and whimpers till the last seconds. It leaves a blood-streaked but free-from-matter shell and looks to John for approval. John gives a harsh laugh and claps me on the shoulder, shocking me back to my senses. That's just nature, Jay. Or oh, as close as we get to it round here. Now, it's time to meet the boss. The walk to the final door was a blur. Something about getting the brief glimpse of something beautiful. No, that isn't quite the right words. More like something innocent and having it torn apart hit my brain harder than my missing flesh. I was then taken into a massive chamber, the smell of old water and fresh shit thick in the air. A circular walkway surrounded a creature of such deformity and bulk, I could feel my sense of what was real slip away. Well, garbage truck would be in the neighborhood of the right size of this thing, but for all I know the thing could be built like an iceberg, most of it being underwater. I saw elements of every horror I'd been subjected to up until this point. Bodies of the rat thing sprang at random from its mountain of brown flesh. Mushrooms sprouted from its folds and crevasses. Slabs of ceramic-like eczema covered it in patchwork plating, and its deformed, almost infant-like head had a mouthful of reptilian fangs jutting out at random angles. It looked like halfway between a slug and a cancerous heart pulsing and beating as it sent its limbs to and fro. The unnatural epicenter of this place. Ah, oh, beautiful, isn't he? Been my family's job for a couple of centuries to keep him fat and happy. I'm showing you this for a reason, Jane. If you get out of here in one piece, there's going to come a day, maybe in a couple months, maybe in a couple years, you're going to forget what it was really like down here. Maybe you decide to buy a dozen guns and come back. Maybe you decide to spill the beans on YouTube. But I want you to really look at the boss. I want you to realize how beyond your understanding he is and how easily you'll find yourself inside out and covered in piss long before you get revenge. <laughs> Don't believe me? John says, flipping his knife around and handing it to me. I take it and give legitimate thought to burying it as deep into him as I can. But his statement is clear. I'd likely no longer have an arm before the blade even hit home. Hmm, smart boy. I think it's about time we get you on your way, though, John says as he begins to walk toward a large rolling door on the other side of the walkway. He presses a button and the door rolls upward, letting early morning light into the system. I see the parking lot for the city vehicle but one I recognize is right in front of the door. My own blown-out hatchback. Oh, uh, before you get going, can I get that knife back? It's been in the family a long time, John says as I offer him the blade. He takes it by the blade and walks beside me to my car. The closer we get, the more I get a sinking feeling. I notice two people in the car. My mind makes the connections an instant, and I run. 
I fall to my knees and lean against the driver's side door. I begin to bawl. No rage now, just desperation and regret. I hear John slowly walking up behind me. Well, I'm sure you guessed who's in the car by now, and what state they were in. In case it wasn't clear, my immediate family had been butchered and were staring dead-eyed in the car. CJ, in my experience, the spooky side of life only makes people honour their promises for so long. After a while, folks will do all kinds of mental gymnastics to justify what happened. Now you have a more tangible reason to keep your mouth shut. In an hour or so, the police are going to find this car, this knife and those bodies. You're going to have to spend the rest of your life on the run. I hope this doesn't leave you much time for stupid ideas. John says, almost sweetly. <laughs> Just kill me. I choke out between sobs. Oh, Jay, I like you. You have spunk, hell. You could even make a good toilet man if you're so inclined. I fought to keep you breathing, if not busy. But those grains of sand are falling faster and faster, Jay. Like it or not, in 55 minutes those cops will be on your trail. John finishes by patting me on the shoulder and walking away as I hear the door slowly roll down. Well, it's two months later. I've been watching my face on the news every night. Though I'll admit that face looks about ten years older at this point. But that isn't the change that made me feel the need to spill my guts online before... Well, before I can't take any more. You see... The wounds that I wart out of that feces-strewn nightmare with, they haven't been healing right. At first I thought infection, obvious consequence of torture in a sewer. But my skin wasn't rotting, it was scabbing over with thick white scales. Well, last night I dug bloody pits into my body in a vain attempt to stop the spread. But as I woke up today, the pits had filled themselves in, stronger, thicker and more pristine white than before. But those became the least of my concerns as I saw myself shirtless in the hotel mirror. Just under the skin of my stomach I could see smooth, scanning movements. The skin was pale and thin-looking. My belly distended. I stared in shock for a few minutes before I saw the giant eye slowly open. It was in that moment that I realized I wasn't set free. Whoever it was that ran that place had made sure... It would always be a part of me. Part 2 I wish I could give you some more help, but you're a wanted man, son. Priority one for us is keeping a low profile. All you have to do, though, is get the guy running the place. The fat bird doing all the demonic crap won't well, survive a week without him, and they don't take kindly to new employees. Well, no, trust me, However creepy he seems, just a man's all he is. Lee reaches into a tool shelf, removing a box about two feet long. He gives it to me, and I wait for a moment, a sense of ceremony or gravitas filling me. I open the box expecting, I don't know, a magic wrench, a silver dagger, Thor's hammer. But I'm disappointed to see a short double-barreled shotgun, lacking any character, let alone any sense of it being a demon-slaying weapon. Oh, and a box of ammunition. <laughs> Just a gun, son, Lee says with a chuckle. To keep yourself from losing a hand trying to whip up some Jolly Roger pipe bomb. But now I've got to let you go. I wish you luck. You succeed and you'll be saving a lot of lives, and maybe souls if you're a believing man. I feel the van stop, and I take that as my cue to leave. Well, the drink wears off after a couple of hours, and I'm greeted with the dull, peristaltic pains that have been running through my body as of late. That night I make a disturbing discovery. As I dig at the porcelain scales now appearing randomly on my body, they no longer stop somewhere below the skin. Uh, they've started rooting themselves to the bone. I try in vain to tear them from myself regardless, but the sharp, deep pain that shoots through my bones make me stop after an hour of screaming, crying attempts. Minutes after, I collapse on the bed. I hear a knocking at my door. 
angry, aggressive, and somehow noticeably drunk. I answered the door shirtless and bloody, long beyond the point of caring. The massive six-foot mountain of piercings, tattoos, and booze breathes heavily in my direction. Ah, keep it the fuck down, Jaggy, he growls, taking a step into my room. He doesn't notice the biohazardous nature of the place at first, fixated on me as he is. Something hits me about how absurd it is to be worrying about some skid row bully while I'm hip-deep in paranormal events. I don't find it morbidly amusing or a metaphor for life. It just pisses me off. I meet his eyes. I hope I'm looking out of my mind. Well, as you can see by the fact I've carved holes into myself, I'm having a bad day. So how about you leave before I grab that shotgun on the table and show you why being a slab of muscle is the stupidest way to intimidate someone? I don't have time to see his reaction before his fist bursts my nose. Well, I stay standing by luck, embracing myself against the wall, turning my back to him. As I do so, the intruder gets a good look at my mouth. He screams please to God and threats to me as he tries to leave. But my tongue grabs him by the ankle, slamming him into the floor. I plead my tongue and mouth to stop. I can't see what they've planned, but I find I don't need to. I grab a dresser, trying to anchor my body, but it's too late. My tongue drags the man back, and as is common with my new situation, I feel a sense of helplessness and acceptance come over me. I get reminded of my talk with Lee, and I take in the opposite of a steadying breath. I think of my dead family, my mangled body, this loss of self I'm slowly but surely experiencing. And how I'm in the middle of all this because something about how I called made some insane cult member think I'd be the perfect ingredient in an eldritch stew. But that isn't right, is it? Lee said he would have been picking me out long before the random call. I feel rage build inside of me as I hear a crunching noise, my back splattered with gore. The anger fills me to the point my skin feels on fire, and I let it take me past the point of sanity. As I do, I can feel my tongue relax and coil into my back, my fine teeth letting go of the mangled stump of the man's leg. I take pride in myself for overcoming my new urge to feed, but the second my rage starts to falter, I feel myself lose control so I don't let it falter. The man is thanking me for mercy, begging me for help. But he doesn't realize this isn't about him. I pick up the shotgun from the table and drive it down into his stomach. I can see how much my body has changed, become stronger, better, as I drive the blunt twin barrels deep into his stomach with a burst of blood. I pull the trigger with a muffled pop, the man's insides turn to so much ground meat. Something has changed. Some part of the end of this process has begun. A voice deep in the back of my mind tries to calm me, tries to get me to sit down, fills my head with visions of fields full of a lush yellow grass-like plant. But my other voice, the one that's been inside my head since I was born, tells me I can't give up. I can't calm down. I'm in the terminal stages of a disease with no cure, with only one chance to even attempt to make it right. I'm in a fugue state as I rifle through the man's pockets, having my first bit of good luck in a long time as I come upon his keys. I feel dim, dull, and far away, like my brain is trying to shut down due to the stress of having to process two minds. I put my fist through the thick safety glass window of the hotel, marvelling at the raw strength I now possess. The pain feels delayed, but shocks me back to awareness. I put on my shoes and coat, not bothering with a shirt. I know every second counts at this point. I focus on every wrong that has been done to me as I push a button on the man's key fob and follow the grating chirp to his sports car. Back when CDs were new, I'm sure it was a marvel of technology, but now it looks like a rusted, sad attempt at luxury. I throw the shotgun box on the floor of the passenger side, stealth no longer being a priority. My mind is feeling more sluggish, less my own by the minute. I slam my hand in the door once for good measure, severing the tip of my pinky. Focusing on that pain and letting my decaying mind dwell on it, I manage to sharpen my wits enough to pull out of the driveway without making too much of a scene. 
The drive is hours long. I find myself drifting more than once. I apply the cigarette lighter to bare areas of flesh more than once to snap myself into some sense of reality. My body is making a constant series of pops, snaps, and various wet, cracking noises. I catch glimpses of myself in the mirror, and by the minute more of my flesh is becoming porcelain scales, plates, and almost cancerous lumps now starting to show beyond my clothing. This isn't some awesome final form by the time I'm sitting in that familiar parking lot. Night has fallen, and my breathing comes in ragged gasps that spray reddish-yellow fluid onto the steering wheel. Fighting this process is tearing me apart, mentally and physically. As I drag myself out of the car, I see fluids pooled in the seats, along with some pieces of flesh that really belong on the inside of the human body. I see myself in a side mirror, and I barely look human. My face is half covered in cracking porcelain shards. Lumps of asymmetrical growth strain and tear my clothing. And my mouth, my new mouth, is rapidly gnashing through my coat. I drag one leg behind me, spurs of flesh and porcelain locking it in place. The shotgun is cocked and loaded, my pockets filled with shells. I'm almost there. I fire two rounds into the door and fumble two more back into the gun. The door creaks open. Where John, much calmer than he has any right to be, folds his magazine and carefully puts it back in his drawer. Oh, looks like you've gotten yourself into a bit of a mess, Jay. Why don't you let me... I don't give him a chance to continue. I fire a round into his desk, spraying him with wood splinters and ricocheted shot. He bleeds from a few nasty cuts, but doesn't even flinch. I stomp into the room. My revenge. The thing keeping me anchored so close. Why did you do this to me? I scream closing the distance between us to a few feet. This, he says, gesturing towards the lump and mess I've become. It was not I that did it to you. What I did would have let you die, like peacefully, and in your sleep before you even noticed the eye. Yeah, that's all move to be sure, but this, this is all you, Jay. I pegged you for the type that could accept your fate. Looks like I was wrong. And he laughs as if he realized he'd put bacon on a vegan burger instead of condemning some man to a tortured death. Oh, my senses sharpen as that thought sinks in. I'm lucid, but with clarity comes a revelation. My thoughts are fundamentally changing. I'm processing things in an inhuman, predatory way. With every passing second, no matter how much rage I stoke to keep my senses sharp, well, the senses themselves are becoming alien. Who knows what the hell is happening to you now? My advice is to eat one of those shotgun shells and save yourself from turning into something that eats children. My mind begins to drift as John says this, and he starts to let his hand drift towards the barrel of my gun. I snarl, aiming it to his chest. <sighs> Take me to the bus, John. I wanted to watch when I blow your brains all over a wall, I say as... John merely shrugs. I don't have much choice in the matter, do I? But nonetheless, happy to oblige. Give us some time to talk. John opens the employee's only door, that putrid portal that started me down a path to mutation and insanity, and I follow. The first stairway is the same one I remember. Though sorting through what's a memory and what's an hallucination at this point is becoming difficult. Twice I come to, after lost time, holding John against a wall and screaming nonsense. I start to wonder if I'm even going to get the satisfaction of killing this old prick in front of his demonic shit slug of a boss. The first door is nothing like I remember. It's riveted steel, every square inch covered in any type of hazard symbol I can think of no less than a dozen I've never seen before. John opens the door and there's a mesh walkway suspended a few feet above a roiling, vapour-spewing lake. It splits off into two paths, as far as the eye can see. I try to ask John how this is possible, but my jaw can no longer move properly. I produce a series of gurgling clicks, no matter how slowly I try to speak. 
Uh, no use in explaining how paraphysical architecture works now, Jay. Well, I assume that's what you wanted to know. John is confident, sly, but the anger this spurns no longer seems enough to keep me alert. Well, I don't suppose there's anything I could offer you to get you to stop your rampage, he asks as he leads us down a half dozen turns. I grunt an aggressive negative response. We pass walkways leading to small rooms, over churning waterfalls, and to melted, missing patches of grating. But it all begins to blend. Do you even realize what the boss and I can do for you? Oh, I won't lie. Not much I can do about your current state. You fucked that up beyond repair. But maybe I can entice you another way. John opens the door to a cement room that reminds me of a storage closet. I can't remember walking there, and I'm having trouble remembering why I'm here at all, actually. He opens the door, and I see two people I do remember. My brother and mother. I can feel a tear squeeze its way past swollen ducts and fall down a face full of shattered chunks of porcelain and tumour growths. They look fine. No brutal wounds, no glassy eyes. And for a moment, I'm happy. I think all of this might just be a mistake or a dream. And I feel like I'm falling all of a sudden. My connection to my body severing, my mind becoming whatever it is now. Oh, I wish I would have looked away in those last moments of being Jason, fully myself. I saw the backs of my family. Something vile and semi-solid was burrowing into their flesh. A black jelly with rotten yellow flecks of bone or fat inside. I felt rage, but it just wasn't enough. I felt my consciousness being subsumed by something... Well, something wrong. Now, for those gorehounds wondering, there are many more of Jason's notebooks, but they were nonsensical word salads, bloodstains and draw marks. Which brings us to our friend John for the rest of the story. John's Diary. I'm writing this not as any kind of confession or repentance, but as a window into why people like me do what I do. If this is found by anyone familiar with those places on earth that most are not meant to go to, then learn from my mistakes. If you've never seen something so wrong that it makes you feel no more significant than a grain of sand, then take this as a warning, not a road map. You want nothing to do with my world. I've done awful things. Actions that would make me a household name if they were known. When I've also prevented atrocities that would make anything I've done look like a spirited shouting match. And that's the gist of my childhood, my job, my religion, and my life. We are those who have to make the toughest decisions to ensure that the pacts and deals that CEOs, kings, and presidents have made are honoured. We're the mortals that not only have to look beyond the veil, but work there, and that takes its toll on a person. Human beings are not meant to rub shoulders with the paranormal on a daily basis, and anyone tasked with a job such as mine shows this. We are made weird, obsessive, and cruel, but the penalties for failing to honour these contracts written long before we were born, well, they'll be applied to the whole human race should we decide we've had enough. My job is about knowing, memorizing dozens of types of creatures, rituals, rites, and applying them. I've made a few mistakes in my time, but my biggest one is stalking me through the sanitation department, and I'm running out of places to run. I watched him for weeks, enough to feel I knew how he would react. He was a bit angry, but underneath that was a deep sense of being spit upon by life. Well, he should have run for a day, found himself a hole in the warm hotel to call up in and let one of the little gods through, blessing some small town with its presence. But the rites have to be exact. The little god feeds on apathy and acceptance, not rage and confusion. Whatever was drawn to him was mixed and twisted with his soul, turning Jason and the little god into an eight-foot armoured beast, with no divine mandate, no goal other than death and destruction. I've trapped it in the paranormal architecture of the sanitation department. But I believe I'm only slowing it down, 
It tears through entities and humans alike, trying to find me or the boss. You'll never get near the boss without killing me, but I'm old, I'm unarmed, and I have no way of contacting anyone in the sewers. Well, first I tried every curse, every hex I'd learned as a child. But magic is not the stuff of fantasy novels, nor fireballs or bolts of lightning to be thrown about at a whim. No, it's a careful, deliberate art. Good for traps and ambushes, not visually impressive battles. But not one worse, not even enough to slow this hybrid demigod down. And worse, the creature learned. I found myself marvelling at a massacre, the last of the human workers. Well, some of my family, some from other clans, all torn limb from limb, scattered and displayed. Well, I'm a mere human, but my family is given to certain resiliences to help us do our work. I can and have drunk raw sewage to survive in the tunnels. I've eaten lunch while watching rituals that would make an Aztec blanch, so I knew... The second I felt the stomach cramps, that something paranormal was causing them. But I wasn't quick enough to avoid Jason's ambush. I used every secret tunnel, every tiny doorway, all my years of memorizing the maddening architecture of the sewers to escape with my life. But I didn't manage to escape with both arms. Next I tried organizing the entities against the force of horror. I gathered every beast, every creature, every half-alive, mutated abomination I could find. They made an army that could take cities. Thousands of nightmares covering the floor, the walls, the ceiling, and the very air itself thick with buzzing, sore-toothed insects. It wasn't a battle. The Jason creature never broke eye contact with me as it trudged through my army, tearing apart and devouring them one by one. I watched for days, hoping some massive creature or the sheer weight of numbers would bring it down. But the entire time it just leered at me, barely looking at the creatures it slaughtered. It could have killed me then, but it chose not to. It took my tongue, one eye and a foot, and left me wading in a river of gore. I have nothing left. I'm sure if it reaches the boss, it will die in the conflict. But without me, or someone like me, the boss will die a slow death regardless. I can hear it throwing open doors right now, searching each room in this hallway. I have no more tricks to play. I'm a crippled old man, and it seems larger and more reality-breaking each time I see it. I just heard it in the room beside me. When I've made my peace with the garden, I've found a solid pipe to prop me up. In my other hand, I hold my family's knife. No magic to it, just a good, honest weapon. Well, I don't expect your pity. It was my lot to work in the darkest places the world has to offer, and I had to act as such. But maybe I have a little of your understanding, and that isn't such a bad thought to die with. It gets dark very early this time of year this far north. By 4pm the sun's already set and dusk is upon us. Definitely not the ideal conditions for a girl who looks as young as I do to be walking home alone. The route that I'd chosen from the junior high school to the house was particularly off the beaten track and took me through several tranquil and deserted areas of town. No parent with even a shred of love in their heart for their child would allow them to make this walk at any time of the year, let alone in the depths of winter. It was just after I'd passed the cemetery and was about to turn onto the path through the woods that I became aware of his presence. At this point, he was what you would consider a safe distance behind me. I didn't want to turn around and look directly at him. Still, I could tell from the heavy footfall of his steps and the excited nature of his breathing that he was about thirty or forty feet away. There were no other people around, and this road was a dead end with no houses on it, meaning that the chances of someone driving by were minimal. I was acutely aware that it was just him and me. Despite many thoughts running through my mind at that moment, one above all was controlling me. If this situation is going to go down the way that I think it will, I'll need to make a move right now. 
I started to increase my pace, not so much that it would be immediately apparent, but enough that I would significantly increase the distance between him and me. Unless, that is, he really was following me and altered his speed to keep up. Sure enough, within a couple of seconds, I sensed him breaking into a slow jog in order to catch up and close the distance between us. Okay. Okay, Conrilla. Time to make a choice. Do I run or do I turn and confront this man? I was right at the head of the woodland park at this point, so I decided to turn around. Hello, mister. Can I help you with something? Are you lost? I detected the slightest hint of surprise that I'd acted in this way. Still, he quickly regained his composure and continued his slow approach. Hey there, little girl. I was just out here looking for my dog. I think he went into these woods. Do you want to help me find him? He was smiling at me now. What's your dog's name? I asked. What? Your dog's name. What is it? If I'm going to help you find him, I need to shout his name. Oh, um... Yeah, uh, his name's Fred. Oh, was he surprised by my question, or had he hesitated because he'd needed to make up a name? Well, um, I'm kind of scared of dogs. I think I'm just going to go home. I'm sorry I can't help you. Oh, can I at least walk you home? Which way are you headed? It's dark out here and not safe for little girls like you. He was edging ever closer to me now and had a big creepy smile plastered across his face. Oh, I am... Um, live just on the other side of these woods. Trust me, I can make it home just fine. Well, I'd still like to walk with you, if that's okay. I mean, I'm sure my dog is in there somewhere. His icy blue eyes were laser-focused on mine now. It almost felt like he was trying to hypnotically control me with his gaze. Well, um... If you really think Fido's in there... I guess you should look for him. Fido is a crazy old mutt, he said. I'm sure I'll find him in there. There is no dog. This man definitely means trouble. Time to take action. I turned and started running into the woods. While I had a couple of seconds head start on him, the fact is that the body of a 13-year-old girl can't run as fast as a fully grown man. He caught up with me ridiculously fast, so quickly, in fact, that we were still within the view of the road. The street lamp gave off enough light for us to be seen by a passerby, if one were to approach. <sighs> what did you run off for? he asked. I'm not going to hurt you. Sorry, mister. I just got scared at the thought of your dog running around in here. I got bitten by something pretty nasty when I was younger, and the thought of it happening again <laughs> freaks me out. Okay, I understand. Let's keep walking, and I'll keep you safe from any stray dogs. Hey, uh, are you hungry? I have some food I could share with you. Let's find a nice place to sit down and eat. What do you have? Well, I was kind of hungry as it happened. Mmm, delicious homemade spaghetti and bolognese sauce. Let's go a bit further into the woods, and then I'll share it with you. He didn't have a bag with him, and there was no way he was hiding some container full of food in his pockets. This was bullshit. Um, no thanks, mister. My elders say I'm allergic to garlic, so I shouldn't eat Italian food. Okay, then. Well, let's just keep walking. His heart rate was increasing, and the adrenaline was kicking in. I could smell the excitement oozing from his paws. Here. Yeah. Let me hold your hands. You'll be safer that way. He didn't wait for me to respond, grabbing my hand in his clammy grip. He was a strong one, it was apparent. There was no way a regular girl of my height and frame would be able to escape this bastard. We walked on and were soon far away from any streetlights and any semblance of safety. And soon things were going to take a turn very much for the worse. He clearly sensed this too, letting go of my hand and standing in front of me to block the path. The disingenuous smile had now gone. Okay, little lady. Fun time is over. 
Well, for you, anyway. My fun is just about to begin. He withdrew a set of handcuffs from his pocket and dangled them in front of my face. <laughs> I seriously fucking doubt that, Johnny. And this was the part that I always loved the most. A look of utter shock on these assholes' faces when I first called them by their name. Oh, I'd seen it dozens of times before, and it never grew old. Now, for the next part. Or he'll be rocked back for a few seconds before trying to reassert his authority. Wait, wait. What? How did you know? I didn't let him finish his question. Johnny Mutton. Pedophile. Rapist and child killer. Oh, we've been tracking you for a while. Damn, he looks stupid, still dangling those cuffs in front of him. Guess what? We found you. <sighs> Just watching the cogs of a regular human's brain slowly turn was not my favourite part of this whole game, though. Come on, work it out already. Then you can pretend it doesn't matter that you're the boss here and we can get down to business. Well, I don't give a fuck what you think you know. <laughs> oh, good. The bravado had returned. It was always more fun when they still thought they had the upper hand. I'm still going to torture you, rape you, and then leave little pieces of you scattered all over this forest. Good. Again with the dangling handcuffs. What was wrong with this shithead? Ah, oh, which hand should we start with? You on my left? The fucking schmuck had a look on his face like it was Christmas and his birthday all rolled into one. He advanced and roughly placed the handcuff around my left wrist. <sighs> Things are going to get real ugly now, little lady. He was smirking. He genuinely believed he was still in control. <laughs> At least we can agree on something. Okay, jackass, let's get this over with. I was going to make this quick. This piece of shit wasn't even worth toying with. I grabbed the other end of the cuffs and clasped it around his wrist. There was no way he was going to escape me now. <sighs> what are you doing, kid? What, you think that's... I jumped up and sank my fangs deep into his neck. Oh, I would feast on him later, but for now, ripping out half of his jugular would lead to a suitably painful death. I climbed off of him and spat out the chunk of flesh onto the ground in front of him. In his shocked state, he actually bent down and tried to pick it up, as though that would fix his lethal wound. I wasn't going to allow this sick bastard even that tiny crumb of false hope, though and dragged him away into the middle of the clearing. Any last words, Johnny? <laughs> this was a little crude of me, what with the fact that this asshole was choking to death on his own blood. I didn't have much sympathy, though. He let out a pathetic, gurgling sound, looking up at me pleadingly. Sorry, didn't catch that. He was as white as a sheet now, and not long for this world. Time to monologue. You guys just don't put in the effort anymore. I mean, for fuck's sake. I only got into town last night. I was obviously indisposed during the daylight hours, meaning I know you had zero time to prep this. Damn, I remember the old days when sick fucks like you would at least put in the effort. You know, a couple of weeks of following your victim, regular drive-bys, watching the home through binoculars, learning the names of friends. But you, you just spotted me and decided there and then to act on your impulses. Fucking pathetic. It didn't even occur to you how dumb it would be for a girl to be walking through the woods on her own. God, it took me less than two minutes to lure you in here. His breathing was extremely laboured now. He had moments left. Okay, fair enough. Nobody expects one of our kind to look the way I do. And hey, like I said, you should have put in the legwork. Goodbye, Johnny. And with that, I decided to feast. 
It always tastes better when they're still alive, even if only just. Well, as always, a massive, massive thank you for all of your listenership, support and love over the past year. Hope you enjoyed that little selection of some of my favourite stories of the year. There'll probably be a part two coming up towards uh, New Year's Eve, okay? Nice way to round off the year. Well, those were definitely some of my favourites from the year, and I hope you agree. If not, I hope you had a nice relaxing time listening to six hours of stories in the pouring rain. Well, I'm doing my usual trick of trying to end things right on the hour. So, here we go. <laughs> no, but seriously, thanks to everyone for sticking around with me. Six long years I've been doing this now, and here's to another six and beyond. So, happy holidays to each and every one of you. I'm back again soon. Till the next time, very, very sweet dreams, and bye-bye.